Section Zero of Equanimitas and Other Addresses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Equanimitas and Other Addresses by Sir William Osler. Section Zero. Preface to the Second Edition Delivered at sundry times and in diverse places in the course of a busy life, it was not without hesitation that I collected these addresses for publication, that the simple message they contain has not been unacceptable, is shown by the exhaustion of three impressions within eighteen months. I have to thank many friends, lay and medical, for their kind criticisms of the volume. But above all, I have been deeply touched that many young men on both sides of the Atlantic should have written, stating that the addresses have been helpful in forming their life ideals. Loyalty to the best interests of the noblest of callings and a profound belief in the gospel of the day's work are the texts with variations here and there from which I have preached. I have an enduring faith in the men who do the routine work of our profession. Hard though the conditions may be, approached in the right spirit, the spirit which has animated us from the days of Hippocrates, the practice of medicine affords scope for the exercise of the best faculties of the mind and heart. That the yoke of the general practitioner is often galling cannot be denied but he has not a monopoly of the worries and trials in the meeting and conquering of which he fights his life battle and it is a source of inexpressible gratification to me to feel that i may perhaps have helped to make his yoke easier and his burden lighter to this addition I have added the three valedictory addresses delivered before leaving America. One of these, the fixed period, demands a word of explanation. To interpose a little case, to relieve a situation of singular sadness in parting from my dear colleagues of the Johns Hopkins University, I jokingly suggested for the relief of a senile professoriate an extension of Anthony Trollope's plan mentioned in his novel, The Fixed Period. To one who had all his life been devoted to old men, it was not a little distressing to be placarded in a world-wide way as their sworn enemy, and to every man over sixty, whose spirit I may have thus unwittingly bruised, I tender my heartfelt regrets. Let me add, however, that the discussion which followed my remarks has not changed, but has, rather, strengthened my belief that the real work of life is done before the fortieth year, and that after the sixtieth year it would be best for the world and best for themselves if men rested from their labours. Oxford, July 1906 End of Preface Recording by Luke Sartor Berkeley, California Section 1 Equanimitas This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Luke Sartor Equanimitas and Other Addresses by Sir William Osler Equanimitas Thou must be like a promontory of the sea, against which, though the waves beat continually, yet it both itself stands, and about it are those swelling waves stilled and quieted. Marcus Aurelius 
I say, fear not. Life still leaves human effort scope, but since life teems with ill, nurse no extravagant hope, because thou must not dream, thou needest not then despair. Matthew Arnold Empedocles on Etna Equanimitas Footnote Valedictory Address University of Pennsylvania May 1st, 1889 To many the frost of custom has made even these imposing annual ceremonies cold and lifeless. To you at least, of those present, they should have the solemnity of an ordinance, called as you are this day to a high dignity and to so weighty an office and charge. You have chosen your genius, have passed beneath the throne of necessity, and with the voices of the fatal sisters still in your ears, will soon enter the plain of forgetfulness and a drink of the waters of its river. Here you are, driven all manner of ways, like the souls in the tale of Ur er, the Pamphylian. Footnote. The Republic. Book 10. It is my duty to say a few words of encouragement, and to bid you, in the name of the faculty, God speed on your journey. I could have the heart to spare you, poor, careworn survivors of a hard struggle, so lean and pale and leaden eye with study, and my tender mercy constrains me to consider but two of the score of elements which may make or mar your lives, which may contribute to your success, or help you in the days of failure. In the first place, in the physician or surgeon, no quality takes rank with imperturbability, and I propose for a few minutes to direct your attention to this essential bodily virtue. Perhaps I may be able to give those of you in whom it has not developed during the critical scenes of the past month a hint or two of its importance, possibly a suggestion for its attainment. Imperturbability means coolness and presence of mind under all circumstances. Calmness amid storm, clearness of judgment in moments of grave peril, immobility, impassiveness, or, to use an old and expressive word, phlegm. It is the quality which is most appreciated by the laity, though often misunderstood by them, and the physician who has the misfortune to be without it, who betrays indecision and worry, and who shows that he is flustered and flurried in ordinary emergencies, loses rapidly the confidence of his patients. In full development, as we see it in some of our older colleagues, it has the nature of divine gift, a blessing to the possessor, a comfort to all who come in contact with him. You should know it well, for there have been before you for years several striking illustrations whose example has, I trust, made a deep impression. As imperturbability is largely a bodily endowment, I regret to say that there are those amongst you who, owing to congenital defects, may never be able to acquire it. Education, however, will do much, and with practice and experience, the majority of you may expect to attain to a fair measure. The first essential is to have your nerves well in hand. Even under the most serious circumstances, the physician or surgeon who allows his outward action to demonstrate the native act and figure of his heart in complement extern who shows in his face the slightest alteration, expressive of anxiety or fear, 
has not his medullary centers under the highest control and is liable to disaster at any moment i have spoken of this to you on many occasions and have urged you to educate your nerve centers so that not the slightest dilator or contractor influence shall pass to the vessels of your face under any professional trial far be it from me to urge you ere time has carved with his hours those fair brows to quench on all occasions the blushes of ingenuous shame but in dealing with your patients emergencies demanding these should certainly not arise and at other times an inscrutable face may prove a fortune in a true and perfect form imperturbability is indissolubly associated with wide experience and an intimate knowledge of the varied aspects of disease with such advantages he is so equipped that no eventuality can disturb the mental equilibrium of the physician the possibilities are always manifest and the course of action clear from its very nature this precious quality is liable to be misinterpreted and the general accusation of hardness so often brought against the profession has here its foundation now a certain measure of insensibility is not only an advantage but a positive necessity in the exercise of a calm judgment and in carrying out delicate operations keen sensibility is doubtless a virtue of high order when it does not interfere with steadiness of hand or coolness of nerve but for the practitioner in his working day world a callousness which thinks only of the good to be effected and goes ahead regardless of smaller considerations is the preferable quality cultivate then gentlemen such a judicious measure of obtuseness as will enable you to meet the exigencies of practice with firmness and courage without at the same time hardening the human heart by which we live in the second place there is a mental equivalent to this bodily endowment which is as important in our pilgrimage as imperturbability let me recall to your minds an incident related of that best of men and wisest of rulers antoninus pius who as he lay dying in his home at lorium in etruria summed up the philosophy of life in the watchword equanimitas as for him about to pass flamantia moenia mundi the flaming rampart of the world so for you fresh from clotho's spindle a calm equanimity is the desirable attitude how difficult to attain yet how necessary in success as in failure natural temperament has much to do with its development but a clear knowledge of our relation to our fellow creatures and to the work of life is also indispensable one of the first essentials in securing a good-natured equanimity is not to expect too much of the people amongst whom you dwell knowledge comes but wisdom lingers and in matters medical the ordinary citizen of today has not one whit more sense than the old romans whom lucian scourged for a credulity which made them fall easy victims to the quacks of the time such as the notorious alexander whose exploits make one wish that his advent had been delayed some eighteen centuries deal gently then with this deliciously credulous old human nature in which we work and restrain your indignation when you find your pet parson has triturates of the one thousandth potentiality in his waistcoat pocket or you discover accidentally a case of warner's safe cure in the bedroom of your best patient it must needs be 
that offences of this kind come and go. Expect them, and do not be vexed. Curious, odd compounds are these fellow creatures, at whose mercy you will be, full of fads and eccentricities, of whims and fancies. But the more closely we study their little foibles of one sort and another, in the inner life which we see, the more surely is the conviction born in upon us of the likeness of their weaknesses to our own. The similarity would be intolerable if a happy egotism did not often render us forgetful of it. Hence the need of an infinite patience and of an ever tender charity toward these fellow creatures. Have they not to exercise the same toward us? A distressing feature in the life which you are about to enter, a feature which will press hardly upon the finer spirits among you and ruffle their equanimity, is the uncertainty which pertains not alone to our science and art, but to the very hopes and fears which make us men. In seeking absolute truth, we aim at the unattainable, and must be content with finding broken portions. You remember in the Egyptian story how Typhon, with his conspirators, dealt with good Osiris, how they took the virgin truth, hewed her lovely form into a thousand pieces, and scattered them to the four winds. And, as Milton says, from that time ever since, the sad friends of truth, such as durst appear, imitating the careful search that Isis made for the mangled body of Osiris, went up and down, gathering up limb by limb, still as they could find them. We have not yet found them all. Footnote. Ario Pagitica. But each one of us may pick up a fragment perhaps too, and in moments when mortality weighs less heavily upon the spirit, we can, as in a vision, see the form divine, just as a great naturalist, an Owen or a lady, can reconstruct an ideal creature from a fossil fragment. It has been said that in prosperity our equanimity is chiefly exercised in enabling us to bear with composure the misfortunes of our neighbours. Now, while nothing disturbs our mental placidity more sadly than straitened means, and the lack of those things after which the Gentiles seek, I would warn you against the trials of the day soon to come to some of you, the day of large and successful practice. Engrossed late and soon, in professional cares, getting and spending, you may so lay waste your powers that you may find, too late, with hearts given away, that there is no place in your habit-stricken souls for those gentler influences which make life worth living. It is sad to think that, for some of you, there is in store disappointment, perhaps failure, you cannot hope, of course, to escape from the cares and anxieties incident to professional life. Stand up bravely, even against the worst. Your very hopes may have passed on out of sight, as did all that was near and dear to the patriarch at the Jabbok Ford, and, like him, you may be left to struggle in the night alone. Well for you, if you wrestle on, for in persistency lies victory, and with the morning may come the wished-for blessing. But not always. There is a struggle with defeat which some of you will have to bear, and it will be well for you in that day to have cultivated a cheerful equanimity. Remember, too, that sometimes from our desolation only does the better life begin. Even with disaster ahead and ruin imminent, it is better to face them with a smile and with the head erect 
than to crouch at their approach. And, if the fight is for principle and justice, even when failure seems certain, where many have failed before, cling to your ideal, and, like child Roland before the dark tower, set the slughorn to your lips, blow the challenge, and calmly await the conflict. It has been said that, in patience ye shall win your souls, and what is this patience but an equanimity which enables you to rise superior to the trials of life? Sowing as you shall do beside all waters, I can but wish that you may reap the promised blessing of quietness and of assurance forever, until, within this life, though lifted over its strife, you may, in the growing winters, glean a little of that wisdom, which is pure, peaceable, gentle, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The past is always with us, never to be escaped. It alone is enduring, but amidst the changes and chances which succeed one another, so rapidly in this life we are apt to live too much for the present and too much in the future on such an occasion as the present when the alma mater is in festal array when we joy in her growing prosperity it is good to hark back to the olden days and gratefully to recall the men whose labors in the past have made the present possible the great possession of any university is its great names. It is not the pride, pomp, and circumstance of an institution which bring honor, nor its wealth, nor the number of its schools, nor the students who throng its halls, but the men who have trodden in its service the thorny road through toil, even through hate, to the serene abode of fame, climbing like stars to their appointed height. These bring glory, and it should thrill the heart of every alumnus of this school, of every teacher in its faculty, as it does mine this day, reverently and thankfully, to recall such names amongst its founders as Morgan, Shippen, and Rush, and such men amongst their successors as Wistar, Physick, Barton, and would. Gentlemen of the faculty, noblesse oblige. And the sad reality of the past teaches us today, in the freshness of sorrow at the loss of friends and colleagues, hid in death's dateless night. We miss from our midst one of your best known instructors, by whose lessons you have profited, and whose example has stimulated many. An earnest teacher, a faithful worker, a loyal son of this university, a good and kindly friend, Edward Bruin, has left behind him, amid regrets, at a career untimely closed, the memory of a well-spent life. We mourn today, also, with our sister college, the grievous loss which she has sustained in the death of one of her most distinguished teachers, a man who bore with honour an honoured name, and who added luster to the profession of this city. Such men as Samuel W. Gross can ill be spared. Let us be thankful for the example of a courage which could fight and win, and let us emulate the zeal, energy, and industry which characterized his career. Personally, I mourn the loss of a preceptor, dear to me as a father, the man from whom, more than any other, I received inspiration, and to whose example and precept I owe the position 
which enables me to address you today. There are those present who will feel it no exaggeration when I say that to have known Palmer Howard was, in the deepest and truest sense of the phrase, a liberal education. Whatever way my days decline, I felt and feel, though left alone, his being working in mine own, the footsteps of his life in mine. While preaching to you a doctrine of equanimity, I am myself a castaway. Wrecking not my own reed, I illustrate the inconsistency which so readily besets us. One might have thought that in the premier school of America, in this civitas Hippocratix, with associations so dear to a lover of his profession, with colleagues so distinguished, and with students so considerate, one might have thought, I say, that the Hercules pillars of a man's ambition had here been reached, but it has not been so ordained and today I sever my connection with this university. More than once, gentlemen, in a life rich in the priceless blessings of friends, I have been placed in positions in which no words could express the feelings of my heart, and so it is with me now, the keenest sentiments of a gratitude well up from my innermost being at the thought of the kindliness and goodness which have followed me at every step during the past five years. A stranger, I cannot say an alien, among you. I have been made to feel at home. More you could not have done. Could I say more? Whatever the future may have in store of success or of trials, nothing can blot the memory of the happy days I have spent in this city, and nothing can quench the pride I shall always feel at having been associated, even for a time, with a faculty so notable in the past, so distinguished in the present, as that from which I now part. Gentlemen, farewell, and take with you into the struggle the watchword of the good old Roman, Equanimitas. End of section one equanimitas by william osler recording by luke sartor berkeley california section two doctor and nurse this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Equanimitas and Other Addresses by William Osler. Section 2. Doctor and Nurse. There are men and classes of men that stand above the common herd, the soldier, the sailor, and the shepherd not infrequently. The artist, rarely, rarelier still, the clergyman, the physician, almost as a rule. He is the flower, such as it is, of our civilization, and when that stage of man is done with, and only to be marveled at in history, he will be thought to have shared as little as any in the defects of the period, and most notably exhibited the virtues of the race. Generosity he has, such as is possible to those who practice an art, never to those who drive a trade. Discretion, tested by a hundred secrets, tact, tried in a thousand embarrassments, and what are more important, Heraclean cheerfulness, and courage, so that he brings air and cheer into the sick room, and often enough, though not so often as he wishes, brings healing. Robert 
Lewis Stevenson Preface to Underwoods Think not silence the wisdom of fools, but, if rightly timed, the honour of wise men, who have not the infirmity, but the virtue of taciturnity, and speak not out of the abundance, but the well-weighed thoughts of their hearts. Such silence may be eloquence, and speak thy worth above the power of words. Sir Thomas Brown Doctor and Nurse Footnote Johns Hopkins Hospital, 1891 There are individuals, doctors and nurses, for example, whose very existence is a constant reminder of our frailties, and considering the notoriously irritating character of such people, I often wonder that the world deals so gently with them. The presence of the parson suggests dim possibilities, not the grim realities conjured up by the names of the persons just mentioned. The lawyer never worries us in this way, and we can imagine in the future a social condition in which neither divinity nor law shall have a place, when all shall be friends and each one a priest, when the meek shall possess the earth. But we cannot picture a time when birth and life and death shall be separated from that grisly troop, which we dread so much and which is ever associated in our minds with physician and nurse. Dread, yes, but mercifully for us, in a vague and misty way. Like schoolboys, we play among the shadows cast by the turrets of the Temple of Oblivion, towards which we travel, regardless of what awaits us in the veil of years beneath. Suffering and disease are ever before us, but life is very pleasant, and the motto of the world, when well, is, Ford with the dance fondly imagining that we are in a happy valley, we deal with ourselves as the king did with the Gautama, and hide away everything that suggests our fate. Perhaps we are wise. Who knows? Mercifully, the tragedy of life, though seen, is not realized. It is so close that we lose all sense of its proportions and better so, for, as George Eliot has said, if we had a keen vision and feeling of all ordinary human life, it would be like hearing the grass grow or the squirrel's heart beat, and we should die of that roar which lies on the other side of silence. With many, however, it is a willful blindness, a sort of fool's paradise, not destroyed by a thought, but by the stern exigencies of life, when the ministers of human fate drag us, or, worse still, those near and dear to us, upon the stage. Then we become acutely conacious of the great drama of human suffering, and of those inevitable stage accessories, Dr. And nurse. If, members of the graduating class, the medical profession, composed chiefly of men, has absorbed a larger share of attention and regard, you have at least the satisfaction of feeling that yours is the older, and as older, the more honorable calling. In one of the lost books of Solomon, a touching picture is given of Eve, then an early grandmother, bending over the little Enoch and showing Mahala how to soothe his sufferings and to allay his pains. Woman, the link among the days, and so trained in a bitter school, has in successive generations played the part of Mahala 
to the little Enoch, of Elaine, to the wounded Lancelot. It seems a far cry from the plain of Mesopotamia, and the lists of Camelot to the Johns Hopkins Hospital. But the spirit which makes this scene possible is the same, tempered through the ages by the benign influence of Christianity. Among the ancients, many had risen to the idea of forgiveness of enemies, of patience under wrongdoing, and even of the brotherhood of man, but the spirit of love only received its incarnation with the ever-memorable reply to the ever-memorable question, Who is my neighbor? A reply which has changed the attitude of the world. Nowhere in ancient history, sacred or profane, do we find pictures of devoted heroism in women such as dot the annals of the Catholic Church, or such as can be paralleled in our own century. Tender maternal affection, touching filial piety, were there, but the spirit abroad was that of Deborah, not Rispar, of Jael, not Dorcas. In the gradual division of labor by which civilization has emerged from barbarism, the doctor and the nurse have been evolved as useful accessories in the incessant warfare in which man is engaged. The history of the race is a grim record of passions and ambitions, of weaknesses and vanities, a record, too often, of barbaric inhumanity. And even today, when philosophers would have us believe his thoughts had widened, he is ready of old to shut the gates of mercy and to let loose the dogs of war. It was in one of these attacks of race mania that your profession, until then unsettled and ill-defined, took under Florence Nightingale, ever blessed be her name, its modern position. Individually, man, the unit, the microcosm, is fast bound in chains of atavism, inheriting legacies of feeble will and strong desire, taints of blood and brain. What wonder, then, that many, sore, let, and hindered, inheriting legacies of feeble will and strong desires, taints of blood and brain? What wonder, then, that many, sore, let, and hindered in running the race, fall by the way, and need a shelter in which to recruit or to die, a hospital in which there shall be no harsh comments on conduct, but only so far as is possible, love and peace and rest. Here we learn to scan gently our brother man, judging not, asking no questions, but metting out to all alike, in a hospitality worthy of the Hotel Jeu, and deeming ourselves honoured in being allowed to act as its dispensers. Here, too, are daily before our eyes the problems which have ever perplexed the human mind, problems not presented in the dead abstract of books, but in the living concrete of some poor fellow in his last round fighting a brave fight, but sadly waited, and going to his account, unhurseled, disappointed, unannelled, no reckoning made. As we whisper to each other over his bed that the battle is decided and euthanasia alone remains, have I not heard in reply to that muttered proverb so often on the lips of the physician. The fathers have eaten sour grapes. Your answer, in clear accents, the comforting words of the prayer of Stephen. But our work would be much restricted were it not for man's outside adversary, nature. The great Moloch, which exacts a frightful tax of human blood, sparing neither young nor old, taking the child from the cradle, the mother from her babe, 
and the father from the family. Is it strange that man, unable to dissociate a personal element from such work, has incarnated an evil principle, the devil? If we have now so far outgrown this idea as to hesitate to suggest in seasons of epidemic peril that it is for our sins we suffer when we know the drainage is bad, if we no longer mock the heart prostrate in the grief of loss with the words, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. When we know the milk should have been sterilized, if, I say, we have, in a measure, become emancipated from such teachings, we have not yet risen to a true conception of nature. Cruel, in the sense of being inexorable, she may be called, but we can no more upbraid her great laws than we can the lesser laws of the state, which are a terror only to evil doers. The pity is that we do not know them all. In our ignorance we err daily and pay a blood penalty. Fortunately, it is now a great and growing function of the medical profession to search out the laws about epidemics and these outside enemies of man, and to teach to you the public. Dull, stupid pupils you are, too, as a rule. The ways of nature, that you may walk therein and prosper. It would be interesting, members of the graduating class, to cast your horoscopes, to do so collectively, you would not like. To do so individually, I dare not. But it is safe to predict certain things of you as a whole. You will be better women for the life which you have led here. But what I mean by better women is that the eyes of your souls have been opened. The range of your sympathies has been widened. And your characters have been moulded by the events in which you have been participators during the past two years. Practically there should be for each of you a busy, useful and happy life. More you cannot expect, a greater blessing the world cannot bestow. Busy you will certainly be, as the demand is great, both in private and public, for women with your training. Useful your lives must be, as you will care for those who cannot care for themselves, and who need about them, in the day of tribulation, gentle hands and tender hearts, and happy lives shall be yours, because busy and useful, having been initiated into the great secret, that happiness lies in the absorption in some vocation which satisfies the soul, that we have here to add what we can to, not to get what we can from life. And finally, remember what we are, useful supernumeraries in the battle, simply stage accessories in the drama, playing minor but essential parts at the exits and entrances, or picking up here and there a strutter who may have tripped upon the stage. You have been much by the dark river, so near to us all, and have seen so many embark that the dread of the old boatman has almost disappeared. And when the angel of the darker drink at last shall find you by the river brink, and offering his cup invite your soul. Forth to your lips, to quaff, you shall not shrink. Your passport shall be the blessing of him in whose footsteps you have trodden, unto whose sick you have ministered, and for whose children you have cared. And of section two doctor and nurse recording by luke sartor berkeley california
Section three of Equanimitas by Sir William Osler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Section three Teacher and Student. A university consists, and has ever consisted, in demand and supply, in wants which it alone can satisfy, and which it does satisfy, in the communication of knowledge, and the relation and bond which exists between the teacher and the taught. Its constituting, animating principle is this moral attraction of one class of persons to another, which is prior in its nature, nay, commonly in its history, to any other tie whatever, so that where this is wanting, a university is alive only in name, and has lost its true essence, whatever be the advantages, whether of position or of affluence, with which the civil power or private benefactors contrive to encircle it. John Henry Newman It would seem, Adamantus, that the direction in which education starts a man will determine his future life. Plato Republic Fourth page of the front matter Jowett's translation Teacher and student Footnote University of Minnesota 1892 Truly it may be said today that in the methods of teaching medicine the old order changeth, giving place to new, and to this revolution let me briefly refer, since it has an immediate bearing on the main point I wish to make in the first portion of my address. The medical schools of the country have been either independent, university, or state institutions, the first class by far the most numerous, have in title university affiliations but are actually devoid of organic union with seats of learning. Necessary as these bodies have been in the past, it is a cause for sincere congratulation that the number is steadily diminishing. Admirable in certain respects, adorned, too, in many instances, by the names of men who bore the burden and heat of the day of small things, and have passed to their rest amid our honoured dead. The truth must be acknowledged that the lamentable state of medical education in this country twenty years ago was the direct result of the inherent viciousness of a system they fostered. Something in the scheme gradually deadened in the professors all sense of the responsibility until they professed to teach, mark the word. In less than two years, one of the most difficult arts in the world to acquire. Fellow teachers in medicine, believe me that when fifty or sixty years hence some historian traces the development of the profession in this country, he will dwell on the notable achievements, on the great discoveries, and on the unwearied devotion of its members. But he will pass judgment, yes, severe judgment, on the absence of the sense of responsibility which permitted a criminal laxity in medical education unknown before in our annals. But an awakening has come, and there is sounding the knell of doom for the medical college, responsible neither to the public nor the profession. The schools with close university connections have been the most progressive and thorough in this country. The revolution referred to began some twenty years ago with the appearance of the president of a well-known university at a meeting of its medical faculty with a peremptory command to set their house in order. C. Holmes on President Eliot in Life and Letters of O. W. Holmes, 1896, edition 2. 
190. Universities which teach only the liberal arts remain today, as in the Middle Ages, scholae minores, lacking the technical faculties which make the scholae majores. The advantages of this most natural union are manifold and reciprocal. The professors in a university medical school have not that independence of which I have spoken, but are under an influence which tends constantly to keep them at a high level. They are urged by emulation with the other faculties to improve the standard of work, and so are given a strong stimulus to further development. To anyone who has watched the growth of the new ideas in education, it is evident that the most solid advances in methods of teaching, the improved equipment, clinical and laboratory, and the kindlier spirit of generous rivalry, which has replaced the former debased method of counting heads as a test of merit, all these advantages have come from a tightening of the bonds between the medical school and the university. And lastly, there are the state schools, of which this college is one of the few examples. It has been a characteristic of American institutions to foster private industries and to permit private corporations to meet any demands on the part of the public. This idea carried to extreme allowed the unrestricted manufacture, note the term, of doctors, quite regardless of the qualifications usually thought necessary in civilized communities, of physicians, who may never have been inside a hospital ward, and who had, after graduation, to learn medicine somewhat in the fashion of the Chinese doctors, who recognized the course of the arteries of the body by noting just where the blood spurted when the acupuncture needle was inserted. So far as I know, state authorities have never interfered with any legally instituted medical school, however poorly equipped for its work, however lax the qualifications for license. Not only has this policy of non-intervention been carried to excess, but in many states a few physicians in any town could get a charter for a school without giving guarantees that laboratory or clinical facilities would be available. This anomalous condition is rapidly changing, owing partly to a revival of loyalty to higher ideals within the medical profession and partly to a growing appreciation in the public of the value of physicians thoroughly educated in modern methods. A practical acknowledgement of this is found in the recognition, in three states at least, of medicine as one of the technical branches to be taught in the university, supported by the people at large. But it is a secondary matter. After all, whether a school is under state or university control, whether the endowments are great or small, the equipments palatial or humble. The fate of an institution rests not on these. The inherent vital element, which transcends all material interests, which may give to a school glory and renown in their absence, and lacking which all the pride, pomp, and circumstance are vain. This vitalizing element, I say, lies in the men who work in its halls and in the ideals which they cherish and teach. There is a passage in one of John Henry Newman's historical sketches which expresses this feeling in terse and beautiful language. I say then that the personal influence of the teacher is able in some sort to dispense with an academical system, but that system cannot in any way dispense with personal influence. With influence there is life, without it there is none. If influence is deprived of its due position, it will not by those means be got rid of. It will only break out irregularly, dangerously. An academical system without the personal influence of teachers upon pupils is an arctic winter. It will create an ice-bound, petrified, cast-iron university, and nothing else. Naturally, from this standpoint, the selection of teachers is the function of highest importance 
in the regents of a university. Owing to local conditions, the choice of men for certain of the chairs is restricted to residents in the university town, as the salaries in most schools of this country have to be supplemented by outside work. But in all departments this principle should be acknowledged and acted upon by trustees and faculties and supported by public opinion, that the very best men available should receive appointments. It is gratifying to note the broad liberality displayed by American colleges in welcoming from all parts teachers who may have shown any special fitness, emulating in this respect the liberality of the Athenians, in whose porticos and lecture halls the stranger was greeted as a citizen and judged by his mental gifts alone not the least by any means of the object lessons taught by a great university is that literature and science know no country and as has been well said acknowledge no sovereignty but that of the mind and no nobility but that of genius but it is difficult in this matter to guide public opinion and the regents have often to combat a provincialism which is as fatal to the highest development of a university as is the shibboleth of a sectarian institution. To paraphrase the words of Matthew Arnold, the function of the teacher is to teach and to propagate the best that is known and taught in the world, to teach the current knowledge of the subject he professes, sifting, analyzing, sorting, laying down principles, to propagate, i.e., to multiply, facts on which to base principles, experimenting, searching, testing. The best that is known and taught in the world, nothing less can satisfy a teacher worthy of the name, and upon us, of the medical faculties, lies a bounden duty in this respect, since our art, coordinate with human suffering, is cosmopolitan. There are two aspects in which we may view the teacher, as a worker and instructor in science, and as a practitioner and professor of the art, and these correspond to the natural division of the faculty into the medical school proper and the hospital. In this eminently practical country, the teacher of science has not yet received full recognition, owing in part to the great expense connected with his work, and in part to carelessness or ignorance in the public as to the real strength of a nation. To equip and maintain separate laboratories in anatomy, physiology, chemistry, physiological and pharmacological, pathology and hygiene, and to employ skilled teachers who shall spend all their time in study and instruction, require a capital not today at the command of any medical school in the land. There are fortunate ones with two or three departments well organized, not one with all. In contrast, Bavaria, a kingdom of the German Empire, with an area less than this state, and a population of five and a half millions, supports in its three university towns flourishing medical schools with extensive laboratories, many of which are presided over by men of worldwide reputation, the steps of whose doors are worn in many cases by students who have crossed the Atlantic, seeking the wisdom of methods and the virtue of inspiration not easily accessible at home. But there were professors in Bavarian medical schools before Marquette and Joliet had launched their canoes on the great stream which the intrepid La Salle had discovered, before Dulut met Father Hennepin below the falls of St. Anthony. And justice compels us to acknowledge that while winning an empire from the backwoods, the people of this land had more urgent needs than laboratories of research. All has now changed. In this state, for example, the phenomenal growth of which has repeated the growth of the nation. The wilderness has been made to blossom as the rose, 
and the evidences of wealth and prosperity on every side almost constrain one to break out into the now old song happy is that people that is in such a case but in the enormous development of material interests there is a danger lest we miss altogether the secret of a nation's life the true test of which is to be found in its intellectual and moral standards there is no more potent antidote to the corroding influence of mammon than the presence in a community of a body of men devoted to science living for investigation and caring nothing for the lust of the eyes and the pride of life we forget that the measure of the value of a nation to the world is neither the bushel nor the barrel but mind and that wheat and pork though useful and necessary are but dross in comparison with those intellectual products which alone are imperishable the kindly fruits of the earth are easily grown the finer fruits of the mind are of slower development and require prolonged culture each one of the scientific branches to which i have referred has been so specialized that even to teach it takes more time than can be given by a single professor while the laboratory classes also demand skilled assistance the aim of a school should be to have these departments in the charge of men who have first enthusiasm that deep love of a subject the desire to teach and extend it without which all instruction becomes cold and lifeless secondly a full personal knowledge of the branch taught not a second-hand information derived from books but the living experience derived from experimental and practical work in the best laboratories this type of instructor is fortunately not rare in american schools the well-grounded students who have pursued their studies in england and on the continent have added depth and breadth to our professional scholarship and their critical faculties have been sharpened to discern what is best in the world of medicine it is particularly in these branches that we need teachers of wide learning whose standards of work are the highest known and whose methods are those of the masters in israel thirdly men are required who have a sense of obligation that feeling which impels a teacher to be also a contributor and to add to the stores from which he so freely draws and precisely here is the necessity to know the best that is taught in this branch the world over the investigator to be successful must start abreast of the knowledge of the day and he differs from the teacher who living in the present expounds only what is current in that his thoughts must be in the future and his ways and work in advance of the day in which he lives thus unless a bacteriologist has studied methods thoroughly and is familiar with the extraordinarily complex flora associated with healthy and diseased conditions and keeps in touch with every laboratory of research at home and abroad he will in attempting original work find himself exploring ground already well known and will probably burden an already overladen literature with faulty and crude observations to avoid mistakes he must know what is going on in the laboratories of england france and germany as well as in those of his own country and he must receive and read six or seven journals devoted to the subject the same need for wide and accurate study holds good in all branches thoroughly equipped laboratories in charge of men thoroughly equipped as teachers and investigators is the most pressing want today in the medical schools of this country the teacher as a professor and practitioner of his art is more favoured than his brother of whom i have been speaking he is more common too and less interesting though in the eyes of the fool multitude who choose by show more important and from the standpoint of medicine 
as an art for the prevention and cure of disease, the man who translates the hieroglyphics of science into the plain language of healing is certainly the more useful. He is more favoured inasmuch as the laboratory in which he works, the hospital, is a necessity in every centre of population. The same obligation rests on him to know and to teach the best that is known and taught in the world, on the surgeon the obligation to know thoroughly the scientific principles on which his art is based, to be a master in the technique of his handicraft, ever studying, modifying, improving on the physician, the obligation to study the natural history of diseases and the means for their prevention, to know the true value of regimen, diet, and drugs in their treatment, ever testing, devising, thinking, and upon both, to teach to their students habits of reliance, and to be to them examples of gentleness, forbearance, and courtesy in dealing with their suffering brethren. I would fain dwell upon many other points in the relation of the hospital to the medical school, on the necessity of ample, full and prolonged clinical instruction, and on the importance of bringing the student and the patient into close contact, not through the cloudy knowledge of the amphitheatre, but by means of the accurate, critical knowledge of the wards, on the propriety of encouraging the younger men as instructors and helpers in ward work, and on the duty of hospital physicians and surgeons to contribute to the advance of their art. But I pass on with an allusion to a very delicate matter in college faculties, from one who, like themselves, has passed la classe de quarante ans, the seniors present will pardon a few plain remarks upon the disadvantages to a school of having too many men of mature, not to say riper, years. Insensibly, in the fifth and sixth decades, there begins to creep over most of us a change, noted physically among other ways, the silvering of the hair and that lessening of elasticity, which impels a man to open rather than to vault a five-barred gate. It comes to all sooner or later. To some it is only too painfully evident. To others it comes unconsciously, with no pace perceived. And with most of us this physical change has its mental equivalent, not necessarily accompanied by loss of the powers of application, or of judgment. On the contrary, often the mind grows clearer and the memory more retentive. But the change is seen in a weakened receptivity and in an inability to adapt oneself to an altered intellectual environment. It is this loss of mental elasticity which makes men over forty so slow to receive new truths. Harvey complained in his day that few men above this critical age seemed able to accept the doctrine of the circulation of the blood, and in our own time it is interesting to note how the theory of the bacterial origin of certain diseases has had, as other truths, to grow to acceptance with the generation in which it was announced. The only safeguard in the teacher against this lamentable condition is to live in, and with, the third decade, in company with the younger, more receptive, and progressive minds. There is no sadder picture than the professor who has outgrown his usefulness, and the only one unconscious of the fact insists with a praiseworthy zeal upon the performance of duties for which the circumstances of the time have rendered him unfit. When a man nor wax nor honey can bring home, he should, in the interests of an institution, be dissolved from the hive to give more laborers room, though it is not every teacher who will echo the sentiment. Let me not live after my flame lacks oil to be the snuff of younger spirits whose apprehensive senses all but new things disdain. As we travel farther from the east, our salvation lies in keeping our faces toward the rising sun and in letting the fates drag us, like Cacus, his oxen, backward into the cave of oblivion. 
students of medicine, apprentices of the guild, with whom are the promises and in whom center our hopes. Let me congratulate you on the choice of calling, which offers a combination of intellectual and moral interests found in no other profession, and not met with at all in the common pursuits of life, a combination which, in the words of Sir James Paget, offers the most complete and constant union of those three qualities which have the greatest charm for pure and active minds, novelty, utility, and charity. But I am not here to laud our profession. Your presence here on these benches is a guarantee that such praise is superfluous. Rather allow me, in the time remaining at my disposal, to talk of the influences which may make you good students, now in the days of your pupilage, and hereafter when you enter upon the more serious duties of life. In the first place, acquire early the art of detachment, by which I mean the faculty of isolating yourselves from the pursuits and pleasures incident to youth. By nature, man is the incarnation of idleness, which quality alone, amid the ruined remnants of Edenic characters, remains in all its primitive intensity. Occasionally we do find an individual who takes to toil as others to pleasure, but the majority of us have to wrestle hard with the original Adam, and find it no easy matter to scorn delights and live laborious days. Of special importance is this gift to those of you who reside for the first time in a large city, the many attractions of which offer a serious obstacle to its acquisition. The discipline necessary to secure this art brings in its train habits of self-control and forms a valuable introduction to the sterner realities of life. I need scarcely warn you against too close attention to your studies. I have yet to meet a medical student, the heyday in whose blood had been quite tamed in his college days. But if you think I have placed too much stress upon isolation in putting the art of detachment first, in order amongst the desiderata, let me temper the hard saying by telling you how with labours assiduous due pleasures to mix. Ask of any active businessman or a leader in a profession the secret which enables him to accomplish much work and he will reply in one word, system. Or, as I shall term it, the virtue of method, the harness without which only the horses of genius travel. There are two aspects of this subject. The first relates to the orderly arrangement of your work, which is to some extent enforced by the roster of demonstrations and lectures but this you would do well to supplement in private study by a schedule in which each hour finds its allotted duty. Thus faithfully followed day by day, system may become at last ingrained in the most shiftless nature, and at the end of a semester a youth of moderate ability may find himself far in advance of the student who works spasmodically and trusts to cramming priceless as this virtue is now in the time of your probation it becomes in the practicing physician an incalculable blessing the incessant and irregular demands upon a busy doctor make it very difficult to retain but the public in this matter can be educated and the men who practice with system allotting a definite time of the day to certain work accomplish much more and have at any rate a little leisure, while those who are unmethodical never catch up with the day's duties and worry themselves, their confreres, and their patients. The other aspect of method has a deeper significance, hard for you to reach, not consoling when attained, since it lays bare our weaknesses. The practice of medicine is an art, based on science. Working with science, 
in science, for science, it has not reached, perhaps never will, the dignity of a complete science, with exact laws, like astronomy or engineering. Is there, then, no science in medicine? Yes, but in parts only, such as anatomy and physiology, and the extraordinary development of these branches during the present century has been due to the cultivation of method, by which we have reached some degree of exactness, some certainty of truth. Thus we can weigh the secretions in the balance and measure the work of the heart in foot-pounds. The deep secrets of generation have been revealed, and the sesame of evolution has given us fairy tales of science more enchanting than the Arabian Nights' entertainment. With this great increase in our knowledge of the laws governing the processes of life has been a corresponding, not less remarkable, advance in all that relates to life in disorder, that is, disease. The mysteries of heredity are less mysterious. The operating room has been, twice over, robbed of its terrors. The laws of epidemics are known, and the miracle of the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, may be repeated in any town out of Bumbledom. All this change has come about by the observation of facts, by their classification, and by the founding upon them of general laws. Emulating the persistence and care of Darwin, we must collect facts with open-minded watchfulness, unbiased by croquettes or notions, fact on fact, instance on instance, experiment on experiment, facts which fitly joined together by some master who grasps the idea of their relationship may establish a general principle. But in the practice of medicine, where our strength should be, lies our great weakness. Our study is man, as the subject of accidents or diseases. Were he always inside and out, cast in the same mould, instead of differing from his fellow man as much in constitution and in his reaction to stimulus as in feature, we should ere this have reached some settled principles in our art. And not only are the reactions themselves variable, but we, the doctors, are so fallible, ever beset with the common and fatal facility of reaching conclusions from superficial observations, and constantly misled by the ease with which our minds fall into the ruts of one or two experiences. And, thirdly, add to the virtue of method, the quality of thoroughness, an element of such importance that I had thought of making it the only subject of my remarks. Unfortunately, in the present arrangement of the curriculum, few of you as students can hope to obtain more than a measure of it, but all can learn its value now, and ultimately with patience become living examples of its benefit. Let me tell you briefly what it means. A knowledge of the fundamental sciences upon which our art is based, chemistry, anatomy, and physiology, not a smattering, but a full and deep acquaintance, not with all the facts, that is impossible, but with the great principles based upon them. You should, as students, become familiar with the methods by which advances in knowledge are made, and in the laboratory see clearly the paths the great masters have trodden, though you yourselves cannot walk therein. With a good preliminary training and a due apportioning of time, you can reach in these three essential studies a degree of accuracy which is the true preparation for your life duties. It means such a knowledge of diseases and of the emergencies of life and of the means for their alleviation that you are safe and trustworthy guides for your fellow men. You cannot, of course, in the brief years of pupilage, so grasp the details of the various branches that you can surely recognize and successfully treat all cases. But here, if you have mastered certain principles, 
is at any rate one benefit of thoroughness you will avoid the sloths of charlatanism napoleon according to saint beuve one day said when somebody was spoken of in his presence as a charlatan charlatan as much as you please but where is there not charlatanism now thoroughness is the sole preventative of this widespread malady which in medicine is not met with only outside of the profession matthew arnold who quotes the above from saint beuve defines charlatanism as the confusing or obliterating the distinctions between excellent and inferior sound and unsound or only half sound true and untrue or half true the higher the standard of education in a profession the less marked will be the charlatanism whereas no greater incentive to its development can be found than in sending out from our colleges men who have not had mental training sufficient to enable them to judge between the excellent and the inferior the sound and the unsound the true and the half true and if we of the household are not free from the seductions of this vice what of the people among whom we work from the days of the sage of endor even the rulers have loved to dabble in it while the public of all ages have ever reveled in its methods today as in the time of the father of medicine one of whose contemporaries plato thus sketches the world old trait and what a delightful life they lead they are always doctoring and increasing and complicating their disorders and always fancying they will be cured by any nostrum which anybody advises them to try the art of detachment the virtue of method and the quality of thoroughness may make you students in the true sense of the word successful practitioners or even great investigators but your characters may still lack that which can alone give permanence to powers the grace of humility as the divine italian at the very entrance to purgatory was led by his gentle master to the banks of the island and girt with a rush indicating thereby that he had cast off all pride and self-conceit and was prepared for his perilous ascent to the realms above so should you now at the outset of your journey take the reed of humility in your hands in token that you appreciate the length of the way the difficulties to be overcome and the infallibility of the faculties upon which you depend in these days of aggressive self-assertion when the stress of competition is so keen and the desire to make the most of oneself so universal it may seem a little old-fashioned to preach the necessity of this virtue but i insist for its own sake and for the sake of what it brings that a due humility should take the place of honour on the list for its own sake since with it comes not only a reverence for truth but also a proper estimation of the difficulties encountered in our search for it more perhaps than any other professional man the doctor has a curious shall i say morbid sensitiveness to what he regards personal error in a way this is right but it is too often accompanied by a cocksureness of opinion which if encouraged leads him to so lively a conceit that the mere suggestion of mistake under any circumstances is regarded as a reflection on his honour a reflection equally resented whether of lay or of professional origin start out with the conviction that absolute truth is hard to reach in matters relating to our fellow creatures healthy or diseased that slips in observation are inevitable even with the best trained faculties that errors in judgment must occur in the practice of an art which consists largely in balancing probabilities start i say with this attitude of mind and mistakes will be acknowledged and regretted 
but instead of a slow process of self-deception, with ever-increasing inability to recognize truth, you will draw from your errors the very lessons which may enable you to avoid their repetition. And, for the sake of what it brings, this grace of humility is a precious gift. When to the sessions of sweet, silent thought you summon up the remembrance of your own imperfections, the faults of your brothers will seem less grievous, and, in the quaint language of Sir Thomas Brown, you will allow one eye for what is laudable in them. The wrangling and unseemly disputes which have too often disgraced our profession arise in a great majority of cases, on the one hand, from this morbid sensitiveness to the confession of error, and, on the other, from a lack of brotherly consideration and a convenient forgetfulness of our own failings. Take to heart the words of the son of Sirach, winged words to the sensitive souls of the sons of Aesculapius. Admonish a friend, and it may be he has not done it. And, if he have done it, that he do it no more. Admonish thy friend, it may be he hath not said it. And if he have, that he speak it not again. Admonish a friend, for many times it is a slander, and believe not every tale. Yes, many times it is a slander, and believe not every tale. The truth that lowliness is young ambition's ladder is hard to grasp, and when accepted, harder to maintain. It is so difficult to be still amidst bustle, to be quiet amidst noise. Yet, es bildet ein talent sich in der Stille. Alone, in the calm life necessary to continuous work for a high purpose. The spirit abroad at present in this country is not favorable to this Teutonic view, which galls the quick apprehension and deepens the enthusiasm of the young American. All the same, it is true and irksome at first, though the discipline may be, there will come a time when the very fetters in which you chafed shall be a strong defense, and your chains a robe of glory. Sitting in Lincoln Cathedral and gazing at one of the loveliest of human works, for such the angel choir has been said to be, there arose within me, obliterating for the moment the thousand heraldries and twilight saints and dim emblazonings, a strong sense of reverence for the minds which had conceived and the hands which had executed such things of beauty. What manner of men were they who could, in those, to us dark days, build such transcendent monuments? What was the secret of their art? By what spirit were they moved? Absorbed in thought, I did not hear the beginning of the music, and then, as a response to my reverie, and arousing me from it, rang out the clear voice of the boy leading the antiphon. That thy power, thy glory, and mightiness of thy kingdom might be known unto men. Here was the answer. Moving in a world not realized, these men sought, however feebly, to express in glorious structures their conceptions of the beauty of holiness, and these works, our wonder, are but the outward and visible signs of the ideals which animated them. To us, in very different days, life offers nearly the same problems, but the conditions have changed. And, as has happened before in the world's history, great material prosperity has weakened the influence of ideals and blurred the eternal difference between means and ends. Still, the ideal state, the ideal life, the ideal church, what they are and how best to realize them, such dreams continue to haunt the minds of men. And who can doubt that their contemplation 
greatly assists the upward progress of our race. We, too, as a profession, have cherished standards, some of which, in words sadly disproportionate to my subject, I have attempted to portray. My message is chiefly to you, students of medicine, since with the ideals entertained now, your future is indissolubly bound. The choice lies open. The paths are plain before you. Always seek your own interests. Make of a high and sacred calling a sordid business. Regard your fellow creatures as so many tools of trade. And if your heart's desire is for riches, they may be yours. But you will have bartered away the birthright of noble heritage. Traduced the physician's well-deserved title of the friend of man, and falsified the best traditions of an ancient and honourable guild. On the other hand, I have tried to indicate some of the ideals which you may reasonably cherish. No matter, though, they are paradoxical in comparison with the ordinary conditions in which you work. They will have, if encouraged, an ennobling influence even if it be for you only to say with Rabbi Ben Ezra, what I aspired to be, and was not, comforts me. And though this course does not necessarily bring position or renown, consistently followed, it will at any rate give to your youth an exhilarating zeal and a cheerfulness which will enable you to surmount all obstacles to your maturity a serene judgment of men and things, and that broad charity without which all else is naught. To your old age that greatest of blessings, peace of mind, a realization, maybe, of the prayer of Socrates, for the beauty in the inward soul, and for unity of the outer and the inner man perhaps, of the promise of St. Bernard. Pax sine crimine, pax sine turbine, pax sine risa. End of section 3. Teacher and Student. Recording by Luke Sartor, Berkeley, California. Chapter 4, Part 1 of Equanimitas and Other Addresses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4 Physic and Physicians, as depicted in Plato. To one small people it was given to create the principle of progress. That people was the Greek. Except the blind forces of nature, nothing moves in this world which is not Greek in its origin. Maine, quoted in Greek Thinkers by Gompertz. From the lifeless background of an unprogressive world, Egypt, Syria, frozen Scythia, a world in which the unconscious social aggregate had been everything, the conscious individual, his capacity and rights, almost nothing. The Greek had stepped forth, like the young prince in the fable, to set things going. Walter Pater Plato and Platonism Three years of vague, restless speculation had now lasted long enough, and it was time for the Mr. Jar of quiet, methodical research to succeed if science was to acquire steady and sedentary habits instead of losing itself in a maze of fantasies revolving in idle circles. It is the undying glory of the medical school of Cos that it introduced this innovation in the domain of its art 
and thus exercised the most beneficial influence on the whole intellectual life of mankind. Fiction to the right, reality to the left, was the battle cry of this school in the war they were the first to wage against the excesses and defects of the nature philosophy. Nor could it have found any more suitable champions for the serious and noble calling of the physician, which brings him every day and every hour in close communion with nature, in the exercise of which mistakes in theory engender the most fatal practical consequences, has served in all ages as a nursery of the most genuine and incorruptible sense of truth. The best physicians must be the best observers, but the man who sees keenly, who hears clearly, and whose senses, powerful at the start, are sharpened and refined by constant exercise, will only in exceptional instances be a visionary or a dreamer. Gompertz, Greek Thinkers, Volume 1 Johns Hopkins Hospital, Historical Club, 1893 our historical club had under consideration last winter the subject of Greek medicine. After introductory remarks and a description of the Esculapian temples and worship by Dr. Welch, we proceeded to a systematic study of the Hippocratic writings, taking up in order, as found in them, medicine, hygiene, surgery, and gynecology. Among much of interest which we gleaned not the least important was the knowledge that, as an art, medicine had made, even before Hippocrates, great progress, as much almost as was possible, without a basis in the sciences of anatomy and physiology. Minds inquisitive, acute, and independent had been studying the problems of nature and of man, and several among the pre-Socratic philosophers had been distinguished physicians, notably Pythagoras, Empedocles, and Democritus. Unfortunately, we know but little of their views, or even of the subjects in medicine on which they wrote. In the case of Democritus, however, Diogenes Laertius has preserved a list of his medical writings, which intensifies the regret at the loss of the works of this great man the title of one of whose essays, On Those Who Are Attacked With Cough After Illness, indicates a critical observation of disease, which Darenberg seems unwilling to allow to the pre-Hippocratic philosopher-physicians. We gathered also that in the golden age of Greece, medicine had, as today, a triple relationship with science, with gymnastics, and with theology. We can imagine an Athenian father of the early 4th century worried about the enfeebled health of one of his growing lads, asking the advice of Hippocrates about a suspicious cough, or sending him to the palestra of Torres for a systematic course in gymnastics. Or, as Socrates advised, when human skill was exhausted, asking the assistance of the divine Apollo through his son, the hero physician Esculapius, at his temple in Epidaurus or at Athens itself. Could the Greek live over his parental troubles at the end of the nineteenth century? He would get a more exact diagnosis and a more rational treatment, but he might travel far to find so eminent a professor of gymnastic as Micus for his boy and in Christian science or faith healing, he would find our bastard substitute for the stately and gracious worship of the Esculapian temple. From the Hippocratic writings alone, we have a very imperfect knowledge of the state of medicine in the most brilliant period of Grecian history. And many details relating to the character and to the life of physicians are gleaned only from secular authors. So much of the daily life of a civilized community relates to problems of health and disease that the great writers of every age of necessity 
throw an important sidelight not only on the opinions of the people on these questions, but often on the condition of special knowledge in various branches. Thus a considerable literature already illustrates the medical knowledge of Shakespeare, from whose doctors, apothecaries, and mad folk much may be gathered as to the state of the profession in the latter part of the sixteenth century. So also the satire of Moliere, malicious though it be, has preserved for us phases of medical life in the seventeenth century, for which we scan in vain the strictly medical writings of that period, and writers of our times, like George Eliot, have told for future generations, in a character such as Lydgate, the little everyday details of the struggles and aspirations of the profession of the nineteenth century, of which we find no account whatever in the files of The Lancet. We are fortunate in having had preserved the writings of the two most famous of the Greek philosophers, the great idealist Plato, whose contemplation of all time and all existence was more searching than that of his predecessors, fuller than that of any of his disciples, and the great realist, Aristotle, to whose memory every department of knowledge still pays homage, and who has swayed the masterminds of twenty-two centuries. From the writings of both, much may be gathered about Greek physic and physicians, but I propose in this essay to restrict myself to what I have culled from the dialogues of Plato. I shall first speak of his physiological and pathological speculations, then I shall refer to the many interesting allusions to, and analogies drawn from, medicine and physicians. And lastly, I shall try to estimate from the dialogues the social standing of the Greek doctor, and shall speak on other points which bear upon the general condition of the profession. The quotations are made in every instance from Professor Jowett's translation, the third edition, 1892. Footnote. The Dialogues of Plato, translated into English by B. Jowett, M.A., Master of Balliol College, Oxford, at the Clarendon Press, first edition, 1871, Third edition, 1892. To our enlightened minds, the anatomy and physiology of Plato are crude and imperfect, as much or even more so than those of Hippocrates. In the Timaeus, he conceived the elements to be made up of bodies in the form of triangles, the different varieties and combinations of which accounted for the existence of the four elementary bodies of Empedocles, fire, earth, water, and air. The differences in the elementary bodies are due to differences in the size and arrangement of the elementary triangles, which, like the atoms of the atomist, are too small to be visible. Marrow had the most perfect of the elementary triangles, and from it bone, flesh, and the other structures of the body were made. God took such of the primary triangles as were straight and smooth, and were adapted by their perfection to produce fire and water and air and earth. These, I say, he separated from their kinds, and, mingling them in due proportions with one another, made the marrow out of them to be a universal seed of the whole race of mankind. And in this seed he then planted and enclosed the souls, and in the original distribution, gave to the marrow as many and various forms as the different kinds of souls were hereafter to receive. That which, like a field, was to receive the divine seed, he made round every way, and called that portion of the marrow brain, intending that, when an animal was perfected, the vessel containing this substance should be the head, but that which was intended to contain the remaining 
and mortal part of the soul, he distributed into figures at once, round and elongated, and he called them all by the name Marrow, and to these, as to anchors, fastening the bonds of the whole soul, he proceeded to fashion around them the entire framework of our body, constructing for the marrow, first of all, a complete covering of bone. The account of the structure of bone and flesh, and of functions of respiration, digestion, and circulation, is unintelligible to our modern notions. Plato knew that the blood was in constant motion, in speaking of inspiration and expiration, and the network of fire which interpenetrates the body, he says, For when the respiration is going in and out, and the fire, which is fast bound within, follows it, and ever and anon moving to and fro, enters the belly and reaches the meat and drink, it dissolves them, and dividing them into small portions, and guiding them through the passages where it goes, pumps them as from a fountain into the channels of the veins, and makes the stream of the veins flow through the body as though a conduit. A complete circulation was unknown, but Plato understood fully that the blood was the source of nourishment, the liquid itself we call blood, which nourishes the flesh and the whole body whence all parts are watered and empty spaces filled. In the young, the triangles, or in modern parlance, we would say the atoms, are new and are compared to the keel of a vessel just off the stocks. They are locked firmly together, but form a soft and delicate mass, freshly made of marrow and nourished on milk. The process of digestion is described as a struggle between the triangles, out of which the meats and drinks are composed, and those of the bodily frame. And, as the former are older and weaker, the newer triangles of the body cut them up, and in this way the animal grows great, being nourished by a multitude of similar particles. The triangles are in constant fluctuation and change, and in the symposium, Socrates makes Dear Tima, say, A man is called the same, and yet in the short interval which elapses between youth and age, and in which every animal is said to have life and identity, he is undergoing a perpetual process of loss and reparation. Hair, flesh, bones, and the whole body are always changing. Footnote Dialogues First edition, page 578. The description of senility, euthanasia, and death is worth quoting. But when the roots of the triangles are loosened by having undergone many conflicts with many things in the course of time, they are no longer able to cut or assimilate the food which enters, but are themselves easily divided by the bodies which come in from without. In this way, every animal is overcome and decays, and this affection is called old age. And at last, when the bonds by which the triangles of the marrow are united no longer hold, and are parted by the strain of existence, they in turn loosen the bonds of the soul, and she, obtaining a natural release, flies away with joy. For that which takes place according to nature is pleasant but that which is contrary to nature is painful. And thus death, if caused by disease or produced by wounds, is painful and violent. But that sort of death which comes with old age and fulfills the debt of nature is the easiest of deaths, and is accompanied with pleasure rather than with pain. The mode of origin and the nature of disease, as described in the Timaeus, are in keeping with this primitive and imperfect science. The diseases of the body arise when any one of the four elements is out of place, or when the blood, sinews, and flesh are produced in a wrong order. 
Much influence is attributed to the various kinds of bile. The worst of all diseases, he thinks, are those of the spinal marrow, in which the whole course of the body is reversed. Other diseases are produced by disorders of respiration, as by phlegm, when detained within by reason of the air bubbles. This, if mingled with black bile and dispersed about the courses of the head, produces epilepsy, attacks of which during sleep, he says, are not so severe, but when it assails those who are awake, it is hard to be got rid of, and, being an affection of a sacred part, is most justly called sacred, morbus sacer. Of other disorders, excess of fire causes a continuous fever, of air, Quotidian fever, of water, which is a more sluggish element than either fire or air, tertian fever, of earth, the most sluggish element of the four, is only purged away in a fourfold period, that is, in a quartan fever. The psychology of Plato, in contrast to his anatomy and physiology, has a strangely modern savour and the threefold divisions of the mind into reason, spirit, and appetite represents very much the mental types recognized by students of the present day. The rational, immortal principle of the soul, the golden cord of reason, dwells in the brain, and inasmuch as we are a plant not of earthly but of heavenly growth, raises us from earth to our kindred who are in heaven. The mortal soul consists of two parts, the one with which man loves and hungers and thirsts, and feels the flutterings of any other desire, is placed between the midriff and the boundary of the navel. The other, passion or spirit, is situated in the breast between the midriff and the neck, in order that it might be under the rule of reason and might join with it in controlling and restraining the desires when they are no longer willing of their own accord to obey the word of command issuing from the citadel. No more graphic picture of the struggle between the rational and appetitive parts of the soul has ever been given than in the comparison of man in the phydrus to a charioteer driving a pair of winged horses, one of which is noble and of noble breed the other ignoble and of ignoble breed, so that the driving of them of necessity gives a great deal of trouble to him. Footnote. Dialogues. First edition. Page 452. The comparison of the mind of man in the Theostetus to a block of wax, which is of different sizes, in different men, harder, moister, and having more or less of purity in one than another, and in some of an intermediate quality, is one of the happiest of Plato's conceptions. This wax tablet is a gift of memory, the mother of the muses, and when we wish to remember anything which we have seen, or heard, or thought, in our own minds, we hold the wax to the perceptions and thoughts and in that material receive the impression of them as from the seal of a ring, and that we remember and know what is imprinted as long as the image lasts, but when the image is effaced or cannot be taken, then we forget and do not know. Footnote Dialogues, 4th edition, pages 254 to 255. Another especially fortunate comparison is that of the mind to an aviary, which is gradually occupied by different kinds of birds, which correspond to the varieties of knowledge. When we were children, the aviary was empty, and as we grow up, we go about catching the various kinds of knowledge. Footnote. Dialogues. Fourth edition. Page 262.
Plato recognized in the Timaeus two kinds of mental disease, to wit, madness and ignorance. He has the notion advocated by advanced psychologists today that much of the prevalent vice is due to an ill disposition of the body and is involuntary. For no man is voluntarily bad. But the bad becomes bad by reason of ill disposition of the body and a bad education, things which are hateful to every man and happen to him against his will. Footnote Dialogues, 3rd edition, page 509. A fuller discussion of the theorem that madness and the want of sense are the same is found in the Alcibiades, which is not, however, one of the genuine dialogues. The different kinds of want of sense are very graphically described. Socrates. In like manner, Men differ in regard to want of sense. Those who are most out of their wits we call madmen, while we term those who are less far gone stupid or idiotic. Or if we prefer gentle language, describe them as romantic or simple-minded, or again as innocent or inexperienced or foolish. You may even find other names if you seek for them, but by all of them, lack of sense is intended. They only differ as one art appears to us to differ from another, or one disease from another. There is a shrewd remark in the Republic that the most gifted minds, when they are ill-educated, become preeminently bad. Do not great crimes and the spirit of pure evil spring out of a fullness of nature ruined by education rather than from any inferiority, whereas weak natures are scarcely capable of any very great good or very great evil. Footnote Dialogues, 3rd edition, page 189 in the Phaedrus there is recognized a form of madness, which is a divine gift and a source of the chiefest blessings granted to man. Of this there are four kinds, prophecy, inspiration, poetry, and love. That indefinable something which makes the poet as contrasted with the rhythmaster, and which is above and beyond all art, is well characterized in the following sentence. But he who, having no touch of the muse's madness in his soul, comes to the door and thinks that he will get into the temple by the help of art, he, I say, and his poetry are not admitted. The sane man disappears and is nowhere when he enters into rivalry with a madman. Footnote Dialogues, 1st edition, pages 450 to 451. Not by wisdom do poets write poetry, but by a sort of inspiration and genius. Apology. Certain crimes, too, are definitely recognized as manifestations of insanity. In the laws, the incurable criminal is thus addressed. Oh, sir, the impulse which moves you to rob temples is not an ordinary human malady, nor yet a visitation of heaven, but a madness which is begotten in man from ancient and unexpiated crimes of his race. In the laws, too, it is stated that there are many sorts of madness, some arising out of disease, and others originating in an evil and passionate temperament and are increased by bad education. Respecting the care of the insane, it is stated that a madman shall not be at large in the city, but his relations shall keep him at home in any way they can, or if not, certain fines are mentioned. Footnote Dialogues Edition 5 Pages 236, 323, 
and 324. The greatest aid in the prevention of disease is to preserve the due proportion of mind and body. For there is no proportion or disproportion more productive of health and disease, and virtue and vice, than that between soul and body. In the double nature of the living being, if there is in this compound and impassioned soul more powerful than the body, that soul, I say, convulses and fills with disorders the whole inner nature of man, and when eager in the pursuit of some sort of learning or study, causes wasting, or again, when teaching or disputing in private or in public, and considerations and controversies arise, inflames and dissolves the composite form of man, and introduces reams. And the nature of this phenomenon is not understood by most professors of medicine, who ascribe it to the opposite of the real cause. Body and mind should both be equally exercised to protect against this disproportion, and we should not move the body without the soul, or the soul without the body. In this way, they will be on their guard against each other, and be healthy and well balanced. He urges the mathematician to practice gymnastic, and the gymnast to cultivate music and philosophy. Footnote, Dialogues, Edition 3, pages 510 and 511. The modes of treatment advised are simple, and it is evident that Plato had not much faith in medicines. Professor Jowett's commentary is he worth quoting. Plato is still the enemy of the purgative treatment of physicians, which, except in extreme cases, no man of sense will ever adopt. For, as he adds, with an insight into the truth, every disease is akin to the nature of the living being, and is only irritated by stimulants. He is of opinion that nature should be left to herself, and is inclined to think that physicians are in vain, where he says that warm baths should be more beneficial to the limbs of the aged rustic than the prescriptions of a not overwise doctor. If he seems to be extreme in his condemnation of medicine and to rely too much on diet and exercise, he might appeal to nearly all the best physicians of our own age in support of his opinions, who often speak to their patients of the worthlessness of drugs. For we ourselves are sceptical about medicine, and very unwilling to submit to the purgative treatment of physicians. May we not claim, for Plato, an anticipation of modern ideas as about some questions of astronomy and physics, so also about medicine? As in the Charmides, he tells us that the body cannot be cured without the soul, so in the Timaeus he strongly asserts the sympathy of soul and body. Any defect of either is the occasion of the greatest discord and disproportion in the other. Here too may be a presentiment that in the medicine of the future the interdependence of mind and body will be more fully recognized, and that the influence of the one over the other may be exerted in a manner which is not now thought possible. The effect of the purgative method to which Plato was so opposed is probably referred to in the following passage. When a man goes of his own accord to a doctor's shop and takes medicine, is he not quite aware that soon and for many days afterwards he will be in a state of body which he would rather die than accept as a permanent condition of his life? It is somewhat remarkable that nowhere in the dialogues is any reference made to the method of healing at the Esculapian temples. The comments upon physic and physicians are made without allusion to these institutions. Hippocrates and other practitioners of Athens were probably secular Asclepiads, but as Dyer remarks, in spite of the severance, the doctors kept in touch with the worship of Esculapius, and the priests in his temples did not scorn such secular knowledge as they could gain from lay practitioners. 
so much for the general conception of the structure and functions of the body in order and disorder as conceived by plato when nothing more to be gleaned the thoughts on these questions of one of the greatest minds of what was intellectually the most brilliant period of the race would be of interest but scattered throughout his writings are innumerably little obiter dicta which indicate a profound knowledge of that side of human nature which turns uppermost when the machinery is out of gear end of chapter four part one recording by luke sartor berkeley california Part 2 of Chapter 4 Physic and Physicians. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 2 of Chapter 4 Physic and Physicians in Equanimitas by Sir William Osler. So much for the general conception of the structure and functions of the body in order and disorder as conceived by plato were nothing more to be gleaned the thoughts on these questions of one of the greatest minds of what was intellectually the most brilliant period of the race would be of interest but scattered throughout his writings are innumerably little obiter dicta which indicate a profound knowledge of that side of human nature which turns uppermost when the machinery is out of gear. There are, in addition, many charming analogies drawn from medicine and many acute suggestions, some of which have a modern flavour. The noble pilot and the wise physician, who, as Nestor remarks, is worth many another man, furnish some of the most striking illustrations of the dialogues. One of the most admirable definitions of the art of medicine I selected as a rubric with which to grace my textbook, and I said of medicine that this is an art which considers the constitution of the patient and has principles of action and reasons in each case, or again the comprehensive view taken in the statement. There is one science of medicine which is concerned with the inspection of health equally in all times, present, past, and future. Plato gives delicious account of the origin of the modern medicine, as contrasted with the art of the guild of Asclepius. Well, I said, and to require the help of medicine, not when a wound has to be cured, or on occasion of an epidemic, but just because by indolence and a habit of life, such as we have been describing, men fill themselves with waters and winds as if their bodies were a marsh compelling the ingenious sons of asclepius to find more names for diseases such as flatulence and catarrh is not this too a disgrace yes he said they do certainly give very strange and newfangled names to diseases Yes, I said, and I do not believe there were any such diseases in the days of Asclepius, and this I infer from the circumstance that the hero Eurypylus, after he had been wounded in Homer, drinks a posset of Pramnian wine, well besprinkled with barley meal and grated cheese, which are certainly inflammatory, and yet the sons of Asclepius, who were at the Trojan War, do not blame the damsel who gives him the drink or rebuke Patroclus, who is treating his case. Well, he said, this was surely an extraordinary drink to be given to a person in his condition. Not so extraordinary, I replied, if you bear in mind that in former days, as is commonly said, before the time of Herodicus, the guild of Asclepius did not practice our present system of medicine, which may be said to educate diseases. But Herodicus, being a trainer, and himself of a sickly constitution, by a combination of training and doctoring, 
found out a way of torturing first and chiefly himself, and secondly the rest of the world. How was that? he said. By the invention of lingering death, for he had a mortal disease which he perpetually tended, and as recovery was out of the question, he passed his entire life as a valetudinarian. He could do nothing but attend upon himself, and he was in constant torment whenever he departed in anything from his usual regimen, and so dying hard, by the help of science, he struggled on to old age, a rare reward of his skill. He goes on to say that Asclepius did not instruct his descendants in valetudinarian arts, because he knew that in well-ordered states, individuals with occupations had no time to be ill. If a carpenter falls sick, he asks the doctor for a rough and ready cure, an emetic, or a purge, or a cautery, or the knife. These are his remedies. Should any one prescribe for him a course of dietetics and tell him to swathe and swaddle his head and all that sort of thing, he says, he sees no good in a life spent in nursing his disease to the neglect of his customary employment, and therefore bidding good-bye to this sort of physician, he resumes his ordinary habits, and either gets well and lives and does his business, or, if his constitution fails, he dies and has no more trouble. He is more in earnest in another place, Gorgias, in an account of the relations of the arts of medicine and gymnastics. The soul and the body being two, have two arts corresponding to them. There is the art of politics attending on the soul, and another art attending on the body, of which I know no specific name, but which may be described as having two divisions, one of them gymnastic and the other medicine. And in politics there is a legislative part, which answers to gymnastic, as justice does to medicine. And the two parts run into one another, justice having to do with the same subject as legislation, and medicine with the same subject as gymnastic, but with a difference. Cookery stimulates the disguise of medicine, and pretends to know what food is the best for the body. And if the physician and the cook had to enter into a competition, in which children were the judges, or men who had no more sense than children, as to which of them best understands the goodness or badness of food, the physician would be starved to death. And later in the same dialogue, Socrates claims to be the only true politician of his time who speaks, not with any view of pleasing, but for the good of the state, and is unwilling to practice the graces of rhetoric and so would make a bad figure in a court of justice. He says, I shall be tried just as a physician would be tried in a court of little boys at the indictment of the cook. What would he reply under such circumstances, if some one were to accuse him, saying, Oh, my boys, many evil things has this man done to you. He is the death of you, especially of the younger ones among you cutting and burning and starving and suffocating you, until you know not what to do. He gives you the bitterest potions and compels you to hunger and fast. How unlikely the variety of meats and sweets on which I feasted for you. What do you suppose that the physician would be able to reply when he found himself in such a predicament? If he told the truth, he could only say, All these evil things, my boys, I did for your health. And then would there not just be a clamour among a jury like that? How they would cry out! The principle of continuity, of uniformity, so striking in ancient physics, was transferred to the body, which, like the world, was conceived as a whole. Several striking passages illustrative of this 
are to be found. Thus, to the question of Socrates, do you think that you can know the nature of the soul intelligently without knowing the nature of the whole? Phaedrus replies, Hippocrates, the Asclepiad, says that the nature even of the body can only be understood as a whole. The importance of treating the whole and not the part is insisted upon. In the case of a patient who comes to them with bad eyes, the saying is that they cannot cure his eyes by themselves, but that if his eyes are to be cured, his head must be treated. And then again they say that to think of curing the head alone and not the rest of the body also is the height of folly. Charmides had been complaining of a headache, and Critias had asked Socrates to make believe that he could cure him of it. He said that he had a charm, which he had learned, when serving with the army, of one of the physicians of the Thracian king, Zemolxes. The physician had told Socrates that the cure of the part should not be attempted without treatment of the whole and also that no attempt should be made to cure the body without the soul. And therefore, if the head and body are to be well, you must begin by curing the soul. That is the first thing. And he who taught me the cure and the charm added a special direction. Let no one, he said, persuade you to cure the head until he has first given you his soul to be cured. For this, he said, is the great error of our day in the treatment of the human body, that physicians separate the soul from the body. The charms to which he referred were fair words by which temperance was implanted in the soul. Though a contemporary, Hippocrates is only once again referred to in the dialogues, where the young Hippocrates, son of Apollodorus, who has come to Protagoras, that almighty wise man, as Socrates terms him in another place, to learn the science and knowledge of human life, is asked by Socrates, If you were going to Hippocrates of Cos, the Asclepiad, and were about to give him your money, and someone had said to you, You are paying money to your namesake, Hippocrates. O oh, Hippocrates! Tell me, what is he that you give him money? How would you have answered? I should say, he replied, that I gave money to him as a physician. And what will he make of you? A physician, he said. A paragraph which would indicate that Hippocrates was in the habit of taking pupils and teaching them the art of medicine and in the Euthydemus, with reference to the education of physicians, Socrates says that he would send such to those who profess the art, and to those who demand payment for teaching the art, and profess to teach it to anyone who will come and learn. We get a glimpse of the method of diagnosis, derived doubtless from personal observation, possibly of the great Hippocrates himself, whose critical knowledge of pulmonary complaints we daily recognize in the use of his name, in association with the clubbed fingers of Phthisis, and with the succussion splash of pneumothorax. Suppose someone, who is inquiring into the health or some other bodily quality of another, he looks at his face and at the tips of his fingers, and then he says, Uncover your chest, and back to me, that I may have a better view. And then Socrates says to Protagoras, Uncover your mind to me, reveal your opinion, etc. One of the most celebrated medical passages is that in which Socrates professes the art of a midwife practicing on the souls of men when they are in labor, and diagnosing their condition whether pregnant with the truth or with some darling folly. 
the entire section though long must be quoted socrates is in one of his little difficulties and wishes to know of the young theatetus who has been presented to him as a paragon of learning and whose progress in the path of knowledge has been sure and smooth flowing on silently like a river of oil what is knowledge theatetus is soon entangled and cannot shake off a feeling of anxiety theatetus i can assure you socrates that i have tried very often when the report of questions asked by you was brought to me but i can neither persuade myself that i have any answer to give nor hear of any one who answers as you would have him and i cannot shake off a figgling of anxiety socrates these are the pangs of labor my dear theatetus you have something within you which you are bringing to the birth theatetus i do not know socrates i only say what i feel socrates and did you never hear simpleton that i am the son of a midwife brave and burly whose name was Phenaret? Thetatus. Yes, I have. Socrates. And that I myself practice midwifery? Thetatus. No, never. Socrates. Let me tell you that I do, though, my friend, but you must not reveal the secret, as the world in general have not found me out, and therefore they only say of me, that I am the strangest of mortals, and drive men to their wit's end. Did you ever hear that, too? Thetatus. Yes. Socrates. Shall I tell you the reason? Thetatus. By all means. Socrates. Bear in mind the whole business of the midwives, and then you will see my meaning better. No woman, as you are probably aware, who is still able to conceive and bear, attends other women, but only those who are past bearing. Thetatus. Yes, I know. Socrates. The reason of this is said to be that Artemis, the goddess of childbirth, is not a mother, and she honours those who are like herself, but she could not allow the barren to be midwives because human nature cannot know the mystery of an art without experience, and therefore she assigned this office to those who are too old to bear. Thetatus. I dare say. Socrates. And I dare say too, or rather, I am absolutely certain, that the midwives know better than others who is pregnant and who is not. Thetatus. Very true. Socrates. And by the use of potions and incantations, they are able to arouse the pangs and to soothe them at will. They can make those bear who have a difficulty in bearing, and if they think fit, they can smother the embryo in the womb. Thetatus. They can. Socrates. Did you ever remark that they are also most cunning matchmakers, and have a thorough knowledge of what unions are likely to produce a brave brood? Thetatus. No, never. Socrates. Then let me tell you that this is their greatest pride, more than cutting the umbilical cord. And if you reflect, you will see that the same art which cultivates and gathers in the fruits of the earth will be most likely to know in what soils the several plants or seeds should be deposited thetatus yes the same art socrates and do you suppose that with women the case is otherwise thetatus i should think not socrates certainly not but midwives are respectable women, and have a character to lose, 
and they avoid this department of their profession because they are afraid of being called procuresses, which is a name given to those who join together man and woman in an unlawful and unscientific way. And yet the true midwife is also the true and only matchmaker. Thetatus. Clearly. Socrates. Such are the midwives, whose task is a very important one, but not so important as mine. For women do not bring into the world, at one time, real children, and at another time, counterfeits, which are with difficulty distinguished from them. If they did, then the discernment of the true and false birth would be the crowning achievement of the art of midwifery. You would think so? Thetatus. Indeed I should. Socrates. Well, my art of midwifery is in most respects like theirs, but differs in that I attend men and not women, and I look after their souls when they are in labour, and not after their bodies, and the triumph of my art is in thoroughly examining whether the thought which the mind of the young man is bringing to the birth is a false idol or a noble and true birth. And like the midwives, I am barren, and the reproach which is often made against me, that I ask questions of others and have not the wit to answer them myself, is very just. The reason is that the God compels me to be a midwife, but forbids me to bring forth. And therefore I am not myself at all wise nor have I anything to show which is the invention or birth of my own soul. But those who converse with me profit. Some of them appear dull enough at first, but afterwards, as our acquaintance ripens, if the God is gracious to them, they all make astonishing progress, and this in the opinion of others as well as their own. It is quite clear that they, had never learned anything from me. The many fine discoveries to which they cling are of their own making. But to me and the God they owe their delivery, and the proof of my words is that many of them in their ignorance, either in their self-conceit despising me, or falling under the influence of others, have gone away too soon and have not only lost the children of whom I had previously delivered them by an ill bringing up, but have stifled whatever else they had in them by evil communications, being fonder of lies and shams than of the truth, and they have at last ended by seeing themselves, as others see them, to be great fools. Aristides the son of Lysimachus, is one of them. And there are many others. The truants often return to me and beg that I would consort with them again. They are ready to go to me on their knees, and then, if my familiar allows, which is not always the case, I receive them, and they begin to grow again. Dire are the pangs which my art is able to arouse and to allay, in those who consort with me, just like the pangs of women in childbirth. Night and day, they are full of perplexity and travail, which is even worse than that of the women. So much for them. And there are others, Thetatus, who come to me apparently having nothing in them, and as I know that they have no need of my art. I coax them into marrying someone, and by the grace of God I can generally tell who is likely to do them good. Many of them I have given away to Prodicus, and many to other inspired sages. I tell you this long story, friend Thetatus, because I suspect, as indeed you seem to think yourself, that you are in labour great with some conception. Come then to me, who am a midwife's son, and myself a midwife, 
and try to answer the questions which I will ask you. And if I abstract and expose your firstborn, because I discover upon inspection that the conception which you have formed is a vain shadow, do not quarrel with me on that account, as the manner of women is, when their first children are taken from them. For I have actually known some who were ready to bite me when I deprived them of a darling folly. They did not perceive that I acted from good will, not knowing that no god is the enemy of man. That was not within the range of their ideas. Neither am I their enemy in all this. But it would be wrong in me to admit falsehood, or to stifle the truth. Once more then, Thetatus, I repeat my old question. What is knowledge? And do not say that you cannot tell. But quit yourself like a man, and by the help of God you will be able to tell. Socrates proceeds to determine whether the intellectual babe brought forth by Thetatus is a wind egg or a real and genuine birth. This then is the child, however he may turn out, which you and I have with difficulty brought into the world, and now that he is born, we must run round the hearth with him, and see whether he is worth rearing, or only a wind egg and a sham. Is he to be reared in any case, and not exposed? Or will you bear to see him rejected, and not get into a passion, if I take away your firstborn? The conclusion is, that you have brought forth wind, and that the offspring of your brain are not worth bringing up. And the dialogue ends, as it began, with a reference to the midwife. The office of a midwife, I, like my mother, have received from God. She delivered women, and I deliver men, but they must be young and noble and fair. From the writings of Plato, we may gather many details about the status of physicians in his time. It is very evident that the profession was far advanced, and had been progressively developing for a long period before Hippocrates, whom we erroneously, yet with a certain propriety, called the father of medicine. The little by-play between Socrates and Euthydemus suggests an advanced condition of medical literature. Of course, you who have so many books are going in for being a doctor, says Socrates. And then he adds, There are so many books on medicine, you know. As Dyer remarks, whatever the quality of these books may have been, their number must have been great to give point to this chaff. It may be clearly gathered from the writings of Plato that two sorts of physicians, apart altogether from the quacks and the Esculapian guild, existed in Athens, the private practitioner and the state physician. The latter, though the smaller numerically, represented apparently the most distinguished class. From a reference in one of the dialogues, Gorgias, they evidently were elected by public assembly. When the assembly meets to elect a physician, the office was apparently yearly, for in the statesman is the remark, when the year of office has expired, the pilot or physician has to come before a court of review to answer any charges that may be made against him. In the same dialogue occurs the remark, and if any one who is in a private station has the art to advise one of the public physicians, must he not be called a physician? Apparently, a physician must have been in practice for some time, and attained great eminence, before he was deemed worthy of the post of state physician. If you and I were physicians, and were advising one another that we were competent to practice as state physicians, should I not ask you? And would you not ask me? Well, 
But how about Socrates himself? Has he good health? And was anyone else ever known to be cured by him, whether slave or free man? A reference to the two sorts of doctors is also found in the Republic. Now you know that when patients do not require medicine, but have only to be put under a regimen, the inferior sort of practitioner is deemed to be good enough. But when medicine has to be given, then the doctor should be more of a man. The office of state physician was in existence fully two generations before this time, for Democedes held this post at Athens in the second half of the 6th century, at a salary of £406, and very much as a modern professor might be. He was seduced away by the offer of a great increase in salary by Polycrates, the tyrant of Samos. It is evident, too, from the laws, that the doctors had assistants, often among the slaves. For of doctors, as I may remind you, some have a gentler, others a ruder method of cure. And as children ask the doctor to be gentle with them, so we will ask the legislator to cure our disorders with the gentlest remedies. What I mean to say is that besides doctors, there are doctors' servants who are also styled doctors. Very true. And whether they are slaves or free men makes no difference. They acquire their knowledge of medicine by obeying and observing their masters, empirically and not according to the natural way of learning, as the manner of free men is, who have learned scientifically themselves the art which they impart scientifically to their pupils. You are aware that there are these two classes of doctors? To be sure. And did you ever observe that there are two classes of patients in states, slaves and free men? and the slave doctors run about and cure the slaves, or wait for them in the dispensaries. Practitioners of this sort never talk to their patients individually, or let them talk about their own individual complaints. The slave doctor prescribes what mere experience suggests, as if he had exact knowledge, and when he is given his orders, like a tyrant, he rushes off with equal assurance to some other servant who is ill, and so he relieves the master of the house of the care of his invalid slaves. But the other doctor, who is a freeman, attends and practices upon free men, and he carries his inquiries far back and goes into the nature of the disorder. He enters into discourse with the patient and with his friends, and is at once getting information from the sick man and also instructing him as far as he is able, and he will not prescribe for him until he has first convinced him. At last, when he has brought the patient more and more under his persuasive influences and set him on the road to health, he attempts to effect a cure. Now, which is the better way of proceeding, in a physician and in a trainer? Is he the better who accomplishes his ends in a double way? Or he who works in one way, and that the ruder and inferior? This idea of first convincing a patient by argument is also mentioned in the Gorgias, and would appear indeed to have furnished occupation for some of the numerous sophists of that period. Gorgias lauding the virtues of rhetoric and claiming that she holds under her sway all the inferior art, says, Let me offer you a striking example of this. On several occasions I have been with my brother Herodicus, or some other physician, to see one of his patients, who would not allow the physician to give him medicine or apply the knife or hot iron to him and I have persuaded him to do for me what he would not do for the physician, just by the use of rhetoric. And I say that if a rhetorician and a physician were to go to any city, and had there to argue in the ecclesia, 
or any other assembly as to which of them should be elected state physician, the physician would have no chance. But he who could speak would be chosen if he wished. In another place, Laws, Plato satirizes this custom. For of this you may be very sure, that if one of those empirical physicians who practice medicine without science were to come upon the gentleman physician, talking to his gentleman patient, and using the language almost of philosophy, beginning at the beginning of the disease, and discoursing about the whole nature of the body, he would burst into a hearty laugh. He would say what most of those who are called doctors always have at their tongue's end. Foolish fellow! He would say, you are not healing the sick man, but you are educating him. And he does not want to be made a doctor, but to get well. Of the personal qualifications of the physician, not much is said. But in the Republic, there is an original, and to us, not very agreeable idea. Now the most skilful physicians are those who, from their youth upwards, have combined with a knowledge of their art the greatest experience of disease. They had better not be in robust health, and should have had all manner of diseases in their own person. For the body, as I conceive, is not the instrument with which they cure the body. In that case, we could not allow them ever to be or to have been sickly. But they cure the body with the mind, and the mind which has become and is sick can cure nothing. Some idea of the estimate which Plato put on the physician may be gathered from the mystical account in the Phaedrus of the nature of the soul and of life in the upper world. We are but animated failures, the residua of the souls above, which have attained a vision of truth, but have fallen. Hence, beneath the double load of forgetfulness and vice, there are nine grades of human existence into which these souls may pass, from that of a philosopher or artist to that of a tyrant. The physician or lover of gymnastic toils comes in the fourth class. But if Plato assigns the physician a place in the middle tier in his mystery, he welcomes him socially into the most select and aristocratic circle of Athens. In that most festive of all festal occasions, at the house of Agathon, described in the symposium, Eryximachus, a physician, and the son of one, is a chief speaker, and in his praise of love says, From medicine I will begin, that I may do honour to my art. We find him too on the side of temperance and sobriety. The weak heads like myself, Aristodemus, Phaedrus, and others who never can drink, are fortunate in finding that the stronger ones are not in a drinking mood. I do not include Socrates, who is able either to drink or to abstain, and will not mind whichever we do. Well, as none of the company seem disposed to drink much, I may be forgiven for saying, as a physician, that drinking deep is a bad practice, which I never follow, if I can help, and certainly do not recommend to another. Least of all, to anyone who still feels the effect of yesterday's carouse. The prescriptions for hiccup, given by Eryximachus, give verisimilitude to the dialogue. When the turn of Aristophanes came, he had eaten too much and had the hiccup, and he said to Eryximachus, You ought either to stop my hiccup, or speak in my turn. Eryximachus recommended him to hold his breath, or if that failed, to gargle with a little water, and if the hiccup still continued, to tickle his nose with something and sneeze, adding, 
If you sneeze once or twice, even the most violent hiccough is sure to go. Upon the medical symptoms narrated in that memorable scene, unparalleled in literature, after Socrates had drank the poison in prison, it is unnecessary to dwell. But I may refer to one aspect as indicating the reverence felt for the representative of the great healer. Denied his wish by the warning of the jailer, who says that there is only sufficient poison to offer a libation to a god, Socrates' dying words were, Crito, we owe a cock to Esculapius. The meaning of this solemnly smiling farewell of Socrates would seem to be, according to Dyer, that to Esculapius, a god who always is prescribing potions and whose power is manifest in their effects, was due that most welcome and sovereign remedy which cured all the pains and ended all the woes of Socrates, the hemlock, which cured him of life which is death, and gave him the glorious realities of hereafter. For this great boon of awakening into real life, Socrates owed Esculapius a thank-offering. This offering of a cock to Esculapius was plainly intended for him as the awakener of the dead to life everlasting. And permit me to conclude this already too long account with the eulogium of Professor Jowett words worthy of the master, worthy of his great interpreter to this generation. More than 2,200 years have passed away since he returned to the place of Apollo and the Muses. Yet the echo of his words continues to be heard among men. Because of all philosophers, he has the most melodious voice. He is the inspired prophet or teacher who can never die, the only one in whom the outward form adequately represents the fair soul within, in whom the thoughts of all who went before him are reflected, and of all who come after him are partly anticipated. Other teachers of philosophy are dried up and withered. After a few centuries they have become dust, but he is fresh and blooming and is always begetting new ideas in the minds of men. They are one-sided and abstract, but he has many sides of wisdom. Nor is he always consistent with himself, because he is always moving onward, and knows that there are many more things in philosophy than can be expressed in words, and that truth is greater than consistency. He who approaches him in the most reverent spirit shall reap most of the fruits of his wisdom. He who reads him by the light of ancient commentators will have the least understanding of him. We may see him with the eye of the mind in the groves of the academy, or on the banks of the Ilissus, or on the streets of Athens alone or walking with Socrates, full of these thoughts which have since become the common possession of mankind. Or we may compare him to a statue hid away in some temple of Zeus or Apollo, no longer existing on earth, a statue which has a look as of the God himself. Or we may once more imagine him following in another state of being the great company of heaven which he beheld of old in a vision so partly trifling but with a degree of seriousness we linger around the memory of a world which has passed away end of chapter four physic and physicians recording by Luke Sartor, Berkeley, California.
Chapter Five: The Leaven of Science, by Sir William Osler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Five: The Leaven of Science. Knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. Loxley Hall. Tennyson. Who loves not knowledge? Who shall rail against her beauty? May she mix with men and prosper. Who shall fix her pillars? Let her work prevail. In memoriam. Tennyson. The leaven of science. In the continual remembrance of a glorious past, Individuals and nations find their noblest inspiration, and if today this inspiration, so valuable for its own sake, so important in its associations, is weakened, is it not because, in the strong dominance of the individual, so characteristic of a democracy, we have lost the sense of continuity? As we read in Roman history of the ceremonies commemorative of the departed, and of the scrupulous care with which, even at such private festivals as the Ambarvalia, the dead were invoked and remembered, we appreciate, though feebly, the part which this sense of continuity played in the lives of their successors, an ennobling influence, through which the cold routine of the present received a glow of energy from the touch divine of noble nature's tone. In modern lives no equivalent to this feeling exists, and the sweet and gracious sense of an ever-present immortality, recognized so keenly and so closely in the religion of Numa, has lost all value to us. We are even impatient of those who would recall the past, and who would insist upon the importance of its recognition as a factor in our lives, impatient as we are of everything save the present with its prospects, the future with its possibilities. Year by year the memory of the men who made this institution fades from out the circle of the hills, and the shadow of oblivion falls deeper and deeper over their forms until a portrait, or perhaps a name alone, remains to link the dead with the quick. To be forgotten, seems inevitable. But not without a sense of melancholy do we recognize that the daily life of three thousand students and teachers is past, heedless of the fame, careless of the renown of these men. And in the second state, sublime, it must sadden the circle of the wise as they cast their eyes below, to look down on festivals in which they play no part, on gatherings in which their names are neither invoked nor blessed. But ours the loss, since to us, distant in humanity, the need is ever present to cherish the memories of the men who in days of trial and hardship laid on broad lines the foundations of the old colonial colleges. Today, through the liberality of General Wistar, we dedicate a fitting monument to one of the mighty dead of the university. Caspar Wistar. The tribute of deeds has already been paid to him in this splendid structure, to all in the stately group of academic buildings which you now see adorning the campus. The tribute of words remains, to be able to offer, which I regard a very special honor. But as this is an institute of anatomy, our tribute today may be justly restricted, in its details at least, to a eulogy upon the men who have taught the subject in this university. About the professorship of anatomy cluster memories which give it precedence of all others, and in the Septemviri of the old school, the chairs were arranged with that of anatomy in the centre, with those of physiology, chemistry, and materia medica on the left. 
and with those of practice, surgery, and obstetrics on the right. With the revival of learning anatomy, brought life and liberty to the healing art, and throughout the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, the great names of the profession, with but one or two exceptions, are those of the great anatomists. The University of Pennsylvania has had an extraordinary experience in the occupancy of this important chair. In the century and a quarter, which ended with the death of Laity, six names appear on the faculty roll as professors of this branch. Dorsey, however, only delivered the introductory lecture to the course, and was seized the same evening with his fatal illness, and in the next year, physic was transferred from the chair of surgery, with Horner as his adjunct. In reality, therefore, only four men have taught anatomy in this school since its foundation. Physic's name must ever be associated with the chair of surgery. We do not know the faculty exigencies which led to the transfer, but we can readily surmise that the youthfulness of Horner, who was only twenty-six, and the opportunity of filching for surgery so strong a man as Gibson from the faculty of the University of Maryland, then a stout rival, must have been among the most weighty considerations. If, in the average length of the period of each incumbency, the chair of anatomy in the university is remarkable, much more so it is for the quality of the men who followed each other at such long intervals. It is easy to praise the Athenians among the Athenians, but where is the school in this country which can show such a succession of names in this branch? Shippen, the first teacher of anatomy, Wistar, the author of the first textbook of anatomy, Horner, the first contributor to human anatomy in this country, and Laity, one of the greatest comparative anatomists of his generation. Of European schools, Edinburgh alone presents a parallel picture, as during the same period only four men have held the chair. The longevity and tenacity of the three Munros have become proverbial. In succession they held the chair of anatomy for 126 years. Shortly before the foundation of this school, Monro Secundus had succeeded his father and taught uninterruptedly for fifty years. His son, Monroe Tertius, held the chair for nearly the same length of time, and the remainder of the period has been covered by the occupancy of John Goodsir, and his successor, Sir William Turner, the present incumbent. To one feature in the history of anatomy in this school, I must refer in passing. Shippen was a warm personal friend and house pupil of John Hunter. Physic not only had the same advantages, but became in addition his house surgeon at St. George's Hospital. Both had enjoyed the intimate companionship of the most remarkable observer of nature since Aristotle, of a man with wider and more scientific conceptions and sympathies than had ever before been united in a member of our profession, and whose fundamental notions of disease are only now becoming prevalent. Can we doubt that from this source was derived the powerful inspiration which sustained these young men? One of them, on his return from England, at once began the first anatomical classes which were held in the colonies. The other entered upon that career so notable and so honourable, which led to the just title of the father of American surgery. It is pleasant to think that direct from John Hunter came the influence which made anatomy so strong in this school, and that zeal in the acquisition of specimens, which ultimately led to the splendid collections of the Worcester Horner Museum. William Shippen, the younger, shares with John Morgan the honour of establishing medical instruction in this city. When students in England, 
they had discussed plans. But it was Morgan who seems to have had the ear of the trustees, and who broached a definite scheme in his celebrated discourse, delivered in May 1765. It was not until the autumn of the year that Shippen signified to the board his willingness to accept professorship of anatomy and surgery. He had enjoyed, as I have mentioned, the friendship of John Hunter, and had studied also with his celebrated brother, William. Associated with him as fellow pupil was William Hewson, who subsequently became so famous as an anatomist and physiologist, and as the discoverer of the leukocytes of the blood, and whose descendants have been so prominent in the profession of this city. No wonder, then, with such an education, that Shippen, on his return in 1762, in his twenty-sixth year, should have begun a course of lectures in anatomy, the introductory to which was delivered in the State House on November 16. To him belongs the great merit of having made a beginning, and of having brought from the hunters methods and traditions which long held sway in this school. Wistar, in his eulogium, pays a warm tribute to his skill as a lecturer, and as a demonstrator, and to the faithfulness with which he taught the subject for more than forty years. Apart from his connection with this institution, he served as Director General of the Military Hospitals from 1777 to 1781, and was the second President of the College of Physicians. In the history of the profession of this country, Caspar Wistar holds a unique position. He is its Avicenna, its Mead, its Fothergill, the very embodiment of the physician who, to paraphrase the words of Armstrong, used by Wistar in his Edinburgh graduation thesis, sought the cheerful haunts of men and mingled with the bustling crowd. He taught anatomy in this school as adjunct and professor for twenty-six years. From the records of his contemporaries, we learn that he was a brilliant teacher, the idol of his class, as one of his eulogists says. As an anatomist, he will be remembered as the author of the first American textbook on anatomy, a work which was exceedingly popular and ran through several editions. His interest in the subject was not, however, of the knife-and-fork kind, for he was an early student of mammalian paleontology, in the development of which one of his successors was to be a chief promoter. But Wistar's claim to remembrance rests less upon his writings than upon the impress which remains to this day of his methods of teaching anatomy. Speaking of these, Horner, who was his adjunct and intimate associate, in a letter dated February 1, 1818, says, In reviewing the several particulars of his course of instruction, it is difficult to say in what part his chief merit consisted. He undertook everything with so much zeal, and such a conscientious desire to benefit those who came to be instructed by him, that he seldom failed of giving the most complete satisfaction. There were, however, some parts of his course peculiar to himself. These were the addition of models on a very large scale to illustrate small parts of the human structure, and the division of the general class into a number of subclasses, each of which he supplied with a box of bones, in order that they might become thoroughly acquainted with the human skeleton, a subject which is acknowledged by all to be at the very foundation of anatomical knowledge. The idea of the former mode of instruction was acted on for the first time about fifteen years ago. We have no knowledge of a collection of specimens by Shippen, though it is hard to believe that he could have dwelt in John Hunter's house and remained free from the insatiable hunger for specimens which characterized his master. But the establishment of a museum as an important adjunct to the medical school 
was due to Wistar, whose collections formed the nucleus of the splendid array which you will inspect today. The trustees, in accepting the gift on the death of Dr. Wistar, agreed that it should be styled the Wistar Museum, and now, after the lapse of seventy-six years, the collection has found an appropriate home in an institute of anatomy which bears his honoured name. But Wistar has established a wider claim to remembrance. Genial and hospitable, he reigned supreme in society by virtue of exceptional qualities of heart and head, and became, in the language of Charles Caldwell, the sensorium commune of a large circle of friends. About no other name in our ranks cluster such memories of good fellowship and good cheer, and it stands today in this city a synonym for esprit and social intercourse. Year by year his face, printed on the invitations to the Wistar parties, still an important function of winter life in Philadelphia, perpetuates the message of his life. Go seek the cheerful haunts of men. How different was the young prosector and adjunct who next taught the subject. Horner was naturally reserved and diffident, and throughout his life those obstinate questionings which in doubt and suffering have so often wrung the heart of man were ever present. Fightings within and fears without harassed his gentle and sensitive soul, on which mortality weighed heavily, and to which the four last things were more real than the materials in which he worked. He has left us a journal in time, in which he found, as did Amiel, of whom he was a sort of medical prototype, a safe shelter wherein his questionings of fate and the future, the voice of grief, of self-examination and confession, the soul's cry for inward peace, might make themselves freely heard. Listen to him. I have risen early in the morning, ere yet the watchman had cried the last hour of his vigil, and in undisturbed solitude, giving my whole heart and understanding to my Maker, prayed fervently that I might be enlightened on this momentous subject, that I might be freed from the errors of an excited imagination, from the allurements of personal friendship, from the prejudices of education, and that I might, under the influence of divine grace, be permitted to settle this question in its true merits. How familiar is the cry, the great and exceeding bitter cry, of the strong soul in the toils and doubtful of the victory! Horner, however, was one of those on whom both blessings rested. Facing the spectres of the mind, he laid them, and reached the desired haven. In spite of feeble bodily health and fits of depression, he carried on his anatomical studies with zeal, and as an original worker and author brought much reputation to the university. Particularly, he enriched the museum with many valuable preparations, and his name will ever be associated with that of Wistar, in the anatomical collection which bears their names. But what shall I say of Laity, the man in whom the leaven of science wrought with labour and travail for so many years? The written record survives, scarcely equaled in variety and extent, by any naturalist. But how meagre is the picture of the man, as known to his friends, the traits which made his life of such value, the patient spirit, the kindly disposition, the sustained zeal, we shall not see again incarnate. The memory of them alone remains, as the echoes of the eulogies upon his life have scarcely died away, I need not recount to this audience his ways and work, but upon one aspect of his character I may dwell for a moment as illustrating an influence of science which has attracted much attention and aroused discussion. 
so far as the facts of sense were concerned, there was not a trace of Pyrrhonism in his composition. But in all that relates to the ultra-rational, no more consistent disciple of the great skeptic ever lived. There was in him, too, that delightful ataraxia, that imperturbability, which is the distinguishing feature of the Pyrrhonist, in the truest sense of the word. A striking parallel exists between Lady and Darwin in this respect, and it is an interesting fact that the two men of this century, who have lived in closest intercourse with nature, should have found full satisfaction in their studies and in their domestic affections. In the autobiographical section, of the life of Charles Darwin, edited by his son Francis, in which are laid bare with such charming frankness the inner thoughts of the great naturalist, we find that he too had reached in suprasensuous affairs that state of mental imperturbability in which, to borrow the quaint expression of Sir Thomas Brown, they stretched not his Pia Mater. But while acknowledging that in science scepticism is advisable, Darwin says that he was not himself very sceptical. Of these two men, alike in this point, and with minds distinctly of the Aristotelian type, Darwin yet retained amid an overwhelming accumulation of facts, and here was his great superiority, an extraordinary power of generalizing principles from them. Deficient as was this quality in laity, he did not, on the other hand, experience the curious and lamentable loss of the higher aesthetic taste which Darwin mourned, and which may have been due in part to protracted ill health and to an absolute necessity of devoting all his powers to collecting facts in support of his great theory. When I think of laity's simple life, of his devotion to the study of nature, of the closeness of his communion with her for so many years, there recur to my mind time and again the lines. He is made one with nature. There is heard his voice in all her music, from the moan of thunder to the song of night's sweet bird. He is a presence to be felt and known, in darkness and in light, from herb and stone, spreading itself wherever that power may move, which has withdrawn his being to its own. Turning from the men to the subject in which they worked, from the past to the present, let us take a hasty glance at some of the developments of human anatomy and biology. Truth has been well called the daughter of time, and even in anatomy, which is a science in a state of fact, the point of view changes with successive generations. The following story, told by Sir Robert Christison of Barclay, one of the leading anatomists of the early part of this century, illustrates the old attitude of mind still met with among bread-and-butter teachers of the subject. Barclay spoke to his class as follows. Gentlemen, while carrying on your work in the dissecting room, beware of making anatomical discoveries, and above all beware of rushing with them into print. Our precursors have left us little to discover, you may perhaps fall in with a supernumerary muscle or tendon, a slight deviation or extra branchlet of an artery, or perhaps a minute stray twig of a nerve. That would be all. But beware! Publish the fact, and ten chances to one, you will have it shown that you have been forestalled long ago. Anatomy may be likened to a harvest field, First come the reapers, who, entering upon untrodden ground, cut down great store of corn from all sides of them. These are the early anatomists of modern Europe, such as Vesalius, Fallopius, Malpighi, 
and Harvey. Then come the gleaners, who gather up ears enough from the bare ridges to make a few loaves of bread. Such were the anatomists of last century, Valsalva, Cotunius, Hallow, Winsler, Vic Dazier, Camper, Hunter, and the two Monroes. Last of all come the geese, who still contrive to pick up a few grains scattered here and there among the stubble, and waddle home in the evening, poor things, cackling with joy because of their successes. Gentlemen, we are the geese. Yes, geese they were, gleaning amid the stubble of a restricted field when the broad acres of biology were open before them. Those were the days when anatomy meant a knowledge of the human frame alone, and yet the way had been opened to the larger view by the work of John Hunter, whose comprehensive mind grasped as proper subjects of study for the anatomist all the manifestations of life in order and disorder. The determination of structure with a view to the discovery of function has been the foundation of progress. The meaning may not always have been for him who runs to read. Often, indeed, it has been at the time far from clear, and yet a knowledge in full detail of the form and relations must precede a correct physiology. The extraordinary development of all the physical sciences and the corresponding refinement of means of research have contributed most largely to the enlightenment of the geese of Barclay's witticism. Take the progress in any one department which has a practical aspect, such as in the anatomy and physiology of the nervous system, Read, for example, in the third edition of Wistar's Anatomy, edited by Horner in 1825, the description of the convolutions of the brain, on which today a whole army of special students are at work, medical, surgical, and anthropological, and the functions of which are the objective point of physiological and psychological research. The whole subject is thus disposed of. The surface of the brain resembles that of the mass of the small intestine, or of a convoluted cylindrical tube. It is therefore said to be convoluted. The fissures between these convolutions do not extend very deep into the substance of the brain. The knowledge of function correlated with this meagre picture of structure is best expressed, perhaps, in Shakespearean diction that when the brains were out, the man would die. The laborious, careful establishment of structure by the first two generations in this century led to those brilliant discoveries in the functions of the nervous system which have not only revolutionized medicine, but have almost enabled psychologists to dispense with metaphysics altogether. End of Part 1 of Chapter 5 the Leaven of Science. Recording by Luke Sartor, Berkeley, California. Part 2 of Chapter 5 The Leaven of Science. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It is particularly interesting to note the widespread dependence of many departments on accurate anatomical knowledge. The new cerebral anatomy, particularly the study of the surface of the brain, so summarily dismissed in a few lines by Wistar, made plain the path for Hitzig and Frisch. The careful dissection of cases of disease of the brain prepared the way for Hewling's Jackson, and gradually a new phrenology on a scientific basis has replaced the crude notions of Gaul and Spursheim, so that with the present generation, little by little, there has been established on a solid structure of anatomy, 
the localization of many of the functions of the brain. Excite with a rough touch, from within or from without, a small region of that mysterious surface, and my lips may move, but not in the articulate expression of thought, and I may see, but I cannot read the page before me. Touch here and sight is gone, and there again, and hearing fails. One by one the centers may be touched, which preside over the muscles, and they may, singly or together, lose their power. All these functions may go without the loss of consciousness. Touch with the slow finger of time the nutrition of that thin layer, and backward by slow degrees creep the intellectual faculties, back to childish simplicity, back to infantile silliness, back to the oblivion of the womb. To this new cerebral physiology, which has thus gradually developed with increasing knowledge of structure, the study of cases of disease has contributed enormously, and today the diagnosis of affections of the nervous system has reached an astonishing degree of accuracy. The interdependence and sequence of knowledge in various branches of science is nowhere better shown than in this very subject. The facts obtained by precise anatomical investigation, from experiments on animals in the laboratory, from the study of nature's experiments upon us in disease, slowly and painfully acquired by many minds in many lands, have brought order out of the chaos of fifty years ago. In a practical age, this vast change has wrought a corresponding alteration in our ideas of what may or may not be done in the condition of perverted health which we call disease. And we not only know better what to do, but also what to leave undone. The localization of centers in the surface of the brain has rendered it possible to make, with a considerable degree of certainty, the diagnosis of focal disease, and Macewen and Horsley have supplemented the new cerebral physiology and pathology by a new cerebrospinal surgery, the achievements of which are scarcely credible. But this is not all. In addition to the determination of the centers of sight, hearing, speech, and motor activities, we are gradually reaching a knowledge of the physical basis of mental phenomena. The correlation of intelligence and brain weight, of mental endowment and increased convolution of the brain surface, was recognized even by the gleaners of Barclay's story. But within the past 25 years, the minute anatomy of the organ has been subjected to extensive study by methods of ever-increasing delicacy which have laid bare its complex mechanism. The pyramidal cells of the cerebral grey matter constitute the anatomical basis of thought, and with the development, association, and complex connection of these psychical cells, as they have been termed, the psychical functions are correlated. How far these mechanical conceptions have been carried may be gathered from the recent Croonian lecture before the Royal Society, in which Raymond Cahal based the action and the degree and the development of intelligence upon the complexity of the cell mechanism and its associations. Even the physical basis of moody madness has not evaded demonstration. Researchers upon the finer structure of the cerebral cortex, lead to the conclusion that imbecility, mental derangement, and the various forms of insanity are but symptoms of diseased conditions of the pyramidal cells, and not separate affections of an indefinable entity, the mind. Still further, there is a school of anthropologists which strives to associate moral derangement with physical abnormalities, particularly of the brain, and urges a belief in a criminal psychosis in which men are villains by necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and treachers 
by spherical predominance. This remarkable revolution in our knowledge of brain functions has resulted directly from the careful and accurate study of Barclay's geese of the anatomy of the nervous system. Truly the gleaming of the grapes of Ephraim has been better than the vintage of Abiezer. The study of structure, however, as the basis of vital phenomena, the strict province of anatomy, forms but a small part of the wide subject of biology, which deals with the multiform manifestations of life, and seeks to know the laws governing the growth, development, and actions of living things. John Hunter, the master of Shippen and Physic, was the first great biologist of the moderns, not alone because of his extraordinary powers of observation and the comprehensive sweep of his intellect, but chiefly because he first looked at life as a whole and studied all of its manifestations in order and disorder, in health and in disease. He first, in the words of Buckle, determined to contemplate nature as a vast and united whole, exhibiting, indeed, at different times, different appearances, but preserving, amidst every change, a principle of uniform and uninterrupted order, admitting of no division, undergoing no disturbance, and presenting no real irregularity albeit to the common eye irregularities abound on every side. We of the medical profession may take no little pride in the thought that there have never been wanting men in our ranks who have trodden in the footsteps of this great man. Not only such giants as Owen, Huxley and Leidy, but in a more humble way many of the most diligent students of biology have been physicians. From John Hunter to Charles Darwin, enormous progress was made in every department of zoology and botany, and not only in the accumulation of facts relating to structure, but in the knowledge of function, so that the conception of the phenomena of living matter was progressively widened. Then, with the origin of species, came the awakening, and the theory of evolution has not only changed the entire aspect of biology, but has revolutionized every department of human thought. Even the theory itself has come within the law, and to those of us whose biology is ten years old, the new conceptions are, perhaps, a little bewildering. The recent literature shows, however, a remarkable fertility and strength. Around the nature of cell organization, the battle wages most fiercely, and here again the knowledge of structure is sought eagerly as the basis of explanation of the vital phenomena. So radical have been the changes in this direction, that a new and complicated terminology has sprung up, and the simple, undifferentiated bit of protoplasm has now its cytosome, cytolymph, karyosome, chromosome with their somacules and biophores. These accurate studies in the vital units have led to material modifications in the theory of descent. Wiseman's views, particularly on the immortality of the unicellular organisms and of the reproductive cells of the higher forms, and on the transmission or non-transmission of acquired characters, have been based directly upon studies of cell structure and cell fission. In no way has biological science so widened the thoughts of men as in its application to social problems, that throughout the ages, in the gradual evolution of life, one unceasing purpose runs, that progress comes through unceasing competition, through unceasing selection and rejection, in a word, that evolution is the one great law controlling all living things, the one divine event to which the whole creation moves. This conception has been the great gift of biology to the 19th century. In his work on social evolution, Kidd thus states the problem in clear terms. 
nothing tends to exhibit more strikingly the extent to which the study of our social phenomena must in future be based on the biological sciences than the fact that the technical controversy now being waged by biologists as to the transmission or non-transmission to offspring of qualities acquired during the lifetime of the parent is one which if decided in the latter sense must produce the most revolutionary effect throughout the whole domain of social and political philosophy if the old view is correct and the effects of use and education are transmitted by inheritance then the utopian dreams of philosophy in the past are undoubtedly possible of realization if we tend to inherit in our own persons the result of the education and mental and moral culture of past generations then we may venture to anticipate a future society which will not deteriorate but which may continue to make progress even though the struggle for existence be suspended the population regulated exactly to the means of subsistence and the antagonism between the individual and the social organism extinguished but if the views of the wiseman party are in the main correct if there can be no progress except by the accumulation of congenital variations above the average to the exclusion of others below if without the constant stress of selection which this involves the tendency of every higher form of life is actually retrograde then is the whole human race caught in the toils of that struggle and rivalry of life which has been in progress from the beginning then must the rivalry of existence continue humanized as to conditions it may be but immutable and inevitable to the end then also must all the phenomena of human life individual political social and religious be considered as aspects of this cosmic process capable of being studied and understood by science only in their relations thereto biology touches the problems of life at every point and may claim as no other science completeness of view and a comprehensiveness which pertains to it alone to all whose daily work lies in her manifestations the value of a deep insight into her relations cannot be overestimated the study of biology trains the mind in accurate methods of observation and correct methods of reasoning and gives to a man clearer points of view and an attitude of mind more serviceable in the working day world than that given by other sciences or even by the humanities year by year it is to be hoped that young men will obtain in this institute a fundamental knowledge of the laws of life to the physician particularly a scientific discipline is an incalculable gift which leavens his whole life giving exactness to habits of thought and tempering the mind with that judicious faculty of distrust which can alone amid the uncertainties of practice make him wise unto salvation for perdition inevitably awaits the mind of the practitioner who has never had the full inoculation with the leaven who has never grasped clearly the relations of science to his art and who knows nothing and perhaps cares less for the limitations of either and i may be permitted on higher grounds to congratulate the university of pennsylvania on the acquisition of this institute there is great need in the colleges of this country of men who are thinkers as well as workers men with ideas men who have drunk deep of the astral wine and whose energies are not sapped in the treadmill of the classroom in these laboratories will be given opportunities for this higher sort of university work the conditions about us are changing rapidly in the older states utility is no longer regarded as the test of fitness 
and the value of the intellectual life has risen enormously in every department. Germany must be our model in this respect. She is great because she has a large group of men pursuing pure science with unflagging industry, with self-denying zeal, and with high ideals. No secondary motives sway their minds. No cry reaches them in the recesses of their laboratories. Of what practical utility is your work? But, unhampered by social or theological prejudices, they have been enabled to cherish the truth which has never been deceived, that complete truth which carries with it the antidote against the bane and danger which follow in the train of half-knowledge. The leaven of science gives to men habits of mental accuracy, modes of thought, which enlarge the mental vision, and strengthens, to use an expression of Epicharmus, the sinews of the understanding. But is there nothing further? Has science, the last gift of the gods, no message of hope for the race as a whole? Can it do no more? Then impart to the individual imperturbability amid the storms of life, judgment in times of perplexity. Where are the bright promises of the days when the kindly earth should slumber wrapped in universal law? Are these then futile hopes, vain imaginings of the dreamers, who from Plato to Comte have sought for law, for order, for the civitas day in the regnum hominis science has done much and will do more to alleviate the unhappy condition in which so many millions of our fellow creatures live and in no way more than in mitigating some of the horrors of disease but we are too apt to forget that apart from and beyond her domain lie those irresistible forces which alone sway the hearts of men. With reason, science never parts company, but with feeling, emotion, passion. What has she to do? They are not of her. They owe her no allegiance. She may study, analyze, and define. She can never control them, and by no possibility can their ways be justified to her. The great philosopher who took such a deep interest in the foundation of this university chained the lightnings, but who has chained the wayward spirit of man? Strange compound, now wrapped in the ecstasy of the beatific vision, now wallowing in the sloughs of iniquity. No leaven, earthly or divine, has worked any permanent change in him. Listen to the words of a student of the heart of a man, a depictor of his emotions. In all ages, the reason of the world has been at the mercy of brute force. The reign of law has never had more than a passing reality, and never can have more than that, so long as man is human. The individual intellect and the aggregate intelligence of nations and races have alike perished in the struggle of mankind, to revive again, indeed, but as surely to be again put to the edge of the sword. Look where you will throughout the length and breadth of all that was the world. Five thousand or five hundred years ago, everywhere passion has swept thought before it, and belief, reason. Passion rules the world and rules alone. And passion is neither of the head nor of the hand, but of the heart. Love, hate, ambition, anger, avarice either make a slave of intelligence to serve their impulses or break down its impotent opposition with the unanswerable argument of brute force and tear it to pieces with iron hands. Who runs may read the scroll which reason has placed 
as a warning over the human menageries. Chained, not tamed. And yet who can doubt that the leaven of science, working in the individual, leavens in some slight degree the whole social fabric? Reason is at least free, or nearly so. The shackles of dogma have been removed, and faith herself, freed from a morganatic alliance, finds in the release great gain. One of the many fertile fancies of the laughing philosopher, a happy anticipation again of an idea peculiarly modern, was that of the influence upon us, for weal or woe, of externals, of the idola, images and effluences which encompass us, of externals upon which so much of our happiness, yes, so much of our every character depends. The trend of scientific thought in this, as in the atomic theory, have reverted to the sage of Abderah. And if environment really means so much, how all-important a feature in education must be the nature of these encompassing effluences. This magnificent structure, so admirably adapted to the prosecution of that science from which modern thought has drawn its most fruitful inspirations, gives completeness to the already exhilarating milieu of this university. Here at last, and largely owing to your indomitable energy, Mr. Provost, are gathered all the externals which make up a scholar major, worthy of this great commonwealth. What, after all, is education but a subtle, slowly affected change, due to the action upon us of the externals, of the written record of the great minds of all ages, of the beautiful and harmonious surroundings of nature and of art? and of the lives, good or ill, of our fellows. These alone educate us. These alone mould the developing minds. Within the bounds of this campus, these influences will lead successive generations of youth from matriculation in the college to graduation in the special school. The complex, varied influences of art, of science, and of charity. Of art, the highest development of which can only come with that sustaining love for ideals, which burns bright or dim, as each are mirrors of the fire for which all thirst. Of science, the cold logic of which keeps the mind independent and free from the toils of self-deception and half-knowledge, of charity, in which we of the medical profession, to walk worthily, must live and move and have our being. End of chapter 5 The Leaven of Science. Recording by Luke Sartor, Berkeley, California. Chapter 6 of Equinimitas by Sir William Osler This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6 The Army Surgeon Nor Mars his sword, nor war's quick fire shall burn. The living record of your memory. Gainst death and all oblivious enmity, shall you pace forth, your praise shall still find room, even in the eyes of all posterity. Shakespeare, Sonnets, 55. The Army Surgeon, delivered at the Army Medical School, Washington, February 28, 1894. At the outset, I am sure you will permit me, on behalf of the profession, 
to offer to the Army Medical Department hearty congratulations on the completion of the arrangements which have made possible this gathering. With capacities strained to the utmost in furnishing to students an ordinary medical education, the schools at large cannot be expected to equip Army surgeons with the full details of special training. A glance at the curriculum just completed brings into sharp relief the disabilities under which previous classes must have proceeded to their labours, the members of which have had to pick up at random, in many cases have probably never acquired, the valuable knowledge traversed in the lectures and laboratory exercises of the session. But greatest of all the advantages of an army medical school must be counted the contact of the young officers with their seniors, with the men under whose directions they subsequently have to work. In comparison with their predecessors, with what different feelings and ideas will the men before us enter upon their duties in the various posts to which they have been assigned? Instead of hazy notions, perhaps to one fresh from the examining board, not pleasant ones, of a central authority at Washington, of a Yama enthroned as Secretary of War, and of an exacting Surgeon General, the young officer who has enjoyed the delightful opportunities of four months' study amid these inspiring surroundings, which teem with reminders of the glories of the corpse and of the greatness of his profession, the young officer, I say, must be indeed a muddy-metalled fellow who does not carry away, not alone rich stores of information, but, most precious of all educational gifts, a true ideal of what his life work should be. Members of the graduating class, though to you it may not, to me it seems peculiarly appropriate that the Surgeon General should have asked a civilian to make an address on this occasion, with the strictly military aspects of your future life, you have made yourself familiar, of the merits and demerits of the army, as a career for a physician, you have in the past four months heard very much, but about all subjects there are some questions which are more freely handled by one who is unhampered by too particular knowledge, and this is my position, I may say, my advantage, today. For me, the Army Medical Department, so far as particulars are concerned, means a library with unsurpassed facilities, the worth of which is doubled by the liberality of its management, a museum in which I have spent some delightful hours, an index catalogue which is at my elbow like a dictionary, and the medical history of the late war, particularly the volumes of Woodward and Smart. Further, in my general reading in the history of the profession of this country, I have here and there gleaned facts about the corpse and its members. I have read the spirited vindication of John Morgan, who may be called the first Surgeon General and I am familiar with the names and works of many of your distinguished predecessors who have left their mark in our literature. But as I write, an aspiration of the past occurs, bringing me, it seems, closer to you than any of the points just mentioned, a recollection of the days when the desire of my life was to enter the India Medical Service, a dream of youth, dim now and almost forgotten, a dream of Vishnu land, what avatar? Speaking then from the vantage ground of my ignorance, let me tell you briefly of the opportunities of the life you have chosen. First, among your privileges, I shall place a feature often spoken of as a hardship, viz. the frequent change from station to station, Permanence of residence, good undoubtedly for the pocket, is not always best for wide mental vision in the physician. You are modern representatives 
of a professional age long past, of a day when physicians of distinction had no settled homes. You are cypred larvae, unattached, free-swimming, seeing much in many places, not fixed as we barnacles of civil life, head down, degenerate, descendants of the old professional cirripeds, who laid under contribution not one, but a score of cities. Without local ties, independent of the public, in, while not exactly of, our ranks, you will escape many of the anxieties which fret the young physician, the pangs of disprized worth, the years of weary waiting, the uncertainty of the effort, and perhaps those sorer trials inevitable in an art engaging equally heart and head, in which, from the very nature of the occupation, the former is apt, in finer spirits, to be touched with a grievous sensibility. In change, that leaven of life denied to so many, you will find a strong corrective to some of the most unpleasant of the foibles which beset us. Self-satisfaction, a frame of mind widely diffused, is manifest often in greatest intensity where it should be least encouraged, and in individuals and communities is sometimes so active on such slender grounds that the condition is comparable to the delusions of grandeur in the insane. In a nomad life, this common infirmity, to the entertainment of which the twin sisters, use and want, lend their ever-ready aid, will scarcely touch you, and for this mercy give thanks. And while you must, as men, entertain many idols of the tribe, you may at least escape this idol of the cave, enjoying the privilege of wide acquaintance with men of very varied capabilities and training, you can, as spectators of their many crotchets and of their little weaknesses, avoid placing an undue estimate on your own individual powers and position. As Sir Thomas Brown says, it is the nimbler and conceited heads that never looked a degree beyond their nests that tower and plume themselves on light attainments. But heads of capacity, and such as are not full with a handful or easy measure of knowledge, think they know nothing till they know all. Per contra, in thus attaining a broader mental platform, you may miss one of the great prizes of the profession. A position in a community reached in length of days by one or two, who, having added to learning, culture, to wisdom, charity, pass the evening of their lives in the hearts of their colleagues and of their kind. No gift of Apollo, not the surgeon generalship, not distinguished position in science, no professorship, however honoured, can equal this. This which, as wandering army surgeons, you must forego. Fortunate is it for you that the service in one place is never long enough to let the root strike so deeply as to make the process of transplantation too painful. Myself a peripatetic, I know what it is to bear the scars of partings from comrades and friends, scars which sometimes ache as the memories recur of the days which have flown and of the old familiar faces which have gone. Another aspect of the life of the army surgeon, isolation in some degree from professional colleagues, will influence you in different ways, hurtfully in the more dependent natures, helpfully in those who may have learned that, not from without us, only from within, comes, or can ever come, upon us, light. And to such, the early years of separation from medical societies and gatherings will prove a useful seed time for habits of study 
and for the cultivation of the self-reliance that forms so important an element in the outfit of the practitioner. And after all, the isolation is neither so enduring nor so corroding as might have fallen to your lot in the routine of country practice. In it may be retained, too, some measure of individuality, lost with astonishing rapidity in the city mills that rub our angles down and soon stamp us all alike. In the history of the profession there are grounds for the statement that isolation promotes originality. Some of the most brilliant work has been done by men in extremely limited spheres of action, and during the past hundred years it is surprising how many of the notable achievements have been made by physicians dwelling far from educational centres. Jenner worked out his discovery in a village. McDowell, Long and Sims were country doctors. Coach was a district physician. So much depends upon the sort of start that a man makes in his profession that I cannot refrain from congratulating you again on the opportunities enjoyed during the past four months, which have not only added enormously to your capabilities for work, but have familiarized you with life at the heart of the organization of which, hereafter, you will form part, and doubtless have given you fruitful ideas on the possibilities of your individual development. Naturally, each one of you will desire to make the best use of his talents and education, and let me sketch briefly what I think should be your plan of action. Throw away, in the first place, all ambition beyond that of doing the day's work well. The travellers on the road to success live in the present, heedless of taking thought for the morrow, having been able, at some time and in some form or other, to receive into their heart of hearts this maxim of the sage of Chelsea. Your business is not to see what lies dimly at a distance, but to do what lies clearly at hand. Fevered haste is not encouraged in military circles, and if you can adapt your intellectual progress to army rules, making each step in your mental promotion the lawful successor of some other, you will acquire, little by little, those staying powers without which no man is of much value in the ranks. Your opportunities for study will cover at first a wide field in medicine and surgery, and this diffuseness in your work may be your salvation. In the next five or ten years, note with accuracy and care everything that comes within your professional ken. There are, in truth, no specialties in medicine, since to know fully many of the most important diseases, a man must be familiar with their manifestations in many organs. Let nothing slip by you. The ordinary humdrum cases of the morning routine may have been accurately described and pictured, but study each one separately as though it were new. So it is, so far as your special experience goes. And if the spirit of the student is in you, the lesson will be there. Look at the cases, not from the standpoint of textbooks and monographs, but as so many stepping stones in the progress of your individual development in the art. This will save you from the pitiable mental attitude of the men who travelled the road of practice from Dan to Beersheba, and at every step cry out upon its desolation, its dreariness, and its monotony. With Lawrence Stern, we can afford to pity such, since they know not that the barrenness of which they complain is within themselves, a result of a lack of appreciation of the meaning and method of work. In the early years of service, your advantages will be fully as great as if you had remained in civil life, Faithfulness in the day of small things will insensibly widen your powers, correct your faculties, and, in moments of dependency, comfort may be derived from a knowledge 
that some of the best work of the profession has come from men whose clinical field was limited but well tilled. The important thing is to make the lesson of each case tell on your education. The value of experience is not in seeing much, but in seeing wisely. Experience in the true sense of the term does not come to all with years or with increasing opportunities. Growth in the acquisition of facts is not necessarily associated with development. Many grow through life mentally as the crystal by simple accretion, and at fifty possess to vary the figure the unicellular mental blastoderm with which they started. The growth which is organic and enduring is totally different, marked by changes of an unmistakable character. The observations are made with accuracy and care. No pains are spared. Nothing is thought a trouble in the investigation of a problem. The facts are looked at in connection with similar ones. Their relation to others is studied and the experience of the recorder is compared with that of others who have worked upon the question. Insensibly, year by year, a man finds that there has been in his mental protoplasm not only growth by assimilation, but an actual development, bringing fuller powers of observation, additional capabilities of mental nutrition, and that increased breadth of view, which is of the very essence of wisdom. As clinical observers, we study the experiments which nature makes upon our fellow creatures. These experiments, however, in striking contrast to those of the laboratory, lack exactness, possessing as they do a variability at once a despair and a delight. The despair of those who look for nothing but fixed laws in an art which is still deep in the sloughs of empiricism the delight of those who find in it an expression of a universal law transcending, even scorning, the petty accuracy of test tube and balance, the law that in man, the measure of all things, mutability, variability, mobility, are the very marrow of his being. The clientele in which you work has, however, more stability, a less extended range of variation than that with which we deal in civil life. In a body of carefully selected active young men, you have a material for study in which the oscillations are less striking, in which the results of the experiments, i.e. the diseases, have a greater uniformity than in infancy and old age, in the enfeebled and debauched. This adds a value to the studies of army medical officers, who often have made investigations in hygiene, dietetics, and medicine, so trustworthy and thorough, that they serve us as a standard of comparison, as a sort of abscissa, or baseline. Thus you have demonstrated to us, and to the community at large, the possibilities of stamping out smallpox by systematic revaccination. In civil practice, we strive to reach the low rate of mortality of army hospitals in the treatment of typhoid fever and of pneumonia. Many of the most important facts relating to etiology and symptomatology have come from camp or barrack. I often think that army surgeons scarcely appreciate that in their work they may follow the natural history of a disease under the most favorable circumstances. The experiments are more ideal, the conditions less disturbing than those which prevail either in family practice or in the routine of the general hospital. Many of the common disorders can be tracked from inception to close, as can be done in no other line of medical work and the facilities for the continuous study of certain affections are unequalled. This, which is a point to be appreciated in the intrinsic education of which I spoke, gives you a decided advantage over your less favoured brethren. 
your extraordinary range of observation from the florida keys to montana from maine to southern california affords unequalled facilities for the study of many of the vexed problems in medicine facilities indeed which in the diversity of morbid conditions to be studied are equalled in no position in civil life let me here mention a few of the subjects that may profitably engage your attention no question is of more importance at present than the settlement definitely of the varieties of fever in the west and south the studies of baum garten in st louis and of guterres and others in the southern states suggest the possibility that in addition to typhoid fever and malaria the common affections there are other fevers the symptomatology and morbid anatomy of which still require careful elucidation in this you will be walking in the footsteps of notable predecessors in the corpse and in the exhaustive works of woodward and smart to which i have already alluded and which are always available you will find a basis from which you may start your personal observations more particularly in this direction do we need careful anatomical investigation since the symptomatology of certain of the affections in question has much in common with that of the ordinary continued fevers of the north i may call your attention to the satisfactory settlement of the nature of mountain fever by army surgeons and need hardly add that the specimens contributed by hoff and by gerard to this museum demonstrate conclusively that it is in reality typhoid fever in the southern posts malaria with its protean manifestations presents still many interesting problems for solution and you will leave this school better equipped than any of your predecessors for the study and differentiation of its less known varieties with positive knowledge as to the etiology and a practical familiarity with methods of blood examination you can do much in many localities to give to malaria a more definite position than it at present occupies in the profession and can offer in doubtful cases the positive and satisfactory test of the microscope the hematuria of the south requires to be studied anew the filarial cases separated from the malarial and most important of all the relation of quinine to hematuria positively settled in the more distant posts where so far as the soldier is concerned your opportunities for study may be limited you may add greatly to our knowledge of the disorders prevalent among the indians more particularly do we need additional information as to the frequency of tuberculosis among them and its clinical history one of your number dr edwards has already furnished admirable statistics upon this point but the field is still open and much remains to be done in this connection too you may be able to carry saving knowledge upon the etiology of the disease and enforce regulations for its prevention you have only to turn to the index catalogue to see how scanty in reality are the facts in the nosology of the north american indian at many posts there will be presented to you the interesting effects of altitude with problems of the greatest physiological importance an excellent piece of work may be done upon its influences upon the red blood corpuscles in determining whether as has been maintained there is an increase numerically per cubic millimeter so long as the individual remains in the more rarefied atmosphere points remain to be settled also upon the effects of altitude upon the chest capacity the chest measurement and the heart and our knowledge is still lacking on questions relating to the influence of high altitudes upon many of the ordinary diseases to one of you perhaps another peculiarly american disease milk sickness may reveal its secret our knowledge of its etiology 
has not been materially increased since the early papers on the subject, which so well described its symptomatology. These are but a few of the questions suggesting themselves to my mind, to which, as chance affords, you could direct your attention. In a ten or fifteen years' service, travelling with seeing eyes and hearing ears and carefully kept notebooks, just think what a storehouse of clinical material may be at the command of any one of you, material not only valuable in itself to the profession, but of infinite value to you personally in its acquisition, rendering you painstaking and accurate, and giving you year by year an increasing experience of the sort to which I have already more than once referred. In what I have said hitherto, I have dwelt chiefly on your personal development, and on the direction in which your activities might be engaged. But while you are thus laying the foundation of an education in all that relates to the technical side of the profession, there are other duties which call for a word or two. In the communities to which you may be sent, do not forget that, though army officers, you owe allegiance to an honourable profession, to the members of which you are linked by ties of a most binding character. In situations in which the advantages of a more critical training give you a measure of superiority over your confleres in civil life, let it not be apparent in your demeanour, but so order yourselves that in all things you may appear to receive, not to grant favours. There are regions in partibus infidelium, to which you will go as missionaries, carrying the gospel of loyalty to truth in the science and in the art of medicine, and your lives of devotion may prove to many a stimulating example. You cannot afford to stand aloof from your professional colleagues in any place. Join their associations, mingle in their meetings, giving of the best of your talents, gathering here, scattering there, but everywhere showing that you are at all times faithful students, as willing to teach as to be taught. Shun as most pernicious that frame of mind, too often I fear seen in physicians, which assumes an air of superiority and limits as worthy of your communion only those with satisfactory collegiate or sartorial credentials. The passports to your fellowship should be honesty of purpose and a devotion to the highest interests of our profession and these you will find widely diffused, sometimes apparent, only when you get beneath the crust of a rough exterior. If I have laid stress upon the more strictly professional aspects of your career, it has been with a purpose. I believe the arrangements in the department are such that, with habits of ordinary diligence, each one of you may attain not only a high grade of personal development, but may become an important contributor in the advancement of our art. I have said nothing of the pursuit of the sciences cognate to medicine, of botany, zoology, geology, ethnology, and archaeology. In every one of these, so fascinating in themselves, it is true that army medical officers have risen to distinction. But I claim that your first duty is to medicine, which should have your best services and your loyal devotion. Not, too, in the perfunctory discharge of the daily routine, but in zealous endeavour to keep pace with and to aid in the progress of knowledge. In this way you will best serve the department, the profession, and the public. Generalities of the kind in which I have been indulging, though appropriate to the occasion, are close kin, I fear, to the fancies fond, that vanish like the gay motes which float for a moment in the sunbeams of our mind. But I would fain leave with you, in closing, something of a more enduring kind, a picture 
that for me has always had a singular attraction, the picture of a man who, amid circumstances the most unfavorable, saw his opportunity and was quick to grasp the skirts of happy chance. Far away in the northern wilds, where the waters of Lake Michigan and Lake Huron unite, stands the fort of Michilimackinac, rich in memories of Indian and Voyager, one of the four important posts on the upper lakes in the days when the Rose and the Fleur de Lis strove for the mastery of the Western world. Here was the scene of Marquette's mission, and here beneath a chapel of St. Ignace they laid his bones to rest. Here the intrepid La Salle, the brave Tonti, and the resolute Dulut had halted in their wild wanderings. Its palisades and bastions had echoed the war whoops of Ojibwas and Ottawas, of Hurons and Iroquois, and had been the scene of bloody massacres and of hard fought fights. At the conclusion of the War of 1812, after two centuries of struggle, peace settled at last upon the old fort, and early in her reign celebrated one of the most famous of her minor victories, one which carried the high-sounding name of Michilimackinac far and wide, and into circles where Marquette, Dulut, and La Salle were unknown. Here, in 1820, was assigned to duty at the fort, which had been continued in use to keep the Indians in check. Surgeon William Beaumont, then a young man in the prime of life. On June 22, 1822, the accidental discharge of a musket made St. Martin a voyager, one of the most famous subjects in the history of physiology for the wound laid open his stomach, and he recovered with a permanent gastric fistula of an exceptionally favorable kind. Beaumont was not slow to see the extraordinary possibilities that were before him. Early in the second decade of the century, the process of gastric digestion was believed to be due to direct mechanical maceration, or to the action of a vital principle, and though the idea of a solvent juice had long been entertained, the whole question was subjudice. This series of studies made by Beaumont on St. Martin settled forever the existence of a solvent fluid capable of acting on food outside as well as within the body, and in addition enriched our knowledge of the processes of digestion by new observations on the movements of the stomach, the temperature of the interior of the body, and the digestibility of the various articles of food. The results of his work were published in 1833, in an octavo volume of less than 300 pages. In looking through it, one cannot but recognize that it is the source of a very large part of the current statements about digestion but apart altogether from the value of the facts, there are qualities about the work which make it a model of its kind, and on every page is revealed the character of the man. From the first experiment, dated August 1st, 1825, to the last, dated November 1st, 1833, the observations are made with accuracy and care, and noted in plain terse language. A remarkable feature was the persistence with which for eight years Beaumont pursued the subject, except during two intervals when St. Martin escaped to his relatives in Lower Canada. On one occasion Beaumont brought him a distance of two thousand miles to Fort Crawford on the Upper Mississippi, where, in 1829, the second series of experiments was made. The third series was conducted in Washington in 1832, and the fourth, 
at Plattsburgh in 1833, the determination to sift the question thoroughly, to keep at it persistently until the truth was reached, is shown in every one of the 238 experiments which he has recorded. The opportunity presented itself. The observer had the necessary mental equipment and the needed store of endurance to carry to a successful termination a long and laborious research. William Beaumont is indeed a bright example in the annals of the Army Medical Department, and there is no name on its roll more deserving to live in the memory of the profession of this country. And in closing, let me express the wish that each one of you, in all your works begun, continued, and ended, may be able to say with him, Truth, like beauty, when unadorned, is adorned the most. And in prosecuting experiments and inquiries, I believe I have been guided by its light. End of chapter 6 The Army Surgeon Recording by Luke Sartor, Berkeley, California Chapter 7 of Equanimitas by Sir William Osler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 7 Teaching and Thinking. Let us then blush in this so ample and so wonderful field of nature where performance still exceeds what is promised. To credit other men's traditions only, and thence come under uncertain problems to spin out thorny and captious questions. Nature herself must be our adviser. The path she chalks must be our walk. For while we confer with our own eyes and take our rise from meaner things to higher, we shall at length be received into her closet secrets. Preface to Anatomical Exercitations Concerning the Generation of Living Creatures 1653 William Harvey Chapter 7 Teaching and Thinking The Two Functions of a medical school. Delivered at McGill Medical School, October 1st, 1894. Many things have been urged against our 19th century civilization. That political enfranchisement only ends in anarchy. That the widespread unrest in spiritual matters leads only to unbelief. And that the best commentary of our boasted enlightenment is the picture of Europe in arms and the nations everywhere gnarring at each other's heels. Of practical progress in one direction, however, there can be no doubt. No one can dispute the enormous increase in the comfort of each individual life. Collectively, the human race, or portions of it, at any rate, may in the past have enjoyed periods of greater repose and longer intervals of freedom from strife and anxiety. But the day has never been when the unit has been of such value, when the man and the man alone has been so much the measure, when the individual as a living organism has seemed so sacred, when the obligations to regard his rights have seemed so imperative. But even these changes are as nothing in comparison with the remarkable increase in his physical well-being. The bitter cry of Isaiah, that with the multiplication of the nations their joys had not been increased, still echoes in our ears. The sorrows and troubles of men 
it is true, may not have been materially diminished. But bodily pain and suffering, though not abolished, have been assuaged as never before, and the share of each in the Welchmerts has been enormously lessened. Sorrows and griefs are companions sure sooner or later to join us on our pilgrimage, and we have become perhaps more sensitive to them, and perhaps less amenable to the old-time remedies of the physicians of the soul. But the pains and woes of the body, to which we doctors minister, are decreasing at an extraordinary rate, and in a way that makes one fairly gasp in hopeful anticipation. In his Grammar of Ascent, in a notable passage on suffering, John Henry Newman asks, Who can weigh and measure the aggregate of pain which this one generation has endured, and will endure, from birth to death? Then add to this all the pain which has fallen, and will fall, upon our race, through centuries past and to come. But take the other view of it. Think of the nemesis which has overtaken pain during the past fifty years. Anesthetics and antiseptic surgery have almost manacled the demon, and since their introduction, the aggregate of pain which has been prevented far outweighs in civilized communities that which has been suffered. Even the curse of travail has been lifted from the soul of women. The greatest art is in the concealment of art, and I may say that we of the medical profession excel in this respect. You of the public who hear me, go about the duties of the day profoundly indifferent to the facts I have just mentioned. You do not know, many of you do not care, that for the cross-legged Juno, who presided over the arrival of your grandparents, there now sits a benign and straight-legged goddess. You take it for granted that if a shoulder is dislocated, there is chloroform and a delicious nepenthe instead of the agony of the pulleys and paraphernalia of fifty years ago. You accept with a selfish complacency, as if you were yourselves to be thanked for it, that the arrows of destruction fly not so thickly, and that the pestilence now rarely walketh in the darkness. Still less do you realize that you may now pray the prayer of Hezekiah with a reasonable prospect of its fulfillment, since modern science has made to almost every one of you the present of a few years. I say you do not know these things. You hear of them, and the more intelligent among you perhaps ponder them, in your hearts, but they are among the things which you take for granted, like the sunshine and the flowers and the glorious heavens. Tis no idle challenge which we physicians throw out to the world when we claim that our mission is of the highest and of the noblest kind, not alone in curing disease, but in educating the people in the laws of health and it preventing the spread of plagues and pestilences. Nor can it be gainsaid that of late years our record as a body has been more encouraging in its practical results than those of the other learned professions. Not that we all live up to the highest ideals, far from it. We are only men. But we have ideals which mean much, and they are realizable which means more. Of course, there are Gehazis among us, who serve for shekels, whose ears hear only the lowing of the oxen and the jingling of the guineas, and these are exceptions. The rank and file labor earnestly for your good, and self-sacrificing devotion to your interests animates our best work. The exercises in which we are today engaged form an incident in this beneficent work, which is in progress everywhere, an incident which will enable me to dwell upon certain aspects of the university 
as a factor in the promotion of the physical well-being of the race. A great university has a dual function, to teach and to think. The educational aspects at first absorb all its energies, and in equipping various departments and providing salaries, it finds itself hard-pressed to fulfill even the first of these duties. The story of the progress of the medical school of this institution illustrates the struggles and difficulties, the worries and vexations attendant upon the effort to place it in the first rank as a teaching body. I know them well, since I was in the thick of them for ten years, and see today the realization of many of my day dreams. Indeed, in my wildest flights, I never thought to see such a splendid group of buildings as I have just inspected. We were modest in those days, and I remember when Dr. Howard showed me in great confidence the letter of the Chancellor, in which he conveyed his first generous bequest to the faculty. It seemed so great that in my joy I was almost ready to sing my Nunc Dimitus. The great advances here at the Montreal General Hospital and at the Royal Victoria, both of which institutions form most essential parts of the medical schools of this city, mean increased teaching facilities and of necessity better equipped graduates, better equipped doctors. Here is the kernel of the whole matter, and it is for this that we ask the aid necessary to build large laboratories and large hospitals in which the student may learn the science and art of medicine, chemistry, anatomy, and physiology. Give that perspective which enables him to place man and his diseases in their proper position in the scheme of life, and afford at the same time that essential basis upon which alone a trustworthy experience may be built. Each one of these is a science in itself, complicated and difficult, demanding much time and labour for its acquisition, so that in the few years which are given to their study, the student can only master the principles and certain of the facts upon which they are founded. Only so far as they bear upon a due understanding of the phenomena of disease, do these subjects form part of the medical curriculum, and for us they are but means, essential means it is true, to this end. A man cannot become a competent surgeon without a full knowledge of human anatomy and physiology, and the physician, without physiology and chemistry, flounders along in an aimless fashion, never able to gain any accurate conception of disease practicing a sort of popgun pharmacy, hitting now the malady and again the patient, he himself not knowing which. The primary function of this department of the university is to instruct men about disease. What it is, what are its manifestations, how it can be prevented, and how it may be cured. And to learn these things, the 400 young men who sit on these benches have come from all parts of the land. But it is no light responsibility which a faculty assumes in this matter. The task is beset with difficulties, some inherent in the subject and others in the men themselves, while not a few are caused by the lack of common sense in medical matters of the people among whom we doctors work. The processes of disease are so complex that it is excessively difficult to search out the laws which control them. And, although we have seen a complete revolution in our ideas, which has been accomplished by the new school of medicine, and although we have seen a complete revolution in our ideas, what has been accomplished by the new school of medicine is only an earnest of what the future has in store. The three great advances of the century has been a knowledge of the mode of controlling epidemic diseases, the introduction of anaesthetics, and the adoption of antiseptic methods in surgery. 
Beside them, all others sink into insignificance, as these three contribute so enormously to the personal comfort of the individual. The study of the causes of so-called infectious disorders has led directly to the discovery of the methods for their control. For example, such a scourge as typhoid fever becomes almost unknown in the presence of perfect drainage and an uncontaminated water supply. The outlook, too, for specific methods of treatment in these affections is most hopeful. The public must not be discouraged by a few or even by many failures. The thinkers who are doing the work for you are on the right path, and it is no vain fancy that before the twentieth century is very old, there may be effective vaccines against many of the contagious diseases. But a shrewd old fellow remarked to me the other day, Yes, many diseases are less frequent. Others have disappeared, but new ones are always cropping up, and I notice that with it all there is not only no decrease, but a very great increase in the number of doctors. The total abolition of the infectious group we cannot expect, and for many years to come there will remain hosts of bodily ills, even among preventable maladies, to occupy our labours. But there are two reasons which explain the relative numerical increase in the profession, in spite of the great decrease in the number of certain diseases. The development of specialties has given employment to many extra men, who now do much of the work of the old family practitioner. And again, people employ doctors more frequently, and so give occupation to many more than formerly. It cannot be denied that we have learned more rapidly how to prevent than how to cure diseases. But with a definite outline of our ignorance, we no longer live now in a fool's paradise and fondly imagine that in all cases we control the issues of life and death with our pills and potions. It took the profession many generations to learn that fevers ran their course, influenced very little, if at all, by drugs, and the sixty pounds which old Dover complained were spent in drugs in a case of ordinary fever about the middle of the last century, is now better expended on a trained nurse with infinitely less risk, and with infinitely greater comfort to the patient. Of the difficulties inherent in the art, not one is so serious as that which relates to the cure of disease by drugs. There is so much uncertainty and discord, even among the best authorities, upon non-essentials it is true that I always feel the force of a well-known stanza in Rabbi Ben Ezra. Now, who shall arbitrate? Ten men love what I hate, shun what I follow, slight what I receive. Ten who in ears and eyes match me we all surmise. They this thing, and I that, whom shall my soul believe? One of the chief reasons for this uncertainty is the increasing variability in the manifestations of any one disease. As no two faces, so no two cases are alike in all respects, and unfortunately it is not only the disease itself which is so varied, but the subjects themselves have peculiarities which modify its action. With the diminished reliance upon drugs, there has been a return with profit to the older measures of diet, exercise, baths and frictions, the remedies with which the Bithynian Asclepiades doctored the Romans so successfully in the first century. Though used less frequently, medicines are now given with infinitely greater skill. We know better their indications and contra and we may safely say, reversing the proportion of fifty years ago, that for one damaged by dosing, one hundred are saved. 
Many of the difficulties which surround the subject relate to the men who practice the art. The commonest as well as the saddest mistake is to mistake one's profession, and this we doctors do often enough, some of us without knowing it. There are men who have never had the preliminary education which would enable them to grasp the fundamental truths of the science on which medicine is based. Others have poor teachers and never receive that bent of mind which is the all-important factor in education. Others again fall early into the error of thinking that they know it all, and benefiting neither by their mistakes or their successes, miss the very essence of all experience, and die bigger fools, if possible, than when they started. There are only two sorts of doctors, those who practice with their brains and those who practice with their tongues. The studious, hard-working man who wishes to know his profession thoroughly, who lives in the hospitals and dispensaries, and who strives to obtain a wide and philosophical conception of disease and its processes, often has a hard struggle, and it may take years of waiting before he becomes successful. But such form the bulwarks of our ranks, and outweigh scores of the voluble Cassios who talk themselves into, and often out of, practice. Now of the difficulties bound up with the public in which we doctors work, I hesitate to speak in a mixed audience. Common sense in matters medical is rare, and is usually in inverse ratio to the degree of education. I suppose, as a body, clergymen are better educated than any other, yet they are notorious supporters of all the nostrums and humbuggery with which the daily and religious papers abound, and I find that the further away they have wandered from the decrees of the Council of Trent, the more apt are they to be steeped in thaumaturgic and galenical superstition. But know also, man has an inborn craving for medicine. Heroic dosing for several generations has given his tissues a thirst for drugs. As I once before remarked, the desire to take medicine is one feature which distinguishes man, the animal, from his fellow creatures. It is really one of the most serious difficulties with which we have to contend. Even in minor ailments, which would yield to dieting or to simple home remedies, the doctor's visit is not thought to be complete without the prescription, and now that the pharmacists have cloaked even the most nauseous remedies, the temptation is to use medicine on every occasion, and I fear we may return to that state of polypharmacy, the emancipation from which has been the sole gift of Hanuman and his followers to the race. As the public becomes more enlightened, and as we get more sense, dosing will be recognized as a very minor function in the practice of medicine in comparison with the old measures of Esclepiads. After all, these difficulties, in the subject itself, in us and in you, are lessening gradually, and we have the consolation of knowing that year by year the total amount of unnecessary suffering is decreasing at a rapid rate. In teaching men what disease is, how it may be prevented, and how it may be cured. A university is fulfilling one of its very noblest functions. The wise instruction and the splendid example of such men as Holmes, Sutherland, Campbell, Howard, Ross, MacDonald, and others have carried comfort into thousands of homes throughout this land. The benefits derived from the increased facilities for the teaching of medicine, which have come with the great changes made here and at the hospitals during the past few years, will not be confined to the citizens of this town, 
but will be widely diffused and felt in every locality to which the graduates of this school may go, and every gift which promotes higher medical education and which enables the medical faculties throughout the country to turn out better doctors means fewer mistakes in diagnosis, greater skill in dealing with emergencies, and the saving of pain and anxiety to countless sufferers and their friends. The physician needs a clear head and a kind heart. His work is arduous and complex, requiring the exercise of the very highest faculties of the mind, while constantly appealing to the emotions and finer feelings. At no time has his influence been more potent than at present. At no time has he been so powerful a factor for good, and as it is one of the highest possible duties of a great university to fit men for this calling, so it will be your highest mission, students of medicine, to carry on the never-ending warfare against disease and death, better equipped, abler men than your predecessors, but animated with their spirit and sustained by their hopes. For the hope of every creature is the banner that we bear. The other function of a university is to think teaching current knowledge in all departments, teaching the steps by which the status prescends has been reached, and teaching how to teach, form the routine work of the various college faculties. All this may be done in a perfunctory manner by men who have never gone deeply enough into the subjects to know that really thinking about them is in any way necessary or important. What I mean by the thinking function of a university is that duty which the professional corpse owes to enlarge the boundaries of human knowledge. Work of this sort makes a university great, and alone enables it to exercise a wide influence on the minds of men. We stand today at a critical point in the history of this faculty. The equipment for teaching to supply which has taken years of hard struggle, is approaching completion, and with the cooperation of the General and the Royal Victoria Hospitals, students can obtain in all branches a thorough training. We have now reached a position in which the higher university work may at any rate be discussed, and towards its progress in the future must trend. It may seem to be discouraging, after so much has been done and so much has been so generously given, to say that there remains a most important function to foster and sustain. But this aspect of the question must be considered when a school has reached a certain stage of development. In a progressive institution, the changes come slowly. The pace may not be perceived by those most concerned, except on such occasions as the present, which serve as landmarks in its evolution. The men and methods of the old Cote Street School were better than those with which the faculty started. We and our ways at the new building on University Street were better than those of Cote Street, and now you of the present faculty teach and work much better than we did ten years ago. Everywhere the old order changeth, and happy those who can change with it. Like the defeated gods, in Keats' Hyperion, too many unable to receive the balm of the truth resent the wise words of Oceanus, which I quoted here with very different feelings some eighteen years ago, in an introductory lecture. So on our heels a fresh perfection treads, born of us and fated to excel us. Now the fresh perfection, which will tread on our heels, 
will come with the opportunities for higher university work. Let me indicate, in a few words, its scope and aims. Teachers who teach current knowledge are not necessarily investigators. Many have not had the needful training. Others have not the needful time. The very best instructor for students may have no conception of the higher lines of work in his branch. And contrariwise, how many brilliant investigators have been wretched teachers. In a school which has reached this stage and wishes to do thinking as well as teaching, men must be selected who are not only thoroughly au courant with the best work in their department the world over, but who also have ideas with ambition and energy to put them into force. Men who can add each one in his sphere to the store of the world's knowledge. Men of this stamp alone confer greatness upon a university. They should be sought for far and wide. An institution which wraps itself in Strabo's cloak and does not look beyond the college gates in selecting professors may get good teachers, but rarely good thinkers. One of the chief difficulties in the way of advanced work is the stress of routine class and laboratory duties, which often sap the energies of men capable of higher things. To meet this difficulty, it is essential, first, to give the professors plenty of assistance, so that they will not be worn out with teaching, and secondly, to give encouragement to graduates and others to carry on researches under their direction. With a system of fellowships and research scholarships, a university may have a body of able young men who on the outposts of knowledge are exploring, surveying, defining and correcting. Their work is the outward and visible sign that a university is thinking. Surrounded by a group of bright young minds, well trained in advanced methods, not only is the professor himself stimulated to do his best work, but he has to keep far afield and to know what is stirring in every part of his own domain. With the wise cooperation of the university and the hospital authorities, Montreal may become the Edinburgh of America, a great medical centre to which men will flock for sound learning whose laboratories will attract the ablest students, and whose teaching will go out into all lands, universally recognized as of the highest and of the best type. Nowhere is the outlook more encouraging than at McGill. What a guarantee for the future does the progress of the past decade afford? No city on this continent has endowed higher education so liberally. There remains now to foster that undefinable something, which, for want of a better term, we call the university spirit, a something which a rich institution may not have, and with which a poor one may be saturated, a something which is associated with men and not with money, which cannot be purchased in the market or grown to order, but which comes insensibly with loyal devotion to duty and to high ideals, and without which Nehushtan is written on the portals of any school of medicine, however famous. End of chapter 7 Teaching and thinking. Recording by Luke Sartor, Berkeley, California. Chapter Eight of Equanimitas by Sir William Osler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 8. Internal Medicine as a Vocation A physician in a great city seems to be the mere plaything of fortune. His degree of reputation is for the most part totally casual. They that employ him know not his excellence. They that reject him know not his deficience. Samuel Johnson It happens to us, as it happeneth to wayfaring men. Sometimes our way is clean, sometimes foul, sometimes uphill, sometimes downhill. We are seldom at a certainty. The wind is not always at our backs, nor is every one a friend that we meet in the way. Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, Part 2 In the mind, as in the body, there is the necessity of getting rid of waste, and a man of active literary habits will write for the fire as well as for the press. Jerome Cardan Chapter 8 Internal Medicine as a Vocation Delivered at the New York Academy of Medicine, 1897. It was with the greatest pleasure that I accepted an invitation to address this section of the Academy on the importance of internal medicine as a vocation. I wish there were another term to designate the wide field of medical practice which remains after the separation of surgery, midwifery, and gynecology, not itself a specialty, though it embraces at least half a dozen. Its cultivators cannot be called specialists, but bear without reproach the good old name physician, in contradistinction to general practitioners, surgeons, obstetricians, and gynecologists. I have heard the fear expressed that in this country the sphere of the physician proper is becoming more and more restricted, and perhaps this is true, but I maintain, and I hope to convince you, that the opportunities are still great, that the harvest truly is plenteous, and the laborers scarcely sufficient to meet the demand. At the outset I would like to emphasize the fact that the student of internal medicine cannot be a specialist. The manifestations of almost any one of the important diseases in the course of a few years will box the compass of the specialties. Typhoid fever, for example, will not only go the rounds of those embraced in medicine proper, but will carry its student far afield in morbid psychology, and sometimes teach him, perhaps at the cost of the patient, a little surgery. So, too, with syphilis, which after the first few weeks I claim as a medical affection. I often tell my students that it is the only disease which they require to study thoroughly. No syphilis in all its manifestations and relations, and all other things clinical will be added unto you. Each generation has to grow its own consultants. Hossack, Samuel Mitchell, Sweat, Alonzo Clark, Austin Flint, Fordus Barker, and Alfred Loomis served their day in this city and then passed on into silence. Their works remain, but enough of a great physician's experience dies with him to justify the saying, There is no wisdom in the grave. The author of Rab and His Friends has a couple of paragraphs on this point which are worth quoting. Much that made such a man what the community, to their highest profit, found to him be, dies with him. His inborn gifts, and much of what was most valuable in his experience, were necessarily incommunicable to others. This depending much on his forgetting the process by which, in particular cases, he made up his mind and its minute successive steps, but mainly, we believe, 
because no man can explain directly to another man how he does any one practical thing the doing of which he himself has accomplished not at once or by imitation or by teaching but by repeated personal trials by missing much before ultimately hitting wherewithal shall a young man prepare himself should the ambition arise in him to follow in the footsteps of such a teacher as let us say the late austin flint the young man just starting and who will from nineteen fifteen to nineteen forty stand in relation to the profession of this city and this country as did dr flint between eighteen sixty one and the time of his death we will assume that he starts with equivalent advantages though this is taking a great deal for granted since austin flint had a strong hereditary bias toward medicine and early in life fell under the influence of remarkable men whose teachings moulded his thought to the very end we must not forget that dr flint was a new englander and of the same type of mind as his great teachers james jackson and jacob bigelow our future consultant has just left the hospital where for the first time realizing the possibilities of his profession he has had his ambition fired shall he go abroad it is not necessary the man whom we have chosen as his exemplar did not but found his opportunities in country practice in buffalo and Louisville, then frontier towns and in new orleans and had a national reputation before he reached new york but would it be useful to him undoubtedly he will have a broader foundation on which to build and a year or two in the laboratories and clinics of the great european cities will be most helpful to walk the wards of guy's or st bartholomew's to see the work at the st louis and at the sapertile to spend a few quiet months of study at one of the german university towns will store the young man's mind with priceless treasures i assume that he has a mind i am not heedless of the truth of the sharp taunt how much the fool that hath been sent to rome exceeds the fool that hath been kept at rome at any rate whether he goes abroad or not let him early escape from the besetting sin of the young physician chauvinism that intolerant attitude of mind which brooks no regard for anything outside his own circle and his own school if he cannot go abroad let him spend part of his short vacations in seeing how it fares with the brethren in his own country even in new yorker could learn something in the massachusetts general and the boston city hospitals a trip to philadelphia would be most useful there is much to stimulate the mind at the old pennsylvania hospital and at the university and he would be none the worse for a few weeks spent still farther south on the banks of the chesapeake the all-important matter is to get breadth of view as early as possible and this is difficult without travel poll the successful consulting physicians of this country today and you will find that they have been evolved either from general practice or from laboratory and clinical work many of the most prominent having risen from the ranks of general practitioners i once heard an eminent consultant rise in wrath because someone had made a remark reflecting upon this class he declared that no single part of his professional experience had been of such value but i wish to speak here of the training of men who start with the object of becoming pure physicians from the vantage ground of more than forty years of hard work sir andrew clark told me that he had striven ten years for bread ten years for bread and butter and twenty years for cakes and ale and this is really a very good partition of the life of the student of internal medicine of some at least since all do not reach the last stage 
it is high time we had our young Lydgate started. If he has shown any signs of nus during his student and hospital days, a dispensary assistantship should be available. Anything should be acceptable which brings him into contact with patients. By all means, if possible, let him be a pluralist, and, as he values his future life, let him not get early entangled in the meshes of specialism. Once established as a clinical assistant, he can begin his education, and nowadays this is a very complicated matter. There are three lines of work which he may follow, all of the most intense interest, all of the greatest value to him, chemistry, physiology, and morbid anatomy. Professional chemists look askance at physiological chemistry, and physiological chemists criticize pretty sharply the work of some clinical chemists. But there can be no doubt of the value to the physician of a very thorough training in methods and ways of organic chemistry. We sorely want in this country men of this line of training, and the outlook for them has never before been so bright. If at the start he has not had a good chemical training, the other lines should be more closely followed. Physiology, which for him will mean very largely experimental therapeutics and experimental pathology, will open a wider view and render possible a deeper grasp of the problems of disease. To Traub and men of his stamp, the physiological clinicians, this generation owes much more than to the chemical or post-mortem room group. The training is more difficult to get, and nowadays, when physiology is cultivated as a specialty, few physicians will graduate into clinical medicine directly from the laboratory. On the other hand, the opportunities for work are now more numerous, and the training which a young fellow gets in a laboratory controlled by a pure physiologist will help to give that scientific impress which is only enduring when early received. A thorough chemical training and a complete equipment in methods of experimental research are less often met with in the clinical physician than a good practical knowledge of morbid anatomy. And if our prospective consultant has to limit his work, chemistry and physiology should yield to the claims of the dead house. In this dry bread period, he should see autopsies daily, if possible. Successful knowledge of the infinite variations of disease can only be obtained by a prolonged study of morbid anatomy, while of special value in training the physician in diagnosis. It also enables him to correct his mistakes, and, if he reads its lessons aright, it may serve to keep him humble. This is, of course, a very full program, but in ten years a bright man, with what Sydenham calls the ancient and serious diligence of Hippocrates, will pick up a very fair education, and will be fit to pass from the dispensary to the wards. If he cannot go abroad after his hospital term, let it be an incentive to save money, and with the first six hundred dollars, let him take a summer semester in Germany, working quietly at one of the smaller places. Another year, let him spend three months or longer in Paris. When schemes are laid in advance, it is surprising how often the circumstances fit in with them. How shall he live meanwhile? On crumbs, on pickings obtained from men in the cakes and ales stage, who always can put paying work into the hands of young men, and on fees from classes, journal work, private instruction, and from work in the schools. Any sort of medical practice should be taken, but with caution. Too much of it early can prove a good man's ruin. He cannot expect to do more than just eke out a living. He must put his emotions on ice. There must be no amaryllis in the shade. 
and he must beware the tangles of Nira's hair. Success during the first ten years means endurance and perseverance. All things come to him who has learned to labor and wait, who bides his time on hast eber on rust, whose talent develops in der still in the quiet, fruitful years of unselfish, devoted work. A few words in addition about this dry bread decade. He should stick closely to the dispensaries. A first-class reputation may be built up in them. Byron Bramwell's Atlas of Medicine largely represents his work while an assistant physician to the Royal Infirmary, Edinburgh. Many of the best-known men in London serve ten, fifteen, or even twenty years in the outpatient departments before getting wards. Lord Brunton only obtained his full physicianship at St. Bartholomew's after a service of more than twenty years in the outpatient department. During this period, let him not lose the substance of ultimate success in grasping at the shadow of present opportunity. Time is now his money, and he must not barter away too much of it in profitless work, profitless so far as his education is concerned, though it may mean ready cash. Too many quiz classes, or too much journal work, has ruined many a promising clinical physician while the Pythagorean silence of nearly seven years, which the great Lewis followed, and broke to burst in a full-blown reputation, cannot be enjoined. The young physician should be careful what and how he writes. Let him take heed to his education, and his education will take care of itself, and in a development under the guidance of seniors, he will find plenty of material for papers, before medical societies, and for publication in scientific journals. I would like to add here a few words on the question of clinical instruction, as with the great prospective increase of it in our schools, there will be many chances of employment for young physicians who wish to follow medicine proper as a vocation. Today this serious problem confronts the professors in many of our schools. How to teach practical medicine to the large classes? how to give them protracted and systematic ward instruction. I know of no teacher in the country who controls enough clinical material for the instruction of classes, say of 200 men, during the third and fourth years. It seems to me that there are two plans open to the schools. The first is to utilize dispensaries for clinical instruction much more than is at present the rule. For this purpose, a teaching room for a class of 25 or 30 students immediately adjoining the dispensary is essential. For instruction in physical diagnosis, for the objective teaching of disease, and for the instruction of students in the use of their senses, such an arrangement is invaluable. There are hundreds of dispensaries in which this plan is feasible and in which the material now is not properly worked up because of the lack of this very stimulus. In the second place, I feel sure that ultimately we shall develop a system of extramural teaching similar to that which has been so successful in Edinburgh, and this will give employment to a large number of the younger men. At any large university school of medicine, there might be four or five extramural teachers of medicine, selected from men who could show that they were fully qualified to teach, and that they had a sufficient number of beds at their command with proper equipment for clinical work. At Edinburgh there are eight extramural teachers of internal medicine whose courses qualify the student to present himself for examination either before the royal colleges or the university. If we ever are to give our third and fourth year students protracted and complete courses in physical diagnosis and clinical medicine, extending throughout the session, 
and not in classes of a brief period of six weeks' duration, I am confident that the number of men engaged in teaching must be greatly increased. Ten years' hard work tells with colleagues and friends in the profession, and with enlarged clinical facilities the physician enters upon the second, or bread-and-butter period. This, to most men, is the great trial, since the risks are greater, and many now drop out of the race, wearied at the length of the way and drift into specialism or general practice. The physician develops more slowly than the surgeon, and success comes later. There are surgeons at forty years in full practice, and at the very top of the wave, a time at which the physician is only preparing to reap the harvest of years of patient toil. The surgeon must have hands, and better, young hands. He should have a head, too, but this does not seem so essential to success, and he cannot have an old head with young hands. At the end of twenty years, when about forty-five, our Lydgate should have a first-class reputation in the profession and a large circle of friends and students. He will probably have precious little capital in the bank, but a very large accumulation of interest-bearing funds in his brain pan. He has gathered a stock of special knowledge which his friends in the profession appreciate, and they begin to seek his counsel in doubtful cases, and gradually learn to lean upon him in times of trial. He may awake some day, perhaps quite suddenly, to find that twenty years of quiet work, done for the love of it, has a very solid value. The environment of a large city is not essential to the growth of a good clinical physician. Even in small towns a man can, if he has it in him, become well versed in methods of work, and with the assistance of an occasional visit to some medical centre, he can become an expert diagnostician and reach a position of dignity and worth in the community in which he lives. I wish to plead particularly for the wasted opportunities in the smaller hospitals of our large cities and in those of more moderate size. There are in this state a score or more of hospitals with from thirty to fifty medical beds offering splendid material for good men on which to build reputations. Take, for example, the town of Thelma, which I know well, to which young Rondibulus, a recent intern at the Hotel Dieu, has just gone. He wrote, asking me for a letter of advice, from which I take the liberty of extracting one or two paragraphs. Your training warrants a high aim. To those who ask, Say that you intend to practice medicine only, and will not take surgical or midwifery cases. X has promised that you may help in the dispensary, and, as you can count blood and percuss a chest, you will be useful to him in the wards, which, by the way, he now rarely visits. Be careful with the house physicians, and if you teach them anything, do it gently and never crow when you are right. The crow of the young rooster before his spurs are on always jars and antagonizers. Get your own little clinical laboratory in order. Old Dr. Rolando will be sure to visit you, and bear with him as he tells you how he can tell casts from the ascending limb of the loop of Hanley. Once he was as you are now, a modern twenty years ago. But he crawled up the bank, and the stream has left him there. But he does not know it. He means to impress you. Be civil and show him the new Nisselstein preparations, and you will have him as a warm friend. His good heart has kept him with the large general practice, and he can put post-mortems in your way, and may send for you to sit up on nights with his rich patients. If Y asks you to help in the teaching, 
jump at the chance. The school is not what you might wish, but the men are in earnest, and a clinical microscopy class or a voluntary ward class with wise cases will put you on the first rung of the ladder. Yes, join both the city and the county society, and never miss a meeting. Keep your mouth shut, too, for a few years, particularly in discussions. Let the old men read new books. You read the journals and the old books. Study Leynac this winter. Forbes' translation can be cheaply obtained, but it will help to keep up your French to read it in the original. The old Sydenham Society editions of the Greek writers and of Sydenham are easily got and are really very helpful. As a teacher, you can never get orientert without a knowledge of the fathers, ancient and modern. And do not forget, above all things, the famous advice to Blackmore, to whom, when he first began the study of physic, and asked what books he should read, Sydenham replied, Don Quixote, meaning thereby, as I take it, that the only book of physic suitable for permanent reading, is the book of nature. A young fellow with staying powers, who avoids entanglements, may look forward in twenty years to a good consultation practice in any town of forty thousand to fifty thousand inhabitants. Some such man, perhaps, in a town far distant, taking care of his education and not of his bank book, may be the Austin Flint of New York in 1930. Many are called, but few are chosen. And of the many who start out with high aims, few see the goal. Even when reached, the final period of cakes and ale has serious drawbacks. There are two groups of consultants, the intra and the extra professional. The one gets work through his colleagues, the other, having outgrown the narrow limits of professional reputation, is at the mercy of the profanum vulgus. Then for him, farewell the tranquil mind, farewell content. His life becomes an incessant struggle, and between the attempt to carry on an exhausting and irksome practice, and to keep abreast with young fellows still in the bread-and-butter stage, the consultant at this period is worthy of our sincerest sympathy. One thing may save him. It was the wish of Walter Savage Landor always to walk with Epicurus on the right hand and Epictetus on the left, and I would urge the clinical physician, as he travels farther from the east, to look well to his companions, to see that they are not of his own age and generation. He must walk with the boys, else he is lost, irrevocably lost, not all at once, but by easy grades, and everyone perceives his ruin before he, good easy man, is aware of it. I would not have him a basil plant, to feed on the brains of the bright young fellows who follow the great wheel uphill, and to keep his mind receptive, plastic, and impressionable. He must travel with the men who are doing the work of the world, the men between the ages of twenty-five and forty. In the life of every successful physician, there comes the temptation to toy with the Delilah of the press, daily and otherwise. There are times when she may be courted with satisfaction, but beware, sooner or later she is sure to play the harlot, and has left many a man shorn of his strength, viz. the confidence of his professional brethren. Not altogether with justice have some notable members of our profession laboured under the accusation of pandering too much to the public. When a man reaches the climacteric, and has long passed beyond the professional stage of his reputation, we who are still in the ring must exercise a good deal of charity and discount largely the 
on dits which indiscreet friends circulate it cannot be denied that in dealings with the public just a little touch of humbug is immensely effective but it is not necessary in a large city there were three eminent consultants of world-wide reputation. One was said to be a good physician, but no humbug. The second was no physician, but a great humbug. The third was a great physician and a great humbug. The first achieved the greatest success, professional and social, possibly not financial. While living laborious days, happy in his work, happy in the growing recognition which he is receiving from his colleagues, no shadow of doubt haunts the mind of the young physician other than the fear of failure. But I warn him to cherish the days of his freedom, the days when he can follow his bent, untrammeled, undisturbed, and not as yet in the coils of the octopus. In a play of Oscar Wilde's, one of the characters remarks, There are only two great tragedies in life, not getting what you want, and getting it. And I have known consultants whose treadmill life illustrated the bitterness of this mot, and whose great success at sixty did not bring the comfort they had anticipated at forty. The mournful echo of the words of the preacher rings in their ears, words which I not long ago heard quoted with deep feeling by a distinguished physician. Better is an handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. End of chapter 8 Internal Medicine as a Vocation Recording by Luke Sartor Berkeley, California Chapter 9 of Equanimitas by Sir William Osler This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 9. Nurse and Patient I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I offend not in my tongue. I will keep my mouth as it were with a bridle. Psalm If thou hast heard a word, let it die with thee, and be bold, it will not burst thee. Ecclesiasticus Lo, in the vale of years beneath, a grisly troop are seen, the painful family of death, more hideous than their queen. This racks the joints, this fires the veins, that every labouring sinew strains, those in the deeper vitals. Rage. Thomas Gray. Nurse and Patient. Johns Hopkins Hospital, 1897. The trained nurse as a factor in life may be regarded from many points of view philanthropic, social, personal, professional, and domestic. To her virtues we have been exceeding kind. Tongues have dropped manner in their description. To her faults, well, let us be blind, since this is neither the place nor the time to expose them. I would rather call your attention to a few problems, connected with her of interest to us collectively, and individually too, since who can tell the day of her coming? Is she an added blessing or an added horror in our beginning civilization? Speaking from the point of view of a sick man, I take my stand firmly on the latter view, for several reasons. No man with any self-respect cares to be taken off guard, in mufti, so to speak. Sickness dims the eye, pales the cheek, roughens the chin, and makes a man a scarecrow, 
not fit to be seen by his wife to say nothing of a strange woman all in white or blue or grey moreover she will take such unwarrantable liberties with a fellow particularly if she catches him with fever then her special virtues could be depicted by king lemuel alone so far as she is concerned you are again in swathing bands and in her hands you are as of yore a helpless lump of human clay she will stop at nothing and between baths and spongings and feeding and temperature taking you are ready to cry with job the cry of every sick man cease then and let me alone for generations has not this been his immemorial privilege a privilege with vested rights as a deep-seated animal instinct to turn his face toward the wall to sicken in peace and if he so wishes to die undisturbed all this the trained nurse has alas made impossible and more too the tender mother the loving wife the devoted sister the faithful friend and the old servant who ministered to his wants and carried out the doctor's instructions so far as were consistent with the sick man's wishes all all are gone these old familiar faces and now you reign supreme you have added to every illness a domestic complication of which our fathers knew nothing you have upturned an inalienable right in displacing those whom i have just mentioned you are intruders innovators and usurpers dislocating as you do from their tenderest and most loving duties these mothers wives and sisters seriously you but lightly wreck the pangs which your advent may cause the handing over to a stranger the care of a life precious beyond all computation may be one of the greatest earthly trials not a little of all that is most sacred is sacrificed to your greater skill and methodical ways in the complicated fabric of modern society both our nursing and our charity appear to be better done second-hand though at the cost in the one case as in the other of many beatitudes links of that golden chain of which the poet sings let down from heaven to earth except in the warped judgment of the sick man for which i have the warmest sympathy but no respect you are regarded as an added blessing with of course certain limitations certainly you have made the practice of medicine easier to the physician you are more than the equivalent of the old two hourly doses to a fever patient and as the public grows in intelligence you should save in many instances the entire apothecary's bill in his chapter on instinct in the origin of the species darwin gives a graphic account of the marvellous caretaking capacity of the little formica fusca a slave ant one of these introduced into a company of her masters who were helpless and actually dying for lack of assistance instantly set to work fed and saved the survivors made some cells and tendered the larvae and put all to rights put all to rights how often have i thought of this expression and of this incident when at your word i have seen order and quiet replace chaos and confusion not alone in the sick room but in the household as a rule a messenger of joy and happiness the trained nurse may become an incarnate tragedy a protracted illness an attractive and weak mrs ebb smith as nurse and a weak husband and all husbands are weak make fit elements for a domestic tragedy which would be far more common were your principles less fixed while thus a source of real terror to a wife you may become a more enduring misery to a husband in our hurried progress the weak nerved sisters have suffered sorely and that deep mysterious undercurrent of the emotions which flows along silently in each of us is apt to break out in the rapids 
eddies and whirls of hysteria or neurasthenia by a finely measured sympathy and a wise combination of affection with firmness you gain the full confidence of one of these unfortunates and become to her a rock of defence to which she clings and without which she feels again adrift you become essential in her life a fixture in the family and at times a dark shadow between husband and wife as one poor victim expressed it she owns my wife body and soul and so far as i am concerned she has become the equivalent of her disease sometimes there develops that occult attraction between women only to be explained by the theory of aristophanes as to the origin of the race but usually it grows out of the natural leaning of the weak upon the strong and in the nurse the wife may find that stern strength and promise of control for which in the husband she looked in vain to measure finely and nicely your sympathy in these cases is a very delicate operation the individual temperament controls the situation and the more mobile of you will have a hard lesson to learn in subduing your emotions it is essential however and never let your outward action demonstrate the native act and figure of your heart you are lost irrevocably should you so far give the reins to your feelings as to ope the sacred source of sympathetic tears do enter upon your duties with a becoming sense of your frailties women can fool men always women only sometimes and it may be the lot of any one of you to be such a castaway as the nurse of whom i was told a few weeks ago the patient was one of those alphonsine plesis like creatures whom everybody had to love and for whom the primrose path of deliance had ended in a rigid rest cure after three weary months she was sent to a quiet place in the mountains with the more sedate of the two nurses who had been with her miss blank had had a good training and a large experience and was a new england woman of the very best type alas hers the greater fall an accomplishment of this siren which had produced serious symptoms was excessive cigarette smoking and dr blank had strictly forbidden tobacco three weeks later my informant paid a visit to the secluded resort and to his dismay found a patient and nurse on the veranda enjoying the choicest brand of egyptian cigarette while not the recipient of all the wretched secrets of life as are the parson and the doctor you will frequently be in households the miseries of which cannot be hid all the cupboards of which are open to you and you become the involuntary possessor of the most sacred confidences known perhaps to no other soul nowadays that part of the hippocratic oath which enjoins secrecy as to the things seen and heard among the sick should be administered to you at graduation printed in your remembrance written as headlines on the tablets of your chatelaines i would have two maxims i will keep my mouth as it were with a bridle and if thou hast heard a word let it die with thee taciturnity a discreet silence is a virtue little cultivated in these garrulous days when the chatter of the banderlog is everywhere about us when as some one has remarked speech has taken the place of thought as an inherent trait it is perhaps an infirmity but the kind to which i refer is an acquired faculty of infinite value sir thomas brown drew the distinction nicely when he said think not silence the wisdom of fools but if rightly timed the honour of wise men who have not the infirmity but the virtue of taciturnity the talent for silence carlyle calls it things medical and gruesome have a singular attraction for many people and in the easy days of convalescence a facile-tongued nurse may be led on to tell of moving incidents 
in ward or theatre, and once united, that unruly member is not apt to cease wagging with the simple narration of events. To talk of diseases is a sort of Arabian Nights entertainment, to which no discreet nurse will lend her talents. With the growth of one abominable practice in recent days, I am not certain you have anything to do, though I have heard your name mentioned in connection with it. I refer to the habit of openly discussing ailments which should never be mentioned. Doubtless it is in a measure the result of the disgusting publicity in which we live, and to the pernicious habit of allowing the filth of the gutters, as pervade in the newspapers, to pollute the stream of our daily lives. This open talk about personal maladies is an atrocious breach of good manners. Not a month ago I heard two women, both tailor-made, who sat opposite to me in a streetcar, compare notes on their infirmities in fulvian accents audible to everyone. I have heard a young woman at a dinner table relate experiences which her mother would have blushed to have told to the family physician. Everything nowadays is proclaimed from the housetops, among them our little bodily woes and worries. This is a sad lapse from the good old practice of our grandfathers, of which George Sand writes. People knew how to live and die in those days, and kept their infirmities out of sight. You might have the gout, but you must walk about all the same without making grimaces. It was a point of good breeding to hide one's suffering. We doctors are great sinners in this manner, and among ourselves and with the laity are much too fond of talking shop. To another danger I may refer, now that I have waxed bold, with the fullest kind of training you cannot escape from the perils of half-knowledge of pseudoscience, that most fatal and common of mental states. In your daily work you involuntarily catch the accents and learn the language of science, often without a clear conception of its meaning. I turned incidentally one day to a very fine example of the nurse, learned, and asked in a humble tone what the surgeon, whom I had failed to meet, had thought of the case, and she promptly replied that he thought there were features suggestive of an intracanalicular myxoma. And when I looked anxious and queried, had she happened to hear if he thought it had an epiblastic or mesoblastic origin? This daughter of Eve never flinched. Mesoblastic, I believe, was her answer. She would have handed sponges, I mean gauze, with the same sung Freud at a Waterloo. It must be very difficult to resist the fascination of a desire to know more, much more, of the deeper depths of the things you see and hear, and often this ignorance must be very tantalizing, but it is more wholesome than an assurance which rests on a thin veneer of knowledge. A friend, a distinguished surgeon, has written in the Lady Priestly vein an essay on the fall of the trained nurse, which, so far, he has very wisely refrained from publishing but he has permitted me to make one extract for your delectation. A fifth common declension is into the bonds of marriage. The facility with which these modern vestals fall into this commonplace condition is a commentary, shall I not say rather an illustration, of the inconsistency so notorious in the sex. The association of superintendents has in hand, I believe, a collective investigation dealing with this question, and we shall shortly have accurate figures as to the percentage of lady superintendents, of head nurses, of graduates, and of pupils who have bartered away their heritage for a hoop of gold. I am almost ashamed to quote this rude paragraph, but I am glad to do so to be able to enter a warm protest against such sentiments. Marriage is the natural end of the trained nurse. So truly as a young man married is a young man marred, is a woman unmarried in a certain sense a woman undone. Ideals, a career, 
ambition, touched though they may be with the zeal of St. Teresa, all vanish before the blind bow boy's butt shaft. Are you to be blamed and scoffed at for so doing? Contrariwise, you are to be praised with but this caution, which I insert at the special request of Miss Nutting, that you abstain from philandering during your period of training, and, as much as in you lies, spare your fellow workers, the physicians and surgeons of the staff. The trained nurse is a modern representative, not of the Roman Vestal, but of the female guardian in Plato's Republic, a choice selection from the very best women of the community, who know the laws of health, and whose sympathies have been deepened by contact with the best and worst of men. The experiences of hospital and private work, while they may not make her a Martha, enhance her value in many ways as a life companion, and it is a cause not for reproach but for congratulation that she has not acquired immunity from that most ancient of all diseases, that malady of which the Rose of Sharon sang so plaintively, that sickness to be stayed not with flagons nor comforted with apples. A luxury, let us say, in her private capacity. In public, the trained nurse has become one of the great blessings of humanity, taking a place beside the physician and the priest, and not inferior to either in her mission. Not that her calling here is in any way new. Time out of mind, she has made one of a trinity. Kindly heads have always been ready to devise means for allaying suffering. Tender hearts, surcharged with the miseries of this battered caravanserai, have ever been ready to speak to the sufferer of a way of peace, and loving hands have ever ministered to those in sorrow, need, and sickness. Nursing as an art to be cultivated, as a profession to be followed, is modern. Nursing as a practice originated in the dim past, when some mother among the cave dwellers cooled the forehead of her sick child with water from the brook, or first yielded to the prompting to leave a well-covered bone and a handful of meal by the side of a wounded man left in the hurried flight before an enemy. As a profession, a vocation, nursing has already reached in this country a high development. Graduates are numerous, the directories are full, and in many places there is overcrowding and a serious complaint that even very capable women find it hard to get employment. This will correct itself in time, as the existing conditions adjust the supply and demand. A majority of the applicants to our schools are women, who seek in nursing a vocation in which they can gain a livelihood in a womanly way. But there is another aspect of the question which may now be seriously taken up in this country. There is a gradually accumulating surplus of women who will not, or who cannot, fulfil the highest duties for which nature has designed them. I do not know at what age one dare call a woman a spinster. I will put it, perhaps rashly, at twenty-five. Now, at that critical period, a woman who has not to work for her living, who is without urgent domestic ties, is very apt to become a dangerous element, unless her energies and emotions are diverted in a proper channel. One skilled in hearts can perhaps read in her face the old, old story. Or she calls to mind that tender verse of Sappho. As the sweet apple blushes on the end of the bough, the very end of the bough, which the gatherers overlooked, nay, overlooked not, but could not reach but left alone, with splendid capacities for good. She is apt to fritter away a precious life in an aimless round of social duties, or in spasmodic efforts at church work. Such a woman needs a vocation, a calling which will satisfy her heart, and she should be able to find it in nursing, without entering a regular school or working in ecclesiastical harness. An organized nursing guild, 
similar to the German deaconesses, could undertake the care of large or small institutions without the establishment of training schools in the ordinary sense of the term. Such a guild might be entirely secular, with St. James, the apostle of practical religion, as the patron. It would be of special advantage to smaller hospitals, particularly to those unattached to medical schools, and it would obviate the existing anomaly of scores of training schools in which the pupil cannot get an education in any way commensurate with the importance of the profession. In the period of their training, the members of the nursing guild could be transferred from one institution to another until their education was complete. Such an organization would be of inestimable service in connection with district nursing. The noble work of Theodore Fledner should be repeated at an earlier day in this country. The Kaisers, worth deaconesses, have shown the world the way. I doubt if we have progressed in secularism far enough successfully to establish such guilds apart from church organizations. The religion of humanity is thin stuff for women, whose souls ask for something more substantial upon which to feed. There is no higher mission in this life than nursing God's poor. In so doing, a woman may not reach the ideals of her soul. She may fall far short of the ideals of her head, but she will go far to satiate those longings of the heart from which no woman can escape. Romola, the student, helping her blind father, and full of the pride of learning, we admire. Romola, the devotee, carrying in her withered heart woman's heaviest disappointment, we pity. Romola, the nurse, doing noble deeds amid the pestilence, rescuing those who were ready to perish, we love. On the stepping stones of our dead selves we rise to higher things, and in the inner life the serene heights are reached only when we die unto those selfish habits and feelings which absorb so much of our lives. To each one of us at some time, I suppose, has come the blessed impulse to break away from all such ties and follow cherished ideals. Too often it is but a flash of youth which darkens down with the growing years. Though the dream may never be realized, the impulse will not have been wholly in vain if it enables us to look with sympathy upon the more successful efforts of others. In institutions, the corroding effect of routine can be withstood only by maintaining high ideals of work. But these become the sounding brass and tinkling cymbals without corresponding sound practice. In some of us, the ceaseless panorama of suffering tends to dull that fine edge of sympathy with which we started. A great corporation cannot have a very fervent charity. The very conditions of its existence limit the exercise. Against this benumbing influence, we physicians and nurses the immediate agents of the trust have but one enduring corrective, the practice towards patience of the golden rule of humanity, as announced by Confucius. What you do not like when done to yourself, do not do to others. So familiar to us in its positive form as the great Christian council of perfection, in which alone are embraced both the law and the prophets. End of chapter 9 Nurse and Patient Recording by Luke Sartor, Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 10, Part 1 of Equinimitas by Sir William Osler this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 10. 
British Medicine in Greater Britain. Cranmer Nor shall this peace sleep with her, but, as when the bird of wonder dies, the maiden phoenix, her ashes new create another heir, as great in admiration as herself, so shall she leave her blessedness to one, when heaven shall call her from this cloud of darkness, who from the sacred ashes of her honour shall star-like rise, as great in fame as she was, and so stand fixed, peace, plenty, love, truth, terror. That were the servants to this chosen infant, shall then be his, and like a vine grow to him. Wherever the bright sun of heaven shall shine, his honour and the greatness of his name shall be, and make new nations. He shall flourish, and, like a mountain cedar, reach his branches to all the plains about him. Our children's children shall see this, and bless heaven. King, thou speakest wonders. Shakespeare King Henry the Eighth, Act Five. Chapter Ten, British Medicine in Greater Britain. Given at the British Medical Association, Montreal, eighteen ninety seven. To trace successfully the evolution of any one of the learned professions would require the hand of a master, of one who, like Darwin, combined a capacity for patient observation with philosophic vision. In the case of medicine, the difficulties are enormously increased by the extraordinary development which has taken place during the 19th century. The rate of progress has been too rapid for us to appreciate, and we stand bewildered and, as it were, in a state of intellectual giddiness when we attempt to to obtain a broad, comprehensive view of the subject. In a safer, middle flight, I propose to dwell on certain of the factors which have moulded the profession in English-speaking lands beyond the narrow seas of British medicine in Greater Britain. Even for this lesser task, though my affiliations are wide and my sympathies deep, I recognise the limitations of my fitness and am not unaware that in my ignorance I shall overlook much which might have rendered less sketchy a sketch necessarily imperfect. Evolution advances by such slow and imperceptible degrees that to those who are part of it the finger of time scarcely seems to move. Even the great epochs are seldom apparent to the participators. During the last century, neither the colonists nor the mother country appreciated the thrilling interest of the long-fought duel for the possession of this continent. The acts and scenes of the drama, to them detached, isolated, and independent, now glide like dissolving views into each other. And in the vitascope of history, we can see the true sequence of events, that we can meet here today, Britons on British soil in a French province, is one of the far-off results of that struggle. This was but a prelude to the other great event of the 18th century, the revolt of the colonies and the founding of a second great English-speaking nation. In the words of Bishop Berkeley's prophecy, Time's noblest offspring. It is surely a unique spectacle that a century later, descendants of the actors of these two great dramas should meet in an English city in New France. Here the American may forget Yorktown in Louisbourg, the Englishman Bunker Hill in Quebec, and the Frenchman both Louisbourg and Quebec in Chateauguay, while we Canadians, English and French, remembering former friendships and forgetting past enmities, can welcome you to our country the land in which and for which you have so often fought. Once and only once, before, in the history of the world, could such a gathering as this have taken place. Divided though the Greeks were, a Hellenic sentiment 
of extraordinary strength united them in certain assemblies and festivals no great flight of imagination is required to picture a notable representation of our profession in the fifth century b c meeting in such a colonial town as agrigentum under the presidency of empedocles delegates from the mother cities brilliant predecessors of hippocrates of the stamp of Democides and herodicus delegates from the sister colonies of syracuse and other sicilian towns from neighboring italy from far distant massilia and from still more distant pantisapium and istria and in such an assemblage there would have been men capable of discussing problems of life and mind more brilliantly than in many subsequent periods in proportion as the pre-hippocratic philosophers in things medical had thought more deeply than many of those who came after them we english are the modern greeks and we alone have colonized as they did as free peoples there have been other great colonial empires phoenician roman spanish dutch and french but in civil liberty and intellectual freedom magna Graecia and greater britain stand alone the parallel so often drawn between them is of particular interest with reference to the similarity between the greek settlements in sicily and the english plantations on the atlantic coast indeed freeman says i can never think of america without something suggesting sicily or of sicily without something suggesting america i wish to use the parallel only to emphasize two points one of difference and one of resemblance the greek colonist took greece with him hellas had no geographical bounds massilia and olbia were cities of hellas in as full sense as athens or sparta while the emigrant britons changed their sky not their character in crossing the great sea yet the homestayers had never the same feeling toward the plantations as the greeks had towards the colonial cities of magna Graecia. if as has been shrewdly surmised professor Seely, was herodotus reincarnate how grieved the spirit of the father of history must have been to say of englishmen nor have we even now ceased to think of ourselves as simply a race inhabiting an island off the northern coast of the continent of europe the assumption of gracious superiority which unless carefully cloaked smacks just a little of our national arrogance is apt to jar on sensitive colonial nerves with the expansion of the empire and the supplanting of a national by an imperial spirit this will become impossible that this sentiment never prevailed in hellas as it did later in the roman empire was due largely to the fact that in literature in science and in art the colonial cities of greece early overshadowed the mother cities it may be because the settlements of greater britain were of slower growth that it took several generations and several bitter trials to teach a lesson the greeks never had to learn the greek spirit was the leaven of the old world the workings of which no nationality could resist thrice it saved western civilization for it had the magic power of leading captivity captive and making even captive conquerors the missionaries of her culture what modern medicine owes to it will appear later the love of science the love of art the love of freedom vitally correlated to each other and brought into organic union were the essential attributes of the greek genius while we cannot claim for the anglo-saxon race all of these distinctions it has in a higher degree that one which in practical life is the most valuable and which has been the most precious gift of the race to the world the love of freedom of freedom in her regal seat of england 
it would carry me too far afield to discuss the differences between the native Briton and his children scattered so widely up and down the earth in Canada, South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. Types of the Anglo-Saxon race are developing which will differ as much from each other and from the English as the American does today from the original stock. But amid these differences can everywhere be seen those race qualities which have made us what we are. Courage, national integrity, steady good sense and energy in work. At a future meeting of the association, perhaps in Australia, a professional, Sir Charles Dilk, with a firm grasp of the subject, may deal with the medical problems of Greater Britain in a manner worthy of the address in medicine. My task, as I mentioned at the outset, is much less ambitious. Could someone with full knowledge patiently analyse the characteristics of British medicine, he would find certain national traits sufficiently distinct for recognition. Three centuries cannot accomplish very much, and that period has only just passed since the revival of medicine in England. But the local conditions of isolation, which have been singularly favourable to the development of special peculiarities in the national character, have not been without effect in the medical profession. I cannot do more than touch upon a few features, which may be useful as indicating the sources of influence upon Great Britain in the past, and which may perhaps be suggestive as to lines of progress in the future. Above the fireplace in Sir Henry Eckland's library are three panelled portraits of Lineker, Sydenham, and Harvey. The scroll upon them reads, Literas, Praxis, Scientia. To this great triumvirate, as to the fountain heads, we may trace the streams of inspiration which have made British medicine what it is today. Lineker, the type of the literary physician, must ever hold a unique place in the annals of our profession. To him was due in great measure the revival of Greek thought in the 16th century in England, and in the last Harveyan oration, Dr. Payne has pointed out his importance as a forerunner of Harvey. He made Greek methods available. Through him the art of Hippocrates and the science of Galen became once more the subject of careful, first-hand study. Lineker, as Dr. Payne remarks, was possessed from his youth till his death by the enthusiasm of learning. He was an idealist, devoted to objects which the world thought of little use. Painstaking, accurate, critical, hypercritical, perhaps, he remains today the chief literary representative of British medicine. Neither in Britain nor in Greater Britain have we maintained the place in the world of letters created for us by Lineker's noble start. It is true that in no generation since has the profession lacked a man who might stand unabashed in the temple at Delos, but, judged by the fruits of learning, scholars of his type have been more common in France and Germany. Nor is it to our credit that so little provision is made for the encouragement of these studies. For years the reputation of Great Britain in this matter was sustained almost alone by the great Deeside scholar, the surgeon of Bancori, Francis Adams, the interpreter of Hippocrates to English students. In the 19th century, he and Greenhill well maintained the traditions of Lineker. Their work, and that of a few of our contemporaries, among whom Ogle must be specially mentioned, has kept us in touch with the ancients. But by the neglect of the study of the humanities, which has been far too general, the profession loses a very precious quality. While in critical scholarship and in accurate historical studies, British medicine must take a second place. The influence of Lineker, exerted through the Royal College of Physicians and the old universities, 
has given to the humanities an important part in education, so that they have moulded a larger section of the profession than in any other country. A physician may possess the science of Harvey and the art of Sydenham, and yet there may be lacking in him those finer qualities of heart and head which count for so much in life. Pasture is not everything, and that indefinable, though well understood, something which we know as breeding is not always an accompaniment of great professional skill. Medicine is seen at its best in men whose faculties have had the highest and most harmonious culture. The Lathams, the Watsons, the Pagets, the Jenners, and the Gairdners have influenced the profession less by their special work than by exemplifying those graces of life and refinements of heart which make up character. And the men of this stamp in Greater Britain have left the most enduring mark, Beaumont, Bovell, and Hodder in Toronto, Holmes, Campbell, and Howard in this city, the Warrens, the Jacksons, the Bigelows, the Bowditches, and the Shaddocks in Boston, Bard, Hossack, Francis, Clark, and Flint of New York, Morgan, Shippen, Redman, Rush, Cox, the Elder Wood, the Elder Pepper, and the Elder Mitchell of Philadelphia, Brahmins all, in the language of the greatest Brahmin among them, Oliver Wendell Holmes. These and men like unto them have been the leaven which has raised our profession above the dead level of business. The literae humaniores, represented by Linacre, revived Greek methods, but the faculty during the 16th and at the beginning of the 17th centuries was in a sloth of ignorance and self-conceit, and not to be aroused even by Moses and the prophets, in the form of Hippocrates and the fathers of medicine. In the pictures referred to, Sydenham is placed between Linacre and Harvey, but science preceded practice, and Harvey's great Lumleian lectures were delivered before Sydenham was born. Linacre has been well called, by Payne, Harvey's intellectual grandfather. The discovery of the circulation of the blood was the climax of that movement, which began a century and a half before with the revival of Greek medical classics, and especially of Galen. Harvey returned to Greek methods and became the founder of modern experimental physiology and the great glory of British scientific medicine. The demonstration of the circulation of the blood remains in every detail a model research. I shall not repeat the oft-told tale of Harvey's great and enduring influence, but I must refer to one feature which, until lately, has been also a special characteristic of his direct successes in Great Britain. Harvey was a practitioner and a hospital physician. There are gossiping statements by Aubrey to the effect that he fell mightily in his practice after the publication of the De Motu Cordis, and that his therapeutic way was not admired. But to these, his practical success is the best answer. It is remarkable that a large proportion of all the physiological work of Great Britain has been done by men who have become successful hospital physicians or surgeons. I was much impressed by a conversation with Professor Ludwig in 1884. Speaking of the state of English physiology, he lamented the lapse of a favourite English pupil from science to practice. But, he added, while sorry for him, I am glad for the profession in England. He held that the clinical physicians of that country had received a very positive impress from the work of their early years in physiology and the natural sciences. I was surprised at the list of names which he cited. Among them I remember Bowman, Paget, Savery, and Lister. 
Ludwig attributed this feature in part to the independent character of the schools in England, to the absence of the university element so important in medical life in Germany, but above all, to the practical character of the English mind, the better men preferring an active life in practice to a secluded laboratory career. Thucydides, it was, who said of the Greeks that they possessed the power of thinking before they acted, and of acting, too. The same is true in a higher degree of the English race. To know just what has to be done, then to do it, comprises the whole philosophy of practical life. Sydenham, Anglaeus Lumen, as he has been well called, is the model practical physician of modern times. Lineker led Harvey back to Galen, Sydenham, to Hippocrates. The one took Greek science, the other not so much Greek medicine as Greek methods, particularly intellectual fearlessness, and a certain knack of looking at things. Sydenham broke with authority and went to nature. It is an extraordinary fact that he could have been so emancipated from dogmas and theories of all sorts, he laid down the fundamental proposition, and acted upon it, that all diseases should be described as objects of natural history. To do him justice, we must remember, as Dr. John Brown says, in the midst of what a mass of errors and prejudices, of theories actively mischievous, he was placed at a time when the mania of hypothesis was at its height, and when the practical part of his art was overrun and stultified by vile and silly nostrums. Sydenham led us back to Hippocrates. I would that we could be led oftener to Sydenham. How necessary to bear in mind what he says about the method of the study of medicine. In writing, therefore, such a natural history of disease, every merely philosophical hypothesis should be set aside, and the manifest and natural phenomena, however minute, should be noted with the utmost exactness. The usefulness of this procedure cannot be easily overrated, as compared with the subtle inquiries and trifling notions of modern writers, for can there be a shorter, or indeed any other way of coming at the morbific causes, or discovering the curative indications than by a certain perception of the peculiar symptoms? By these steps and helps, it was that the father of physic, the great Hippocrates, came to excel, his theory being no more than an exact description or view of nature. He found that nature alone often terminates diseases, and works a cure with a few simple medicines and often enough with no medicines at all. Well, indeed, has a recent writer remarked, Sydenham is unlike every previous teacher of the principles and practice of medicine in the modern world. He, not Lineker or Harvey, is the model British physician in whom were concentrated all those practical instincts upon which we lay such stress in the Anglo-Saxon character. The Greek faculty which we possess of thinking and acting has enabled us, in spite of many disadvantages, to take the lion's share in the great practical advances in medicine. Three among the greatest scientific movements of the century have come from Germany and France. Bichat, Lenec, and Lewis laid the foundation of modern clinical medicine. Virchow and his pupils of scientific pathology, while Pasteur and Koch, have revolutionized the study of the causes of disease, and yet the modern history of the art of medicine could almost be written in its fullness from the records of the Anglo-Saxon race. We can claim every practical advance of the very first rank, vaccination, anesthesia, preventive medicine, and antiseptic surgery, the captain jewels in the carcanet of the profession, 
beside which can be placed no others of equal luster. One other lesson of Sydenham's life needs careful conning. The English Hippocrates, as I said, broke with authority. His motto was, Thou nature art my goddess, to thy law my services are bound. Undue reverence for authority as such, a serene satisfaction with the status quo, and a fatuous objection to change, have often retarded the progress of medicine. In every generation, in every country, there have been, and ever will be, laudatores temporis acti, in the bad sense of that phrase. Not a few of them, men in high places, who have lent the weight of a complacent conservatism to bolster up an ineffectual attempt to stay the progress of new ideas. Every innovator from Harvey to Lister has been made to feel its force. The recently issued life of Thomas Wakeley is a running commentary on this spirit, against the pricks of which he kicked so hard and so effectually. But there are signs of a great change. End of chapter 10, part 1 This recording is by Luke Sartor, Griffith, New South Wales. Part 2 of Chapter 10 of Equanimitas by Sir William Osler. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Part 2 Chapter 10 British Medicine in Greater Britain The old universities and the colleges, once the chief offenders, have been emancipated and remain no longer, as Gibbon found them, steeped in port and prejudice. The value of authority, per se, has lessened enormously, and we of Greater Britain have perhaps suffered as the pendulum has swung to the other extreme. Practice loves authority, as announced in The General and Perpetual Voice of Men. Science must ever hold with Epicharmus, that a judicious distrust and wise scepticism are the sinews of the understanding. And yet the very foundations of belief, in almost everything relating to our art, rest upon authority. The practitioner cannot always be the judge. The responsibility must often rest with the teachers and investigators, who can only learn in the lessons of history the terrible significance of the word. The fetters of a thousand years in the treatment of fever were shattered by Sydenham, shattered only to be riveted anew. How hard was the battle in this century against the entrenched and stubborn foe? Listen to the eloquent pleadings of Stokes, pleading as did Sydenham against authority and against the bleedings, the purgings and sweatings of fifty years ago. Though his hair be grey, and his authority high, he is but a child in knowledge, and his reputation an error. On a level with a child, so far as correct appreciation of the great truths of medicine is concerned, he is very different in other respects. His powers of doing mischief are greater. He is far more dangerous. Oh, that men would stoop to learn, or at least cease to destroy. The potency of human authority among the powers that be was never better drawn than by the judicious Hooker in his section on this subject. And this not only with the simpler sort, but the learneder and wiser we are, the more such arguments in some cases prevail with us. The reason why the simpler sort are moved with authority is the conscience of their own ignorance whereby it cometh to pass that having learned men in admiration they rather fear to dislike them than know wherefore they should allow and follow their judgments contrariwise with them that are skilful authority is much more strong and forcible because they only 
are able to discern how just cause there is why to some men's authority so much should be attributed. For which cause the name of Hippocrates, no doubt, were more effectual to persuade even such men as Galen himself than to move a silly empiric. Sydenham was called a man of many doubts, and therein lay the secret of his great strength. Passing now to the main question of the development of this British medicine in Greater Britain, I must at once acknowledge the impossibility of doing justice to it. I can only indicate a few points of importance, and I must confine my remarks chiefly to the American part of Greater Britain. We may recognize three distinct periods corresponding to three distinct waves of influence, the first from the early immigration to about 1820, the second from about 1820 to 1860, and the third from about 1860 to the present time. The colonial settlements were contemporaneous with the revival of medicine in England. Fellow students of Harvey at Cambridge might have sailed in the Mayflower and the Arbella. The more carefully planned expeditions usually enlisted the services of a well-trained physician, and the early records, particularly of the New England colonies, contain many interesting references to these college-bred men. Giles Furman, who settled in Boston in 1632, a Cambridge man, seems to have been the first to give instruction in medicine in the New World. The Parsons of that day had often a smattering of physic, and illustrated what Cotton Mather called an angelic conjunction. He says, Ever since the days of Luke, the evangelist, skill in physic, has been frequently professed and practiced by persons whose more declared business was the study of divinity. Furman himself, finding physic but a mean help, took orders. These English physicians in the New England colonies were scholarly, able men. Roger Chillingworth, in Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter, has depicted them in a sketch of his own life. Made up of earnest, studious, thoughtful, quiet years, bestowed faithfully for the increase of knowledge, faithfully too for the advancement of human welfare, men, thoughtful for others, caring little for themselves, kind, just, true, and of constant if not warm affections. A singularly truthful picture of the old colonial physician. Until the establishment of medical schools, University of Pennsylvania, 1763, King's College, afterwards Columbia, 1767, Harvard, 1782, the supply of physicians for the colonies came from Great Britain supplemented by men trained under the old apprentice system, and of colonists who went to Edinburgh, Leyden, and London for their medical education. This latter group had a most powerful effect in moulding professional life in the pre-revolutionary period. They were men who had enjoyed not alone the instruction, but often the intimate friendship of the great English and European physicians. Morgan, Rush, Shippen, Bard, Wistar, Hossack, and others had received an education comprising all that was best in the period, and had acquired the added culture which can only come from travel and wide acquaintance with the world. Morgan, the founder of the medical school of the University of Pennsylvania, was away seven years and before returning, had taken his seat as a corresponding member of the French Academy of Surgery, besides having been elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. The War of Independence interrupted temporarily the stream of students, but not the friendship which existed between Cullen and Fothergill and their old pupils in America. The correspondence of these two warm friends of the colonies testifies to the strong professional intimacy which existed at the time between the leaders of the profession in the old and new worlds. But neither Borhave, Cullen, nor Fothergill 
stamped colonial medicine as did the great Scotsman, John Hunter. Long, weary centuries separated Harvey from Galen. Not a century lapsed from the death of the great physiologist to the advent of the man in whose phenomenal personality may be seen all the distinctive traits of modern medicine, and the range of whose mighty intellect has had few, if any, equals since Aristotle. Hunter's influence on the profession of this continent, so deep and enduring, was exerted in three ways. In the first place, his career as an army surgeon and his writings on subjects of special interest to military men carried his work and ways into innumerable campaigns in the long French wars and in the War of Independence. Hunter's works were reprinted in America as early as 1791 and 1793. In the second place, Hunter had a number of most distinguished students from the colonies, among whom were two who became teachers of wide reputation. William Shippen, the first professor of anatomy in the University of Pennsylvania, lived with Hunter on terms of the greatest intimacy. He brought back his methods of teaching and some measure of his spirit. With the exception of Hewson and Home, Hunter had no more distinguished pupil than Philip Singh Physick, who was his house surgeon at St. George's Hospital and his devoted friend. For more than a generation, Physick had no surgical compeer in America, and enjoyed a reputation equaled by no one save Rush. He taught Hunterian methods in the largest medical school in the country, and the work of his nephew, Dorsey, on surgery is very largely Hunter modified by physic. But in a third and much more potent way, the great master influenced the profession of this continent. Hunter was a naturalist to whom pathological processes were only a small part of a stupendous whole, governed by law, which, however, could never be understood until the facts had been accumulated, tabulated, and systematized. By his example, by his prodigious industry, and by his suggestive experiments, he led men again into the old paths of Aristotle, Galen, and Harvey. He made all thinking physicians naturalists, and he lent a dignity to the study of organic life and re-established a close union between medicine and the natural sciences. Both in Britain and Greater Britain, he laid the foundation of the great collections and museums, particularly those connected with the medical schools. The Wistar Horner and the Warren Museums originated with men who had been greatly influenced by Hunter. He was, moreover, the intellectual father of that interesting group of men on this side of the Atlantic, who, while practicing as physicians, devoted much time and labor to the study of natural history. In the latter part of the last century, and during the first thirty years of this, the successful practitioner was very often a naturalist. I wish that time permitted me to do justice to the long list of men who have been devoted naturalists and who have made contributions of great value. Benjamin Smith Barton, David Hossack, Jacob Bigelow, Richard Harlan, John D. Godman, Samuel George Morton, John Collins Warren, Samuel L. Mitchell, J. Eichen Meigs, and many others have left the records of their industry in their valuable works, and in the transactions of the various societies and academies. In Canada, many of our best naturalists have been physicians, and collections in this city testify to the industry of Holmes and McAuliffe. I was regretting the humanities a few minutes ago, and now I have to mourn the almost complete severance of medicine from the old natural history. To a man, the most delightful recollections of whose student life are the Saturdays spent with a preceptor 
who had a hunterian appetite for specimens anything from a trilobite to an acorus to such a one across the present brilliant outlook comes the shadow of the thought that the conditions of progress will make impossible again such careers as those of william kitchen parker and william carmichael mackintosh until about eighteen twenty the english profession of this continent knew little else than british medicine after this date in the united states the ties of professional union with the old country became relaxed owing in great part to the increase in the number of home schools and in part to the development of american literature to eighteen twenty one hundred and fourteen native medical books of all kinds had been issued from the press and one hundred and thirty one reprints and translations the former english the latter few in number and almost exclusively french turning for a few minutes to the condition of the profession in canada during this period i regret that i cannot speak of the many interesting questions relating to the french colonies with the earliest settlers physicians had come and among the jesuits in their devoted missions there are records of domnes laymen attached to the service who were members of the profession one of these rene gopil suffered martyrdom at the hands of the iroquois between the fall of quebec in 1759 and 1820 the english population had increased by the settlement of upper canada chiefly by united empire loyalists from the united states and after the war of eighteen twelve by settlers from the old country the physicians in the sparsely settled districts were either young men who sought their fortunes in the new colony or were army surgeons who had remained after the revolutionary war or the war of eighteen twelve the military element gave for some years a very distinctive stamp to the profession these surgeons were men of energy and ability who had seen much service and were accustomed to order discipline and regulations sabine in his american loyalists refers to the tory proclivities of the doctors but says that they were not so much disturbed as the lawyers and clergymen still a good many of them left their homes for conscience sake and caniff in his medical profession in upper canada gives a list of those known to have been among the united empire loyalists the character of the men who controlled the profession of the new colony is well shown by the proceedings of the medical board which was organized in eighteen nineteen doctors macaulay and widmer both army surgeons were the chief members the latter who has well been termed the father of the profession in upper canada a man of the very highest character did more than any one else to promote the progress of the profession and throughout his long career his efforts were always directed in the proper channels in looking through caniff's most valuable work one is much impressed by the sterling worth and mettle of these old army surgeons who in the early days formed the larger part of the profession the minutes of the medical board indicate with what military discipline the candidates were examined and the percentage of rejections has probably never been higher in the history of the province than it was in the first twenty years of the existence of the board one picture on the canvas of those early days lingers in the memory illustrating all the most attractive features of a race which has done much to make this country what it is today widmer was the type of the dignified old army surgeon scrupulously punctilious and in every detail regardful of the proprieties of life tiger dunlop may be taken as the very incarnation of that restless roving spirit which has driven the scotch broadcast upon the world after fighting with the connaught rangers in the war of eighteen twelve campaigning in india clearing the sagor of tigers hence his sobriquet 
Tiger, lecturing on medical jurisprudence in Edinburgh, writing for Blackwood, editing the British Press and the Telescope, introducing Beck's medical jurisprudence to English readers, and figuring as director and promoter of various companies, this extraordinary character appears in the young colony as warden of the Black Forest, in the employ of the Canada Company, his life in the backwoods at Gairbraid, his Noctes Ambloissants Canadenses, his famous Twelve Apostles, as he called his mahogany liquor stand, each bottle a full quart, his active political life, his remarkable household, his many eccentricities, are they not all portrayed to the life in the recently issued In the Days of the Canada Company? Turning now to the second period, we may remark in passing that the 19th century did not open very auspiciously for British medicine. Hunter had left no successor, and powerful as had been his influence, it was too weak to stem the tide of abstract speculation with which Cullen, Brown and others flooded the profession. No more sterile period exists than the early decades of this century. Willen, a great naturalist in skin diseases, with a few others, saved it from utter oblivion. The methods of Hippocrates, of Sydenham and of Hunter had not yet been made available in everyday work. The awakening came in France, and such an awakening! It can be compared with nothing but the Renaissance in the 16th and 17th centuries, which gave us Vesalius and Harvey. Citizen Bichat and Broussard led the way, but Laennec really created clinical medicine as we know it today. The discovery of auscultation was only an incident, a vast moment it is true, in a systematic study of the correlation of symptoms with anatomical changes. Louis, Andral, and Chomel extended the reputation of the French school, which was maintained to the full until the sixth decade, when the brilliant Trousseau ended for a time a long line of Paris teachers, whose audience had been worldwide. The revival of medicine in Great Britain was directly due to the French. Bright and Addison, Graves and Stokes, Forbes and Marshall Hall, Latham and Bennett, were profoundly affected by the new movement. In the United States, Anglican influence did not wane until after 1820. Translations of the works of Bichat appeared as early as 1802 and there were reprints in subsequent years. But it was not until 1823 that the first translation, a reprint of Forbes' edition, of Laennec was issued. Brossois's works became very popular in translations after 1830, and in the journals from this time on, the change of allegiance became very evident. But men, rather than books, diverted the trend of professional thought. After 1825, American students no longer went to Edinburgh and London, but to Paris, and we can say that between 1830 and 1860, every teacher and writer of note passed under the Gaelic yoke. The translations of Louis's work and the extraordinary success of his American pupils, a band of the ablest young men the country had ever seen, added force to the movement, and yet this was a period in which American medical literature was made up largely of pirated English books, and the systems, encyclopedias, and libraries, chiefly reprints, testified to the zeal of the publishers. Stokes, Graves, Watson, Todd, Bennett, and Williams furnished Anglican pap to the sucklings, as well as strong meat to the fully grown. In spite of the powerful French influence, the textbooks of the schools were almost exclusively English. In Canada, the period from 1820 to 1860 
saw the establishment of the English universities and medical schools. In Montreal, the agencies at work were wholly Scotch. The McGill Medical School was organized by Scotchmen, and, from its inception, has followed closely Edinburgh methods. The Paris influence, less personal, was exerted chiefly through English and Scotch channels. The Upper Canada schools were organized by men with English affiliations, and the traditions of Guy's, St. Bartholomew's, St. Thomas's, St. George's, and of the London Hospital, rather than those of Edinburgh, have prevailed in Toronto and Kingston. The local French influence on British medicine in Canada has been very slight. In the early decades of the century, when the cities were small and the intercourse between the French and English somewhat closer, the reciprocal action was more marked. At that period, English methods became somewhat the vogue among the French. Several very prominent French Canadians were Edinburgh graduates. Attempts were made in the medical journals to have communications in both languages, but the fusion of the two sections of the profession was no more feasible than the fusion of the two nationalities, and the development has progressed along separate lines. The third period dates from about 1860, when the influence of German medicine began to be felt. The rise of the Vienna School was for a long time the only visible result in Germany of the French Renaissance. Skoda, the German Laenek, and Rokitansky, the German Morgagni, influenced English and American thought between 1840 and 1860. But it was not until after the last date that Teutonic medicine began to be felt as a vitalizing power, chiefly through the energy of Virchow. After the translation of the Cellular Pathology by Chance, 1860, the way lay clear and open to every young student who desired inspiration. There had been great men in Berlin before Virchow, but he made the town on the spree a mecca for the faithful of all lands. From this period we can date the rise of German influence on the profession of this continent. It came partly through the study of pathological histology, under the stimulus given by Virchow, and partly through the development of the specialties, particularly diseases of the eye, of the skin, and of the larynx. The singularly attractive courses of Hebra, the organization, on a large scale in Vienna, of a system of graduate teaching designed especially for foreigners, and the remarkable expansion of the German laboratories, combined to divert the stream of students from France. The change of allegiance was a deserved tribute to the splendid organization of the German universities, to the untiring zeal and energy of their professors, to their single-minded devotion to science for its own sake. End of Part 2 Chapter 10 Recording by Luke Sartor Griffith, New South Wales Chapter 10, Part 3 of Equanimitas by Sir William Osler This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. British Medicine in Greater Britain In certain aspects, the Australasian settlements presented the most interesting problems of Greater Britain. More homogeneous, thoroughly British, isolated, distant, they must work out their destiny with a less stringent environment than, for example, surrounds the English in Canada. The traditions are more uniform and of whatever character have filtered through British channels. The professional population of native trained men is as yet small, and the proportion of graduates and licentiates from the English, Scotch and Irish colleges and boards guarantees a dominance of old country ideas. What the maturity will show cannot be predicted, but the vigorous infancy 
is full of crescent promise. On looking over the files of Australian and New Zealand journals, one is impressed with the monotonous similarity of the diseases in the antipodes to those of Great Britain and of this continent, except in the matter of parasitic affections and snake bites. The nosology presents few distinctive qualities. The proceedings of the four intercolonial congresses indicate a high level of professional thought. In two points, Australia has not progressed as other parts of Greater Britain. The satisfactory regulation of practice, so early settled in Canada, has been beset with many difficulties. Both in the United States and in Australia, the absence of the military element, which was so strong in Canada, may in part at least account for the great difference which has prevailed in this matter of the state license. The other relates to the question of ethics, to which one really does not care to refer, were it not absolutely forced upon the attention in reading the journals. Elsewhere professional squabbles, always so unseemly and distressing, are happily becoming very rare, and in Great Britain, and on this side of the water, we try at any rate to wash our dirty linen at home. In the large Australian cities, differences and dissensions seem lamentably common. Surely they must be fomented by the atrocious system of elections to the hospital, which plunges the entire profession every third or fourth year into the throes of a contest, in which the candidates have to solicit the suffrages of from 2,000 to 4,000 voters. Well, indeed, might Dr. Batchelor say in his address at the Fourth Intercolonial Congress, it is a scandal that in any British community, much less in a community which takes pride in a progressive spirit, such a pernicious system should survive for an hour. Of India, of Vishnu land, what can one say in a few minutes? Three thoughts at once claim recognition. Here, in the dim dawn of history, with the great Aryan people, was the intellectual cradle of the world. To the Hindus we owe a debt which we can at any rate acknowledge, and even in medicine many of our traditions and practices may be traced to them, as may be gathered from that most interesting History of Aryan Medical Science by Thakur Saheb of Gondol Quickly there arises the memory of the men who have done so much for British medicine in that great empire. Far from their homes, far from congenial surroundings, and far from the stimulus of scientific influences, Ainsley, Ballingall, Twinning, Moorhead, Waring, Parks, Cunningham, Lewis, Van Dyke, Carter, and many others have upheld the traditions of Harvey and of Sydenham. On the great epidemic diseases, how impoverished would our literature be in the absence of their contributions? But then there comes the thought of the petty done, the undone vast. When one considers the remarkable opportunities for study which India has presented, where else in the world is there such a field for observation in cholera, leprosy, dysentery, the plague, typhoid fever, malaria, and in a host of other less important maladies? And what has the British government done towards the scientific investigation of the diseases of India? Until recently, little or nothing, and the proposal to found an institute for the scientific study of disease has actually come from the native chiefs. The work of Dr. Hankin and of Professor Hafkeen, and the not unmixed evil of the brisk epidemic of plague in Bombay, may arouse the officials to a consciousness of their shortcomings. While sanitary progress has been great, as shown in a reduction of the mortality, from 69 per mil before 1857 to 15 per mil at present, 
Many problems are still urgent, as may be gathered from reading Dr. Harvey's presidential address and the proceedings of the Indian Medical Congress, that typhoid fever could be called the scourge of India, and that the incidence of the disease should remain so high among the troops, point to serious sanitary defects as yet unremedied. As to the prevalence of venereal disease among the soldiers, an admission of nearly 500 per mil tells its own tale. On reading the journals and discussions, one gets the impression that matters are not as they should be in India. There seems to be an absence of proper standards of authority. Had there been in each presidency during the past 20 years thoroughly equipped government laboratories in charge of able men, well trained in modern methods, the contributions to our knowledge of epidemic diseases might have been epoch-making, and at any rate we should have been spared the crudeness which is evident in the work, particularly in that upon malaria, of some zealous but badly trained men. In estimating the progress of medicine in the countries comprising Greater Britain, the future, rather than the present, should be in our minds. The strides which have been taken during the past twenty years are a strong warrant that we have entered upon a period of exceptional development. When I see what has been accomplished in this city in the short space of time since I left, I can scarcely credit my eyes. The reality exceeds the utmost desire of my dreams. The awakening of the profession in the United States to a consciousness of its responsibilities and opportunities has caused unparalleled changes which have given an impetus to medical education and to higher lines of medical work which has already borne a rich harvest. Within two hundred years, who can say where the intellectual centre of the Anglo-Saxon race will be? The mother country herself has only become an intellectual nation of the first rank within a period altogether too short to justify a prediction that she has reached the zenith. She will probably reverse the history of Hellas, in which the mental superiority was at first with the colonies. At the end of the twentieth century, ardent old-world students may come to this side as over a brook, seeking inspiration from great masters, perhaps in this very city, or the current may turn towards the schools of the great nations of the South. Under new and previously unknown conditions, the Africander, the Australian, or the New Zealander may reach a development before which even the glory that was Greece may pale. Visionary as this may appear, it is not one whit more improbable today than would have been a prophecy made in 1797 that such a gathering as the present would be possible within a century on the banks of the St. Lawrence. Meanwhile, to the throbbing vitality of modern medicine, the two great meetings held this month in lands so widely distant bear eloquent testimony. Free cosmopolitan, no longer hampered by the dogmas of schools, we may feel a just pride in a profession almost totally emancipated from the bondage of error and prejudice. Distinctions of race, nationality, colour and creed are unknown within the portals of the temple of Esculapius. Dare we dream that this harmony and cohesion, so rapidly developing in medicine, obliterating the strongest lines of division, knowing no tie of loyalty, but loyalty to truth. Dare we hope, I say, that in the wider range of human affairs, a similar solidarity may ultimately be reached? Who can say that the forges of time will weld no links between man and man stronger than those of religion or of country? Some son of Bayor, touched with prophetic vision, 
piercing the clouds which now veil the eternal sunshine of the mountain top some spectator of all time and all existence to use plato's expression might see in this gathering of men of one blood and one tongue a gleam of hope for the future of hope at least that the great race so dominant on the earth today may progress in the bonds of peace a faint glimmer perhaps of the larger hope of humanity of that day when the common sense of most shall hold a fretful world in awe there remains for us greater britons of whatsoever land the bounden duty to cherish the best traditions of our fathers and particularly of the men who gave to british medicine its most distinctive features of the men too who found for us the light and liberty of greek thought lineker harvey and sydenham those ancient founts of inspiration and models for all time in literature science and practice end of chapter ten british medicine in greater britain recording by luke sartor griffith new south wales